Watchtower and the Occult Connection. My name is Rick Farron, and I'm glad you're with us tonight. Wow, we have got a rockin' awesome program coming up here tonight for you on the Watchtower Account Connection. Uh, we do this program every few months, but we wanted to bring it back tonight. It's a special program, and we talk all about what goes on uh, behind the curtains of the Watchtower concerning the occult. Now, I want you to be advised the information that's going to be presented here tonight is very disturbing. You may find it very disturbing, and perhaps it might even be too frightening for many. So if you are weak at heart, you, you know, can't think out of the box, so to speak, you might not want to listen to the entire program. If you do, you can shut up. That's fine. It will be put in the archives, and maybe someday when you're more up to it, you'll be able to listen to it in its entirety. But I just want to make a, a thought here before we continue with tonight's program. We have, a, we have a, a woman coming on that has been satanically abused in the Watchtower. She suffers from satanic ritual abuse. But anyways, let me make a thought here. The Six Queens Teller Network attempts to let all people who have been touched by the tentacles of the Watchtower, it, it gives everyone an opportunity to tell their story. The six screens, its moderators, its show hosts, its listeners, and callers do not necessarily agree or endorse all the thoughts and expressions that you'll be hearing here tonight on the network. So I want you to know that uh, I have been in contact with this lady. Her name is Veronica, and uh, she will be on here tonight. Now, I'm just going to give you a little overview of Veronica and how we came in contact. Veronica emailed me uh, oh, a couple weeks ago and said that she really has some information that she wants to share with the six screens. She says it's very vital to hear this information concerning the occult connection uh, the Watchtower has. And, of course, we've always, we've always heard of this connection, but what's a fascination here is Veronica is willing to go a little bit deeper than we would normally go. Now, it's so painful for her, she didn't want to keep it in. She wanted to speak out about it tonight here on the six screens. Now, Veronica claims there's a secretive occult order within the Watchtower organization, and she says her family was part of it, a barn-in Jehovah's Witness, she was ritually, satanically, and sexually abused by members of that religion. Veronica met Fred Franz and Melton Henschel. They were both presidents of the Watchtower. She met them when she was a young child. She claimed they were very scary and very cruel. They used horrifying mind control tactics and channeling. And they made her channel. They made her get in touch with the demons and, 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 and talk to the officials of the Watchtower about what the demons were saying. Veronica experienced the darkest, evil side of the Watchtower, including satanic meetings in the Kingdom Hall, claiming there were acts of human sacrifice, child sexual abuse, and as the frenzied perpetrators, they dressed up in beastly costumes and performed the depraved rituals. Friends, I know it sounds unbelievable, but Veronica believes that her story here tonight will wake up a lot of people and make them leave one of the most dangerous and destructive organizations in the world. Veronica, are you on there with us? Yes, can you hear me? I can hear you, Veronica. Let me get a sound check. I want you to speak nice and close to your phone. I think it's very, very important that people hear every word you say. You and I had mm -hmm. a number of conversations, email, yep. telephone conversations. I acknowledge you as a very credible lady. I know that you're not trying to pull the wool over anybody's eyes. 
Do you want to come on and tell your story? And that's what we do here on the Six Queens. We allow everyone to tell their story, no matter how bizarre and strange it may be. And not everyone's going to agree tonight with you, Veronica, but you're a strong woman. I'm sure that you'll understand that, right? Yes. Okay, yep. so you do, you do understand that. Now, you yes. do want us to refer to you as Veronica, is that correct? Yes. Okay, so that's good. Now, you just stay very close to your phone. It's very important okay. we hear every word you say because, uh, I mean, people are taking notes. People are taking notes. I had uh, a number of people that wrote me today, and they said, I'll be listening. Uh, Rick, I know of similar stories like this. I just want to... Uh, comparing notes. So if there's people out there tonight comparing notes. I want you to know that. So mm -hmm. what we're going to do here, Veronica, is we always go back, whenever I interview someone here on the six screens, <laughs> excuse me, what we always do is I always go back to the scene of the accident. That's what I call it. That's when you first became a Jehovah's Witness. So when, when were you first introduced to the Jehovah's Witness movement. I was born into it. You said that you were actually born in as a, a, a Jehovah's Witness as a little child. Now, obviously, uh, born in, I, I was a, basically born in too. It's, it's a different way of life. Now, the only thing is I was born into a, a divided household, so to speak. My mother was a witness and my father wasn't. But I certainly wasn't born into an occult order witness family. And basically, that's what you were born into, Veronica. Yep. Yeah, basically, yeah, so my mom was a seer, and my grandmother was a witch, I guess you'd say. Yeah, now, that's, now what, what, I just want the audience to know something. This is, well, when I say there's an order of Jehovah's Witnesses, a class of Jehovah's Witnesses that are in this really occult position, uh, the secret meetings. Now, I've heard of this a number of occasions before, and uh, we had one woman on our program a few years back that spoke about this, but there were others that were going to speak about this. I never let them come on. But, you know, my, my feelings have changed on this. Uh, I've heard there's actually four of them, three of them, it's one, two, three, three other people Three, three other people, four other people, four, four other people that uh, that mention the same thing about a, an occult order of Jehovah's Witnesses that were really steeped into the occult, and you know, and it's very hot. So you were born into what they would call an occult order. Now, tell tell us what would be different in the occult order of Jehovah's Witnesses versus just being a regular Jehovah's Witness? Um, there would be a lot of um, extra extra meetings that weren't, you know, on the schedule, and they would only certain ones that were in on it would meet and uh, do the rituals. It was kind of like, I don't know... How they would initiate them, I guess they would just kind of feel somebody out, kind of like how they invited you to Bethel. They kind of feel you out, see, if, you know, what you're into, and, and then sometimes they'll, they can drug a person, and then they get dirt on you. A lot of times that's what elders' meetings are for, is to get dirt on people so that they can um, uh, blackmail you so that you have to do it. A lot of men are and women are, are blackmailed by that. They do that in Scientology as well. All right, so we've got this occult order of Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, you, you went to the regular meetings as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right, now, I'm going to have you speak nice and I'm have you speak up as loud as you can. I, I want everyone to hear what you have to say, Veronica. It's so important. You come as close sure. to your phone, speak up nice and loud so people can really hear you. Very, very important. Uh, we got people listening in on the video suite. They're listening in from all over the world. We've got them coming yeah. in from Ireland, from Australia, from the United Kingdom, pretty much all over. So we want everyone to be able to hear you. Uh, so let's just talk about this. As a, you, in other words, you'd go to regular meetings, but also you had some of these special occult meetings. Yeah. Yes. Um, 
basically the the daytime meetings were just to keep the you know keep the people who are paying the bills in order and then the real business was taken care of separately the meetings were just you know just for financial reasons to keep the religion going so that the real business could be taken care of afterwards so the real business would take place in these occult meetings now were there any high officials of the watchtower involved in these meetings yeah most of them most of them would would come and of course we were in a very rural area i won't say where but um so it was isolated and so that there weren't a lot of witnesses you know visually to be able to see what when they came in on their planes they'd They'd fly in, you know, on little, um, like, puddle jumpers and, and come in, you know, you know, secretly and and show up. And I would never necessarily know when it was going to happen. Um, sometimes my parents would be there. Sometimes they wouldn't. You know, I would basically be hoodwinked and, you know, sometimes in the middle of the night. Now, could you, can you name some names? of the watch our officials that would have been there, big big wigs, so to speak. Fred Franz um, and uh, Nathan Knorr, Nathan Homer Knorr. And there were some others that I recognized from the magazines, but uh, like Swingle, I recognized him right away. I was trying to, you know, find the names because I just didn't want to think about it for, for decades. I haven't wanted to think about it. And so I went back and to see who... Um, was in on it. So All I can, right. Well, let me let me let me ask you this. Can you can you kind of describe Fred Franz for us? Um, he, the, I don't know, seemed bony and just harsh. Everything about him was sharp and harsh. And he he, when I would look at him, I would just see just a skeleton just evil in his eyes i could just see he was just near about to bite your head off at any moment and and you just didn't speak unless you were spoken to um you know nor was a little more quiet um and so was swingle and and the other ones but they would get into fights almost to fist fights sometimes if things didn't go the way they were supposed to go. And so I had to, you know, make sure that whatever ritual they wanted me to perform, I had to do it perfectly because otherwise there would, you know, literally be hell to pay. All right. So you're, you're claiming that we'll just stay right with these occult meetings that you claim take place. So we did have high officials of the watchtower come to these meetings. Now, how many people were you saying were in these meetings? Um, a lot of times it would be 13 because of the, of course, because of the number. That was always important. So sometimes if there were more, seven was kind of a good one or 11, but basically they would want 13. So they, they really deal, I mean, they're, they're deep, they're steeped in numerology as well. Uh, Very much. Yeah. Now we'll get to that in a second, but I just want people to, to, to get an idea here. We're, we're talking about satanic ritual meetings. Now, they would take place in the Kingdom Hall, is that correct? Um, yeah, it would happen sometimes out in, like, the field behind our house and a lot of times in the Kingdom Hall, you know, in the um, up on the stage. It depended on who was around at the time or, or whatever they felt, wherever the portal or whatever they felt, where it was coming from. Um, it just, I guess it pretty much just depended on wherever Franz wanted it. And, and it right, didn't so, matter why he said it. He, you know, we just listened to him. All right, wherever it was. But now I'd just like to know all these meetings, how, how did it start? I mean, was there a prayer said? Was there a chant? How, how did these special adult meetings start? Um, a lot of times they would um, give me special, you know, candies. Um, they said, oh, that, you know, called them white rabbits. You would, they would always get me drugged up, whether they had, um, you know, 
uh, acid in them or LSD or, or even marijuana. I'm not quite sure. Um, but they would give them to my parents as well sometimes because they would get worked up because at first my parents weren't really, you know, they weren't very happy with it at first, I, I think, but then they got more, they accepted it, I guess. Uh, my mom was more, because she saw things, she was, she had visions and stuff, and that's how they saw my mom first, and then they had my mom get pregnant with me purposely on a special day for a special means. So it's basically so you, just, so uh, you, an experiment. So you, so you, 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 were, tw- you, you were somewhat uh, encouraged that they wanted you as like an occult baby uh, to yeah. be able to work with them in channeling? Is that the whole purpose here? Yes. Yeah, it was purposefully, I was purposely conceived and born on a specific day. I don't want to say my birthday, but I was born because they would know who I was, but maybe, but um, on a specific day, yeah. All right. All right, let's just, uh, and then we'll, we'll, we'll continue on with this, but, you know, I want to hear more about these meetings now. Yeah. Uh, with, these, with these meetings, you know, you claimed, and when we talked, uh, you know, this week, that some pretty bizarre things took place in the satanic ritual meetings, as you referred to them as. You talked about human sacrifice. You talked about child molestation. Can can you, you know, talk a little more about that and kind of, you know, let us know what went on in these meetings? Um, There was a lot of animal sacrifices, um, a lot of bloodletting, lots of bloodletting. Oh, you know, it always ended up, a lot of times in in masonry, they like to um, pretend to kill someone, and then, um, I mean, they eventually killed my my grandmother, and they killed my mother, Um, and I was supposed to die younger, but my mom fought against it. They tried to make it look like I had leukemia, and um, but my mom then backed out. Thank goodness. But then she gave oh. herself up instead. So was this done in one of these satanic ritual meetings? No, it, it was later on. In that, well, yeah. when she was dying, it was done in a during a satanic ritual in the house. Yeah. I mean, this is all, I mean, obviously people hearing this go, wow, that is just unbelievable. Uh, yeah. Okay. So you do claim sacrifices, animals, humans, uh, mm-hmm. babies? I mean, can we bring babies in here too? Or? I never saw any, well, there was a lot of beatings. I never saw any babies be killed. Um, but, of course, they're very clever with the whole no blood transfusion. They're clever. They want it to look like it was a medical procedure or it was something gone wrong because I don't know if before that they would get um, more people looking at them, like, hey, people are disappearing, but it's just a clever ruse. Um, the, the operating table is just a, a, a altar and and a lot of these people, if they are sick with the flu, they'll get, you know, talked into letting it go because it's better to be a, to die of the ritual sacrifice to Lucifer because you're guaranteed a seat beside him and let it go. So they would manipulate certain medical ailments that, like, if you had... Um, your appendix about to burst, they would convince you, no, and then they would do certain rituals. And a lot of times the hospital committee, certain ones, will do a ritual behind the scenes. People don't realize what's going on. And they'll. that's why they don't let members of the family into those hospital rooms is because they're doing these certain, they'll act like they're praying over the person, but they're not, you know, not 
to a, a God in heaven, but they're they're doing a certain ritual so that that person's blood will be spilled in the name of Lucifer. Well, there you it's go. All now, we, well, what the, the the question at this juncture, and even my wife Susan here, she 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 wanted me to ask you this. Uh, we we know about the you know refusal of a blood transfusion and people die. Uh, mm-hmm. Is there any way we can tie that into these uh, satanic rituals? Is is this uh, something that uh, is certainly connected, or is this uh, something oh, that doesn't come up? Yeah, it's it's definitely um, the governing body are all masons. They wear their masonic rings on their right hands, even the current ones. Um, you wouldn't know what to look for unless a member of the, of the Masonic Order. Um, but they take a vow to Lucifer, every single one of them, that once a year they promise to bring a, blo- a human blood sacrifice to Lucifer. And during the 80s, there were so many deaths that it got, you know, it got to be, I guess, maybe too much. And that's why they're letting, they're letting fractions because it's happening too much. And now there's only seven men. But that's the reason why. There's no other reason why. That's the 100% reason. It needs to be, and they don't want them necessarily to die of just a disease. They want it to be as bloody as possible. So that's why it has to be not whole blood, because whole blood will stop someone in a bad accident, or specifically a woman in childbirth, or a baby. That's that's what they want. The younger the victim, the better. The more bloody, the better. So they don't care about these little tiny things, you know, where you may need a little bit of a fraction. They they want it to be gross. They want it to be traumatic. The more the person suffers, the better. So that presents itself as a better sacrifice to Satan is what you're saying. Yes. All right. Definitely. All right. Well, I mean, it's very, you know, I'm just trying to wrap my head around all of this, and then don't mind me asking the questions, and we'll open the lines up okay. later on, and others can ask questions, too, because, I mean, obviously, there's going to be a lot to a lot to, to, to come to grips with here. A lot of people are hearing this for the very first time, Veronica, so you can you can imagine okay. that, it's like, what, you know, because... I thought it was know, obvious to be <laughs> Yeah, well, no, to you, it's probably like, you know, you, you know putting your, your, your pillowcase on. It's not a big deal. But, I mean, yeah. for most people, it's like, what? I've never heard of that before. And they're going to say, that is just bizarre. Why Why didn't I hear this when I was a, was a witness? Now, how is it they keep this all secret? Why, why can we all go to the Kingdom Hall? And, you know, none of us had a clue this was all going on behind our back. How, how was it it was all kept from us? Yeah, well, they they target a certain kind of person. Um, they they practiced it a lot, and my grandfather was a POW in World War II, and uh, he he made the statement that well, if you can't beat them, join them, because he saw what went on, and um, a lot of um, mind control was done in those camps, so they had things set out pretty pretty perfectly of how to do the trauma-based mind control and what to do, how to do it, when to do it. Um, Masonic orders usually have about a 20-year plan set out so that they know what's coming out, what they need to do at a specific time to get a certain reaction out of people. So everything is planned to get these cattle to react in a certain way. The cattle would be us regular JWs. And to get um, to get them to react a certain way to when they need money, like the 1975, they needed it, they made people do it. It's all a plan, a diabolical plan. It's all a plan is right. Now, even on that 1975, well, while you're on that subject, we we talked to earlier this week that it wasn't supposed to come in 75, it was supposed to come in 74. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, and then 75 was a misprint, and um, but they had already, it, it rhymed with stay alive with 75. Brands liked the sound of it, and 
it's like it really didn't matter anyway. All he cared, but it was supposed to coincide with 1874. So it was never supposed to be 75. And All so right. they were expecting it then. All right, now we've got, so have you ever, have you ever visited Bethel, New York? Yes, not uh, like a regular person, <laughs> but uh, in the darkness of night and only once. I don't know if, what the purpose was, but I was there once. You were there once? I mean, was there some satanic ritual taking place or what? Exactly remember. I wish that I could. It Okay. I just remember well, being terrified. And I remember um I don't even want to, I mean all these things need to be said. I remember losing control of my bodily functions. Um Was that bad? Every, every yeah, every, ever since then, um certain things will remind me of that. And, and it happens again and again and again. It, I mean, it utterly terrifying that it it will. I mean, you know, a grown woman. Um, I, I even have, sometimes I'll I'll see an old Watchtower cover that I was um, a guinea pig on for the for the mind control, and um, I'll have that reaction, and and that's what it's meant. It's meant to create utter. Anarchy, because they're anarchists. They're yeah. Jesuit Jews and Masons who want to create anarchy. Well, that's exactly right. Now you are, are on here tonight. This story has been with you for many years. This occult yeah. connection with the Watchtower. You are tired of it. You want to come on and speak about it. You want people to know about it. Now. Yeah. It's very fascinating, very, very fascinating. And uh, we always get a lot of interest in this. Now, when we do open the lines up, you're going to have questions asked, and just uh, just answer them as you're, you're answering them here to me. I don't know what they're going to be asking you, but uh, the thing that I, I want all of you folks that are listening in here tonight, you know, let's understand something. Even if you're not uh, a spiritual-minded person and, you know, you don't believe in God and you left the Watchtower so spiritually abused, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in the devil, that it's that, that this is okay. So, you know, that's going to even be more difficult for you. But uh, myself, I know that the Watchtower is a pretty slick operation. They, they, they're they able to pull things off that normal businesses can't. They, 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 they get people doing things that a normal business could not get a person to do. But the Watchtower does it so easily. People become so loyal. They become so connected to the Watchtower. You say, well, how is that done? And I've always put Satan at the helm. And damn, I'm sorry. I, I just always put Satan at the helm that this organization can only be run by a mastermind, someone that's smarter than a human. And I say Satan's going to be involved in this organization. Now, I know you're saying, Rick, knock it off. You know, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the devil. I understand that. But you do admit that the Watchtower is very esoteric, very secretive. The, the manipulate, manipulators of the highest order. So you know, at least go with that. And what, what uh, Veronica is talking one, about here. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, there's one way for me to explain it to people who don't believe in God is that it doesn't matter if you believe in God, they do. And whether what they do works according to whatever their minds think, it doesn't matter it's what they're doing for whatever their cause is. You know, it, whether whether their rituals work or not, it's what they're doing. You know, it's not that it's it's legitimate or Satan exists or God exists. It, it's their actions that are, are are harmful. You know, so it it doesn't have anything to do with if Satan actually does exist. It's that they just need to stop doing harming people. You know what I mean? 
for people who don't believe in God or the devil. Yeah, but I mean, when you talk in satanic ritual abuse, they're ob- obviously relying on the powers of the dark, the, 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 yeah. the, the powers of the spirit realm, the bad spirit realm to help them. So, you know, that's, well, I mean, people can take that for what it's worth. But what we're going to yeah. do, Veronica, is we've got people writing all over the place here on the video suite. They're, they're saying that, uh, y- y- you know, some people are saying it's not making sense to them. And obviously because they're hearing it perhaps for the first time, other people are saying, hey, the woman is very credible and very sensible-minded. And... Uh, I think it's just neat. I think it's neat that we can get people, at least I'm glad we have some people listening in for the first time because they're going to say, wow, they're going to they're gonna be glued to this seat as you can continue to talk. Now, could we open up the lines? Could we, could we bring some people on because, you know, they got some questions they might want to ask you. Now, just bear in mind, stay nice and close to your phone, talk nice and clear and articulate, and they'll be able to hear every word you say. So let's get started. Who would like to come in and say hello to Veronica? Boy, I'll tell you. Hey, Rick. Came on. Yeah. Go ahead. Yep. Hey, Rick. Veronica, good evening. Yes. Hi. Yeah, well, how are you? I just want you to know, this is a Dick Gorgi from Haverhill, Mass. But I believe every word you say, and I know that Rick was in the past hesitant to put people on the air that had similar experiences because he didn't think that people would, would believe it or that we were way over the top. But I, I've, I've been listening intensely to uh, six screens for 10 or 12 years, and all of a sudden you get to realize that Satan the devil controls everything in the world. And he certainly controls an organization that calls itself the truth. And then you catch him in lie after lie after lie after lie. The father of the lie is Satan the devil. So I certainly do believe that weird things, almost unbelievable things, happen at Kingdom Halls. And I certainly believe anything that has to do with blood or blood rituals certainly can be indicative of J.W. conduct at the highest level. Thank you for coming on the six screens, Veronica. Um, and, and, I, and, I, and I just want to say again, I believe every single word that you've just uttered. And thank you for coming on the program tonight. Thanks. That means a lot to me. It really does. I mean, that means a whole lot to me. Well, there you go. He's a sensible-minded man. He's been listening in for many years. He has Could a I program. Be yeah, he has a program himself on the six screens and. Uh, so there you go, uh, right out of the chute. So we we, we got to believe her. we got to believe it. So that's great. So go ahead, Tristan. Go ahead, Don. Hey, Veronica. It's, it's Don again. And Hi. Yeah, yeah, your story is fascinating, sweetie, even though I know it's it's been very traumatic for you, even though you might be a little used to it now. It was really traumatic for you. Um to the best of your recollection, I know that you were explaining that it doesn't necessarily matter matter what you're believing. It's it's just doing the ritual. It's doing the channeling, making them them uh, feeling like they have a connection to the unknown. But to the best of your recollection, what do you think was the information they were wanting to get from the spirit realm that would somehow benefit them? Uh, what you think it involved ideas they wanted to write in articles in their literature, or what what do you think was the information they were trying to get? Yeah, they wanted to get answers on everything, like the, the even uh, things you know, were they chosen at Pentecost, or were they or was it in 1914 and and you know, I wasn't just a channeler, like they did, um, there was crystal balls, like the, that's one of the things with the Awake, mm-hmm. the 2017 Awake, which I was so shocked that they actually um, had that on there, it was so blatant. Um, the tarot, the Masonic tarot deck, because of course the, the Tower of Watchtower of Babel, that's what Watchtower stands for. Um and that's what the the tower card um, for the the tarot means destruction, 
And so they would want to know information about the Catholics. They would want to know, I mean, any type of prophecy that they have new light on, you can be guaranteed that they, they um, consulted one of their channels. I know Russell um, had made comments before that if one channel doesn't work, you find another one, which means, you know, you consult a mirror or you consult a crystal or you consult um, looking into water or, or the tarot or, or, or any type of thing or, or automatic writing. Um, they would just consult all different ways, every single way possible, even the Great Pyramid, you know, they he, you know, wrote about that or, or even, um, you know, the bumps on your head, feeling what your future is going to be, you know, reading your palm, um, you know, any type right. of channel so the, to consult. Yeah, because to, to Freemasons, that ancient, ancient Egyptian uh, secretive uh, information is the, is the real fountainhead for them. They're always trying to go back and find out what the ancient Egyptians knew um the, the the practices and, and uh, rituals they had, they're always trying to go back and relearn that. Um, yeah. That's I think that's why Russell was so in, interested in Egyptology up until the time he died in 1916. So you're saying that um, they were looking for answers to everything. Um, so they had certain questions they were obviously asking. Now, mm -hmm. do you did you get the impression that they? Because, you know, it's like if you're opening a portal and you're doing channeling or whatever, I mean, there's bad angels that can, uh, you know, uh, bad entities that can give you, t that can lie to you, give you false information. Was it your impression that they lean towards trusting any, oh, that they lean towards trusting any, um, any answers that they got or that they, they, they have to think about it or question the answers that they got or what was your impression about that? Um, if, if they got, if, well, if Franz got the answer he wanted, that's what was most important. And he would get extremely excited. Otherwise, I don't, I'm going to get choked up. Um, otherwise, if it was a bad answer, um, you know, if it was a bad answer, you know that wasn't good at all for me, and um, so it was it was terror. Seeing you know seeing the seeing the cards or or seeing you know because I knew that um, there would need to be um, a a sacrifice given to be able to get the you know devil or whatever Lucifer or the um, you know bad angel to give the right answer, give them the power, you know, what do you need? Like they would say, you know, well, what do you need to be able to make it happen if it's not going to happen? Um, and that would, you know, whether they had to um, sexually abuse someone, whether it was me or someone, another unsuspecting child in another small little congregation, they would do whatever they had to do. And so they have certain pedophiles in place per congregation and and so they would have a certain um him do certain things and then tell them did you do it and and that would hopefully be enough to then then we'd have to redo the ceremony and hope that it turned out different and and they would keep doing it until they got the result they wanted no matter the cost no matter who had to suffer no matter who you know, how many children were raped, it didn't matter. So they were really haughty thinking that they already had the answer. They just wanted confirmation using their little spirit guides that they would call up through you. Yeah. It almost sounds like they were so full of themselves. They, uh, well, I hate to repeat myself. They almost thought they were right. They just wanted confirmation, and they call those using little spirit guides, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah mediums or just cattle there's like a lat i can't remember it for the life of me but there's a, t a masonic term for cattle that they just would continually you know domesticated animals and it, it upsets me so bad that they say oh our fellow domestics because i know that that is a disgusting term that they're using for all of all of you that 
you know, you're just domestic, you know, like, like housekeepers, you know, I mean, basically, you know, starting janitorial services and, and things like that is just your domesticated help, you know, funding their satanic, Jesuit, crazy, satanic ways. Yeah, well, in fact, very interesting, interesting Veronica. So uh, I want to uh, uh, say I appreciate you coming on. I'm going to mute out here and keep listening. And I'm sorry you, you had to go through this when you were when you were younger, but it's it's really teaching and helping a lot of people now. So thanks, Veronica. And I'm going to mute out. You're welcome. Thank you. Well, we appreciate you, John, coming on. Now, look, we got a lot of people on the video screen, and they got all kinds of questions. They're, you know, some are just dumbfounded. They're, 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 they're not getting any part of this. So I'm just going to backtrack a little bit for the sake of new ones coming on and listening in. We have Veronica on with us. Uh, she's a young woman, a uh, former Jehovah's Witness, who was in what she would refer to, and I'm not, I, I will coin the phrase, a cult Jehovah's Witness. There's an order of Jehovah's Witnesses that she claims are in steeped into the occult. She was born into that. Her mother and father were in this occult witness connection. Now, but I don't know how much clearer we can make that, folks. If you're listening on the video suite or out there on our radio line, I, I know it sounds strange to say, well, why didn't I ever hear of it? Well, I've heard of it. Yeah, I've been doing this program now 13 years. I've heard of this on a number of occasions. I've only allowed one other person to come on and speak about this. But now I'm saying, look, and I'm willing to open up the door. And we've got uh, we've got Veronica on with us tonight speaking. So she was in this occult order of Jehovah's Witnesses where satanic ritual abuse took place. Now, I'm going to try to make as clear as I can for those listening in on the video suite. These abuse rituals uh, were done in the secrecy of a kingdom hall or maybe in some other place. But nonetheless, uh, high officials of the Watchtower were involved in these satanic ritual abuse sessions. Uh, children were molested. Uh, people were involved in very occult practices as even young Veronica was. She was what they call an automatic writer. Look, look it up online. It's a channeler. It's a person that writes down information from the realms of the dark and shares it with someone, and that's what she was doing with the Watchtower. I, I don't know how much clearer I could be on that. I mean, I know it sounds bizarre and strange, but that's what she was, an automatic writer or channeler. This is not the first we've heard of this. May I and, uh, George, uh, go ahead. I'm sorry. May I speak with Veronica? Is that okay? Oh, go ahead, uh, go, go ahead Emory. Yeah. Oh, thank you, Veronica. <laughs> How are you doing? Oh. Sorry, I can't hear you. No worries. I can't hear you. Are you okay? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. How I'm are okay. you right now okay. emotionally? Because I know that. Speaking about this kind of trauma, you might sound calm on the outside, but it, it brings up all of the terror and the fear. And I, and I just want to know, are you doing okay right now? Mm, I feel like I'm about to pass out. My throat is about to close up. I mean, it's and my hands are soaking wet. <laughs> but I, I've been sitting here with my, ta you know, my notepad, just trying to keep focused. And uh, I was, I was wondering if I could maybe be of some help and support in, in being able to say, uh, speak in a sequential way, but yet in a way that protects you from 20 questions coming from 30 different directions, and there's no real clear sequential thing. The only reason I say this is because personally, um, I've been involved with demonism and with witchcraft and with uh, paranormal stuff that if you talk to a regular person, they either look at you like you're crazy or even if they believe mm -hmm. you, they really don't get it. They they just really don't get it. Um, yeah. I, I, without going into details on the air, I want you to know, as one person who has lived pretty scary crap, pretty scary, mm -hmm. I feel what you're saying and I know you're telling the truth. 
Is it okay if I if I do that with you right now? Yeah, of Let's course. Just take a breath, sweetheart. You mentioned that you were born specifically in an arranged way, made to become conceived and birthed on a certain day. Uh, is there mm-hmm. anything uh, you want to add to that, just so we can understand what you mean by that? Um, it was to bring on Armageddon. Like, um, to be the Antichrist, basically. I was called the Antichrist straight to my face oh. many times. Oh, honey, I'm so, so sorry. That's okay. So You're not the Antichrist. They tried to <laughs> use you. For anyone that doesn't understand this is real, huh? you know, we remember people getting baptized in the name of the spirit-directed organization, and, and for, you know, it's like look, the devil must be laughing, and we know this isn't God's yeah. anything. So you, no. I was just wondering if it's not, if it's too much for you, please don't do it. But you describe rituals and portals and little bits and pieces, and I was just wondering if you can kind of go through one time, like you, you were taken to the Kingdom Hall back room, to a downstairs or whatever, some, some specific instance, if you care to share in a sequential manner. Are you able to do that without anyone interrupting you so you don't get, you know, doesn't hurt you more? Yeah, a lot of it, um, they even did a lot of, um, you know, just mind control, um, a lot of uh, testing. I was constantly tested, even in a laboratory. Like, I I remember puzzles and, and, and all kinds of things that they would just constantly have me doing. But with the, um, I remember... A lot. I would wake up. There was a black rocking chair in, in my room, and I would wake up, and the rocking chair would be rocking, just like in you know a typical stereotypical Exorcist movie. And um, you know there would be like a black mass there, and his eyes would just be piercingly just red, you know, dark red, um, like kind of like like blood, you know, not bright red, but dark red with, um, uh, you know, sharp eye or sharp uh, teeth when he would smile. And um, things would happen where my clothes would be rearranged. Um, and when there was, the back door was always left open and my parents would lock their bedroom door and they would leave the back door open and they would come in sometimes at at night and take me out and um, they would have things ready, you know, a pentagram in, in, you know, in the grass and there would be certain things ready. I would have to watch better it was. And um, I'll never forget the hideous way that um, Fred Franz would laugh. He didn't laugh much when he laughed. When he laughed during those rituals, it was not. It was just not right. It wasn't a human laugh. And um, they would wear certain robes, and I was usually in like in my nightgown, and um, you know, barefoot and and cold sometimes, or sometimes it would be really hot. And uh, sometimes they make me lay down in the grass as they um, would they be chanting or dancing around or acting crazy and I'm just picturing you alone. Yeah. I'm picturing how alone you must have felt. Um, sometimes yeah, it just depended on which type of of thing. If they want, if it was quiet for a crystal, you know, the crystal type ceremony of of see, you know seeing like that. It depended on if it was a bloodletting ceremony, then they would chant louder, you know, and, and um, it just depended on which ceremony that they were doing or if they wanted me to figure out something. Um, a lot of times with the uh, with the mind control, with the, um, to see if it worked on other people, because um, I know what it, had, what it would do to me when I would see those certain... Uh, photo you know the the pictures that they would draw they would it would have a certain they would get me in some kind of a a drugged out state 
and then they would show me these pictures that they would draw and it would it actually would make my body react in a way that I didn't want to react. And so when they when they say, Oh, you shouldn't have a reaction, you know, suppress your your ability to suppress this they're deliberately putting those things in there in a chant type of way through, through the watchtower and through these things so that you can't control your body so that then you feel bad and then you go to the elders and then they have dirt on you. That's, that's the, they, they want that. They want you to confess you. They're making you sin on purpose. And so when I see these good people going to the elders and feeling guilty, they wouldn't have done that normally. None of us would have done any of those things normally if if we weren't under this disgusting mind control. And um, I mean, just the, you know. Rick. Yes. Uh, this is Steve. Um, I understand what she's talking about, and from reading what's uh, what is being said on the screen and some of the, a lot of the comments. People aren't getting it, but what they need to do is they need to look up MK Ultra mind control, like the sister mentioned earlier, and also Operation Paperclip. It's going to take some reading, but if they take the time to research this and 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 study it, they will absolutely positively understand what this sister is talking about. What she is talking about. The roots go back to World War II. The United States and Germany were both involved in creating a mind control slave. They were experimenting. After the war, the United States knew Germany was experimenting with mind control. So they took the German, some of the German scientists, like uh, Gottlieb was one, and uh, they began experimenting with this. And they got caught doing it. And you can even, uh, these government, these, this mind control program, you can find documents that are declassified government documents that say and admit they participated in this. And there was a congressional hearing into this activity. And they got caught because they were extreme, there was extremely, extremely abusive to people, almost torture. And what happens when a person is put under this extreme trauma, their mind begins to departmentalize. And when they do, they build different altars. So one person could be, one personality could be a totally normal housewife. The other one could, the other alternate personality could be a drug dealing prostitute. But it sounds strange, but you really need to do your homework, and these people need to study this to understand exactly what she's talking about. Yeah, and I've looked into all of this. I've studied it. I know it's real, and I, and I really appreciate your bringing that up. And they especially were horrible to children. They used to beat yes. them and beat them and beat them, and the ones that didn't die, they would get them close to death and then rebuild them from there. But the thing yes. is, people can look it up, and if they don't know, you know what, do the research. I've done the You've done the research. I'm concerned about Veronica right now. She came and she has been willing to um, talk, and this is very, very hard for her. And I was just wondering if, um, if Veronica is still able to talk right now. Yeah, it feels good to get it out. I need people to understand that I'm not doing this for any type of financial gain. I actually lost, I gave up millions of dollars in inheritance because I didn't want to be a part of this because it's blood money. So, I mean, I'm living basically in poverty when I could be living a lavish life, but I refuse, I refuse. And, and my father is close to death as it is, and, and I could just hold on for a little longer, but, you know, and get his money, but I refuse. You know, I, I can't see other people being in pain, and I just need them to understand and listen to me and, and I just hope that they under, that they eventually get it because it's important because I mean it's you know I know of too many active pedophiles in the kingdom halls right now and nothing is being done and we all need to act 
you know, work together and, and do this together and get it, you know, get it taken care of and stop, stop what's happening. Monica, uh-huh. Monica, um, instead of me asking you questions about your uh, your personal experiences and such, uh, I'll do that, but not quite as uh, close to heart. Maybe uh, that way it might not be as traumatic. Um, let's see. So you were in there up to about a year ago, and uh, mm-hmm. is that uh, actually, if you don't mind, I got several little little questions for you. But uh, um, was last year the the last time that uh, they called upon you? Some in the the watchtower, or um, whether it's been they, a few years before or what? When I um, lost my virginity to, you know, legitimately, not by um, molestation or, or rape by them, um, it was basically when I was just left on my own once you hit puberty. Um, I was supposed to marry an anointed man. I don't um, know if they had plans of him being a governing body member or not, because uh, most would think, I have a feeling I know with Swingle, his wife was a medium as well, along with my mother, that a lot of them marry not for love, but they marry because one is a Mason, and they, just like um, Johannes Grieber, where he was a medium and he married a medium, That that's the way that kind of works. And so they wanted to match me to um, the son of a... Uh, um, well, uh, there was two different ones. The one was anointed. The other one was the son of a medicine man. And so they wanted to make a match that way, but I refused. Well, what, I, what I'm what i trying to get at, I guess, is when's the last time you, uh, you met, you interacted with uh, one of the governing body members? Uh, in particular, are, are there any... I'm, I'm not asking you to necessarily name a name, but uh, have you ever met any of the seven people on there now? No. Um, so I the, the involvement uh, from Watchtower was back in the time mostly of Noor and Freddie Friends. Friends um, died in... Yeah, Henschel and, and uh-huh. Noor was really, really old um, when I was little, and um, so it was, you know, and uh, what was I going to say? Um, but my uncles have met the current governing body, and my mm-hmm. uncles are pedophiles. And, well, the Watchtower, um, incestuous. from what I can see, they, they seem like they're wanting to turn into, to, to morph into something else other than what they have been. I don't know if they want to become more Mormon, more like the Pentecostals, more like who or what. But uh, do do you have any thoughts on that as to their their future direction? Um, basically, basically, what they're just doing is keep people happy. Be there. Well, I'm not sure what happened there, Joe. Uh, she seemed to drop off the radar screen here. We some of them are, some of them might be a bunch of phonies, too, as far as I'm well, concerned. Well, I, I do believe that some of them are. Uh, well, if they keep saying, I don't know what you're talking about, well, that sounds awfully dumb to me. I, yeah. I don't believe them. Uh, so I, I wouldn't lose any sleep or, or anything over people acting dumber than they even than they actually are. Uh, hey, I'm with Joe on that one. Personally, there's been too much evidence, and if somebody doesn't want to do the work or at least take it for credit value and before you judge, check it out. Check out the facts. Even the Bible says, you know, in Proverbs, I think it is, that the fool is one who has an answer before he checks out the facts. You know, it's too easy. I told my story about other things, 
and the first person in the audience that commented was, uh, <laughs> not hey guys. Know, what were you smoking? You know, it's like if you don't understand it, then therefore the person telling the story is crazy. This girl is telling a story that asked a lot of people. Hey, guys. Sorry. Hey, Veronica, are you back? Yeah, I'm back. I, I, my phone must have just disconnected. What was that about the Veronica? You were saying something about they're just trying to keep the people pleased. Could you could you expand on what you mean there? You don't. Uh, I gather you don't feel that they're necessarily heading in a particular direction. Maybe they're just. Or is this what you're saying? They're just kind of uh, trying to feel their way along and uh, try to please some people. Yeah. Whatever they might it, it, want. It's based on, you know, they take um, copious notes when people call and the letters of if more people are upset and how many people are leaving, whether they need to give a little bone of, well, maybe, you know, okay, they'll they'll give a watchtower on, maybe you should be a little more lenient. But then three months later, they'll contradict themselves and say, you know, you need to cut off everybody and, you know, the like the the public the public public you know for the public say sometimes a completely different meaning to you know to the the public publications but then to the study editions it's more because none of us normally read both of of both of them and compare them side by side and so you know they may kind of hint to it, kind of like... Okay, in any case, they're not going in a particular direction. They're just kind of jumping to the left and then to the right and then back around again. Yeah, they won't reverse the shunning ever. That's what keeps people in line. They may be lax for a couple months or say one little snippet, but they'll go right back to it. They always do. Well, if they don't do it officially, they could do it unofficially, kind of stab at people from the dark. Yeah. Uh, what about yeah, they, money? Do you have any feeling about their 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 money doings? Do they really the need the money? What, what are they doing with it? Do you have any thoughts on that, money, any intuition? Yeah, it goes to fund wars. You know, they they help fund fund uh, with Hitler. You know, they they fund war. They wanted World War One to happen. They, they they needed it to happen, just like the grandfather Bush. Um, he helped fund World War One. You know, and and it helped because well, they're anarchists, and so like the Stephen Byington Bible, they publish it. And they own the rights to the Stephen Byington Bible on their website, you know, the one in the Bible in Living English. Stephen Byington was a proud anarchist. And he said the best way to, like, to control a man is to remove his faith by force. And so that's why they change life and they, they create where witnesses are fighting with each other. And, you know, they look at a a watchtower and somebody sticks to that point and then somebody sticks to an opposite point and it creates chaos in in an organization that's supposed to be unified but we're all such right fighters and we have a persecution complex because we're they they target a certain type of person usually it's an abused person from from broken homes or depressed and we have this little comfort of being in that kingdom hall but we fight amongst ourselves and that's what they want because we're all right fighters. You know, it's like, I'm going to stick here till the end. Well, not all of us, but you know, they, they are. And, and it's like, I'm going to, like my father, you know, I'm going to stick to this till the end because I know it's going to happen. Whether it's right or wrong, they go along. You know, that was one of the things they used to say, you know, right or wrong, go along. And, um, and that's well, basically... You feel- in the past, they had the generation of 1914. That was a, a big doctrine. Do you feel that they uh, may come up with something big like that in the future? 
I just thought about that. There was an article where they made note of that it was 120. Somebody mute your phone, please. There was um, a note that it was 120 years from when Noah was told about the flood from when the flood happened. And so they made kind of a little a little suggestion of that in the watchtower. They made, you know, kind of an offhanded, like, you know, it took 120 years for the flood to happen. And it's been 90, at the time, it was 90 years since 1914. So they, they may start to say something, you know, when it gets to be 100, and that would be soon. But I think people nowadays are, are too smart to fall for, for for that, you know. But they're waiting also. I mean, this is a pattern I've seen that they will wait until the seven, 1975 generation will die because then there's no one there to say, wait, we fell for that ourselves. You know, they, that's why with the 1914 generation, they're not here to say, wait a second they pulled the same BS on us back in, in, you know, 1914. And so, you know, they wait so that there are no, wit- you know, witnesses left to what happened to warn us. And so, you know, that's kind of what they wait for is for certain people to die. So they, they definitely could, but they'll, they'll wait until, you know, my generation may die, you know, be too old or, or people are, you know, who, who saw 75, and then they'll try and pull it again. Everything you're saying makes so much sense, especially when you talked about right fighters and stay in the organization right or wrong and creating mm-hmm. fighting among themselves. That is so true. Yeah. I mean, it's, my mom was the epitome of she would shun someone just for the point, whether she was, right or whatever you know it's like well the watchtower says you know and and that's the kind of mindset is that you know they'll they won't go by their heart they'll go by what's written in that magazine and that's just the way we've we you know we're taught to not have our own opinion our opinion is written on a piece of paper and it's the whims of whatever that man in office has to say you know, when we were young in the early 60s, we were told that the governing body would take turns going into a special room for this specific purpose and that they would pray for yes. Heavenly Father to show them through okay. Heavenly Spirit to uh, what to write in the magazines. And that's why we cherished every new watchtower that came out because it was like straight from God. We mm-hmm. were taught that they went to a special room and had some kind of a meditative prayer channeling session. That's what we were taught. And when That's we what they out, do. Yeah. And I was thinking, you know, when listening to you talk, I'm thinking, wow, that probably wasn't far from the truth. It's just they're, they always seem to be the opposite of the image they portray while laughing in the face of the, for lack of a better word, idiots or idiots who believed it because I believed in hook, line, and sinker. But when mm-hmm. I'm not deep, you know, I'm deprogrammed, I look at it and I'm like, oh, my God, it's so obvious. Here my mom was in witchcraft and everything, and, and, and we saw the demonism. Yeah. We saw the demonism, and all my mom would say was, well, of course, Satan's attacking God's people. That was oh, wow. It. Mine, too. <laughs> What's that? Mine would say the same thing. She yeah. would say She'd be kind of Christian in the in the daylight and then be a complete occultist. It was this split personality, and I, it's like, how can you? I mean, it's just the complete opposite from, from night to day. Yeah, my and, mom was the same way, and to this day, every once in a while, if I have an opportunity to maybe bring it up, she doesn't realize it was like she was almost possessed, and she would yeah. act this horrible way, and yet I know that she's the sweetest person in the world. And I said, well, Mom, I just, in my own little child's mind, I would refer to you as the other mother and just pray oh. for, for my real mom to come back because it wasn't oh. her. And a yeah. lot of them are like that, especially when they go off on, like, friends. I met him myself, and, and he's yeah. just like, you know the guy in Star Trek? 
not Star Trek, the Star Wars, who was the uh, boss of Darth Vader, the real skinny guy with the army uniform. Yes. That, yeah, like looking at a skeleton, yes. Exactly like him. Only that oh guy seemed goodness. nice to me. He didn't <laughs> scare me like Franz did. And when yeah, we went kind of spits that, when he talks and, oh. Did you ever hear, I mean, he scares me when you said you were afraid of him. I just remember being at an assembly when people were really starting to murmur when 75 didn't happen. It was near the end of 76, and we had a special assembly, and so many people had walked away from the organization, and we were all in the audience kind of like, well, what are they going to tell us now? What kind of blah, blah, blah? We all had this attitude. Here comes Franz, and he starts talking, blah, 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 and then he glared at us and started yelling. I have yeah. never in my life had a brother from the podium yell at an audience in the assembly, and he, the way he said it, he said, um, I don't know, like, um, do you know why Armageddon didn't come? And he waits half a second, and he's glaring. You know what I mean when I say those eyes? Yeah. Those bulging, glaring, evil, cynical, snarling eyes. Yeah, it was like it was our fault for Armageddon not coming. That's what he said. He said, do you know why Armageddon didn't come? Because you wanted it to come. Who do you think you are, Joe? It doesn't work on your timetable. And I was thinking, wait a minute. Isn't he the one that created the whole crazy prophecy? And wasn't he? didn't he have the nickname the Oracle? I mean, didn't anybody who's mm-hmm. supposed to be a true Christian think it was strange that the governing body member, the, the president of the, of the Watchtower, would be called as a nickname the Oracle? Ugh, the, yeah. The Oracle? Yeah. Hidden in plain sight. Yeah, we just say it so often it becomes normal. Yeah, but that's what the evil does. I was laughing with Rick about it. Isn't that what evil cults do? Any kind of evil cult, it's almost like this unwritten rule that they tell you what they're going to do before they do it. They tell you what they're doing while they're doing it. They do it in plain sight, but they do it in such a way that if you're not paying attention, that's why you're supposed to leave your brains at the door, no no, depend, no independent thinking allowed, you know, it's mm-hmm. like they, you don't get it, and then they're laughing at you. And then if somebody does get it, they're labeled as, the, you know, tarred and feathered, and you know the whole story. Mm-hmm. I, I applaud you, Veronica. Please, anything you can think of, like you said something about a portal. I am familiar with portals. <laughs> Scare the holy crap out of me when you said that. <sighs> You said yeah, something to it, the effect that if you didn't get the answer Franz wanted, it scared you to death. You didn't know what was going to happen. It meant that somebody might have to have bleed When you say there was bloodletting, that means they cut you, cut other people, and did it mean oh, that yeah. somebody would get hurt? Tell me. Um, usually it was threats of, you know, if this doesn't happen, you know, it's typical of any type of kidnapper or something, you know, I'm going to kill your parents if you talk about this, or you know what's going to happen, or the whole world will die. Sometimes it felt like the whole world was on, on my back, but it started in, you know, just the the complete fear. And I, I, even, I remember distinctly when I would have to rarely go to school, um, I actually considered asking, telling my teacher and saying, I I just want to go to foster care, you know, and and it's like, I didn't know what else to do. And my mom, I told my mom, I'm like, I just, I don't want to be here anymore. And she's like, well, if you think this is bad, you know, foster care is, and she'd tell me about this horrible, you know, how foster care and, you know, we really love you. And, and it's like, you certainly don't act like it. And, it got so bad where I was so abused. I um, I missed so much school because I was in public school at the time that the the um, principal brought the police to our house with the school nurse to check on me to make sure that I was alive. You know that was that was how bad it was. I had ticks. I mean, the things that they did to me made personality problems, um, physical reactions where I would sit and punch myself in the stomach. I remember the the sexual abuse was so prevalent, and so I don't know if they'll ever be accountable. I just wish that Rutherford would have stayed in jail when, when he was, you know, in, in 1918 or whenever he was put in jail. I wish... 
that they would have just kept them there and they would have died in prison. I don't blame you, sweetheart. Oh, honey, I think you're so brave. And you... Hi, Victoria. Wow. Mm-hmm. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Veronica. I didn't mean to interrupt. Um, That's okay. Veronica. Uh, I just have a, a quick question. Um, I've just been listening to everything you've been saying, and it's just been so fascinating. Um, I just, I know you have to be careful, uh, you know, yeah. cause you're, it sounds like you, you have to watch out with your identity and people that know you might know you and stuff, but like, you know, all this stuff that you're describing, you know, and I've heard mm-hmm. other people, you know, bring up MK ultra and all that kind of stuff. And you had mentioned crystal balls and whatnot. Like, where was all this going on? Was it in a kingdom hall? Was it in somebody's house? You know, all these, uh, rituals you're talking about, I, I mean, you know, where was, you know, what was, was are, are there a lot of people that, that knew about this stuff? I mean, these are pretty high profile uh, individuals that were known not only in the organization, but even outside the organization, yeah. like Henschel and, and friends. I mean, so like, you know, were you like the the person, are you saying that the, the governing body was using you as a as a channel or a pathway to the spirit realm or as a portal. I mean, yeah. I'm trying to follow everything. Um, you know, were they more or were they were they more people other than you that the that the Watchtower was using? Um, yeah. Um, I saw this. I, I don't know exactly what they did to my cousin, but she exhibited the exact same kind of signs as I did. Not quite as she would actually freak out during the song. She would just go into a complete crazy thing. Um, But they targeted a lot of small towns because they weren't noticeable. They could just sneak in um, places that maybe had 20 or 25 members, but it had to be, you had to be, they would, they would research who was, who was who. And, um, you know, my father was an elder, so they had his information. They knew when his birthday was, which was a significant birthday. Um, So was my mother's um, and three other people in my father's family. And, um, and they were very much into that. So they, they find, they know who you are. And like when I was a little girl, I had never seen the Da Vinci Code before until about four months ago. And I was stunned. This the same type of of puzzles and things that they would do and and have me like test me and 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 so you know they would just target and, and make sure you know you were very isolated where they could just sneak in and out and there was nobody to you know call the police. And uh, they're just very sneaky about it. And um, so, so it was like. So, are you saying it was several governing body members that would come in and do this ritual? Like, how would they get to you? Like, were, were they in town giving talks in the congregation, or nobody knew that the governing body was in their town? And you know, you know, was your father, your parents? You know, they were all aware of all this uh, molestation and stuff that was going on. You know, like. The stuff yeah, that I told these rituals and stuff. I told my father even recently. I told him just I started because my uncle was in on it. Two of my uncles, one in particular, um, was the worst. And I told him, and I told him about what things my mom did. And he says, "Well, things like that happen in families." And that was just a few months ago. And that was basically the last time I ever talked to him. I mean, to say that kind of thing, that things like that happen in family, things just like that happen. I mean, I've had, you know, two cousins commit suicide because of of things that went on. I don't know what happened to them, but I saw the same kinds of things that I was going through happen to them. You know, I didn't see them in the rituals because, you know, they kept us all very isolated. Um, they like only children. They, you know, because otherwise you'll tell, um, you know, your your siblings. And so, you know, they're predators. They're the predators at the highest level. And you know, money is no object to them. They'll do whatever they have to do. And at that time, there was only the president, so it was hard. They, they didn't, you know, and I was young, 
so there weren't like you knew, you know, Stephen Lett and, 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 you know, Anthony Morris and all these different ones. Um, so it wasn't as easy to know who was who. And then also, yeah, but back said, then, but I don't mean to interrupt you, but back then, there were times where there was up to like 17 different uh, governing body members. So are you saying like mm-hmm. it was the other governing body members weren't in on it? It was just the president? Oh, no, all of them were in on it. They, and especially now, I mean, that is a, a prerequisite. The, 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 I don't know if, if you, is the most recent I've seen, I know there's more recent ones, but they own the International Bible Students Association. I don't know if you know that. Um, it's in the beginning of a lot. The governing body members come from the International Bible Students. They're a bloodline. They're a special Masonic, because the International Bible Students are, are Masonic. You can um, look at the website, internationalbiblestudents.com, and it will come up with the cross and crown. They all still believe in Russell. The Jehovah's Witnesses were simply a shill company to bring in money. They did it in starting in 1931 during the Great Depression, because a lot of Masonic lodges started doing that. It was simply just to bring in money. And so that's why 75% of them stayed and only, you know, a few stayed to, to run it until it got wherever it was self-run. So now it's kind of... And but I don't, I don't understand is, that because the, the Bible students, the international Bible students, they, I know they have a website mm-hmm. and everything. They can't yeah. stand the Watchtower. They don't get along with the Watchtower. I mean, unless they're, you know, unless it has to be something where... They're secretly still aligned, but they're, you know, there's like four or five different international Bible student splinter groups that that were formed after the break with uh, Rutherford. Um, so are you you're saying that that the Bible students and the Jehovah's Witnesses or the Watchtower Society are somehow still in cahoots? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, the Watchtower Bible and Tract Society still owns the International Bible Students Association. And it's based out of Great Britain. It's the branch in Great Britain. And they I know they have the International Bible Student House, the IBSA house in mm-hmm. in, in England, but that's yeah. not the same Bible student organization that's that has that website on the internet. That you know, they're they're a totally separate group. I mean, they're 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 not even affiliated with with anything with Watchtower. Because it for what I was told um, if the donations from both of them go to fund both of them, that's why it has in the in like the Paradise book, you know, it'll say Washington Bible Tract Society of Pennsylvania and of New York and, and International Bible Students Association, and because it's a subsidiary, and so there's a group of men who are board members and they run both religions because the Watchtower still owns the rights to Russell's books. And so they print the books for them and, and donations go to fund both. And so the anointed, the that's how they can say, Oh, well he's, he knows he's, he's chosen. Otherwise he's mentally diseased. You know, they say some anointed people are mentally diseased. That's how they know if you're a, a, you know, a, a Masonic, bloodline from an international Bible students you're really truly anointed otherwise you're just one of those ones that are mentally diseased professing to be anointed if that makes any sense Uh i'm sorry for interrupting but um there's two things i'm really wondering about is one when you um said that your mom was purposely made to get pregnant with you on a certain time and to give birth at a certain time. I'm wondering, did did they have some kind of agreement or did was she in on it? Because it sounds from what you said like your father didn't seem to be aware of what was going on. Yeah. Um, my mom was real, um, ever since she was young, um, into uh, – writing the she would write the watchtower all the time and they they took an interest in her at a very young age my mom had she was she was just really demented 
I forget the question. I, I, what did you say? I was just curious how they managed to use her to get pregnant with you at a certain time on a certain day. I don't mean at like 12 o'clock midnight or whatever, but yeah. it just almost seems like everything that I've ever read about these, these behind the back door, I call them, uh, groups, mm-hmm. everything, every detail, there's a reason and there's an agreement. Yeah. So oh, I was yeah. curious. <laughs> if she was somehow in agreement, and was she ever present during these sessions that you talked about? Some of them, she she was basically my handler, just to keep me in line and keep me shut up, constantly shut up, I'm, like a, a manipulator. I'm, and I'm, oh, I couldn't hear you with that. Um, with with being, she had. They forced her. You know how it's with 1914, they say, oh, three and a half years of distress or whatever? Yes. Um, she was in labor with me for three and a half days. They forced her to keep me inside of her for three and a half days. Oh, my Lord. And so then basically at the time, then I just came, you know, I came flying out. And, you know, she almost, probably almost died. And... I mean, you know, and she would tell me just little bits, little bits every once in a while. And then finally, you know, she came out and and told me the whole story. And then, of course, she sacrificed herself. And she never, I didn't even get to say goodbye to her. There was no funeral. Um, My father was, she eventually, she started to bleed to death at home. And uh, because the agreement they have is to not, get any medical treatment whatsoever so that you die in a very horrific, painful manner. You agree not to use pain medications. You, you agree to certain things. And she was so eaten away with, with cancer and she started to hemorrhage. And of course it needed to be bloody. So my father just laid her on the floor in the living room to bleed to death. He didn't call 911. He didn't anything. And then it, it caught it on its own, but there was a pool of blood everywhere. And then she was just kind of comatose and, and just laid there. And then they, they didn't give her water. They didn't give her anything. She just died of basically exposure, laying in a bed, you know, no IVs, no anything. It was completely painful. And uh, I only got to see her dilapidated body for, it was 10 hours before she died. And when she did die, I was at home. And I woke up, and I'm like, I think my mom just died. It was 3 o'clock, and it was the witching hour. And um, I called where, she, you know, where she, her body, you know, where she was. And, and I'm like, do you think my mom will wake up? I just kind of was like, you know, do you think she'll? And the nurse goes, no, honey, I'm sorry. She just died a minute ago. Oh, my and God. Were you grown, or were you a child when this happened? It was just uh, three, almost three years ago. Oh, honey, she I'm shunned so me. Sorry. She shunned me, and me and my daughter. She shunned me and my daughter for ten years. Oh my and, god! And and she she never even wrote a letter goodbye. Um, not anything. My father, that, and she languished, you know, in this horrible condition for two years, and so she knew she was dying, and she was giving herself to Lucifer in in this painful, disgusting manner. You know, and and she, you know, they agree not to even have blood work. Like, I mean, so if you die of an infection or whatever, it's it's like you said, you know, whatever takes you, takes you. And and no anything. You can have a bone set if you break an arm or, or you can have stitches if it's a small thing. You know, if it's like kind of skin where you're not hemorrhaging. If you hemorrhage, you have to hemorrhage to death. But if it's kind of like you cut your finger off, then, you know, if you're not going to bleed to death with it, then you can get it stitched. Otherwise, you have to leave it and you have to die. You mentioned that your mother sacrificed herself to save you, that you were supposed to die. You said something to that effect. Could you elaborate on that? Yeah, when I was, I don't, I don't even know. They were trying to make it seem that I had leukemia, but it was the effects of 
the abuse I had, there's a, there's a photo of me and my eyes are sunken in and I'm just a wreck. And people were like, what's the matter with this child? You know? And so I, the, the school made them take me in and, uh, they're like, I don't know, you know, what's going on. And then my mom's like, I think she has leukemia. And then they're like, yeah, she does have leukemia. But then there were certain doctors, doctors, are, a lot of them are Masonic. And so when this one doctor would come in, he would always say, no, no, she has leukemia. She has leukemia. But I was so sick and, you know, just so abused. I don't know exactly what happened, but they were trying to make it seem like I was sick, even though I knew I feel like this because I'm being abused. And my mom would always say, you know, you know, I saved your life back then. You know, you better love me because I saved your life. You know, you were, you were going to be dead because, you know, because of that. And it's, it made no sense to me at the time, but she made me feel so guilty, you know, just, just so, I don't know how to explain it. But, I'm so sorry that happened to you. You said that you were supposed to die. It almost said uh, to the effect, I think I heard you say, that they killed your mother and your grandmother instead. Is there something, mm-hmm. kind of time limit or something, or an agreement that you're supposed to die by a certain time when you're serving in this type of cult thing? Um, you basically agree to die the most painful death that you can when it, as soon as it happens. So, like, with my grandmother, um, she just had broken bones. And because she needed some, uh, like, just a little bit of a blood fraction to help her, she denied it. And so they manipulated it so that it looked like an actual death. But in reality, she let herself go into a diabetic coma and die that way. And so it's just like, okay, you know, I, I don't know if they get like, okay, this is it. And so you got to go. And so, you know, the hospital committee goes in there and, and they make the decision. They make the call. Okay, she's, she's, this is how we're not going to give you any IV and you're going to go in, you know, because it's, I guess they try and make them die in whatever way doesn't draw attention if that makes any sense. They manipulate whatever emergency is happening so that they don't look like they have blood on their hands, that, oh, she made the decision to do that, but it's not. You know, it's an agreement and they're forced to do it. Yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. You know, I I, I thought that it was really strange, and I think Rick has felt this way too, and a lot of us do. The way the hospital liaison committee works the way that they all just separate and keep everybody separated, it, it's there's something creepy about it, but I don't think anybody's ever really been able to put their finger on it other than uh, fanatical religiously. So are you mm-hmm. saying that this basically has something to do with this bloodletting thing and, you know, ritual yeah. sacrifice? Yeah, you know, they they make the call, oh, this this is bad enough, this will be this will be good enough, this will be bloody enough, and they'll, it depends on if that person has, has made that, I guess, deal with the devil, if it's a regular person, or if it's, you know, it's a, you know, and whether the governing body member has had their ritual sacrifice for that year, because they're required once a year to, to sacrifice a person, Oh, that's what I wanted to ask you too. Are you? Did, I'm so sorry for interrupting, but there's so many things that you said. Are you? Did you say, or did I hear you correctly, that each of the governing body members basically has a pact or an agreement with this demonic type of thing, and that they have to actually sacrifice in some way or allow someone to be sacrificed in some way once a year? Yeah, yeah. That's the mas. That's the masonic. Uh, um, yeah, that's the agreement that they make. So does that in? I'm assuming that is something to do with, has something to do with the children that are allowed to be not only abused, but molested and and beaten and neglected and whatever, or no? Yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. I mean, it's, you know, especially, I mean, 
I don't want to get in trouble for, you know, you know, I, I know they have lots of money and I, don't, I hate it when, you know, I don't want them to come and sue me for slander or some kind of thing. But I mean, the way that Stephen let when he did that, uh, that, um, what do you call it? When he was saying, like, we're permissive to pedophiles. And yeah, the way he I licked, saw that. The way he licked his lips, that's I, a complete tell. Yeah. That was that was when he said apostate-driven lives, like we somehow protect pedophiles. Yeah. The way he said it, I had to rewind mm-hmm. it and play it over and over, and I'm thinking, this man's not just creepy, he's evil. And it's like we know what they're doing. And here mm-hmm. you are, basically, we're on the front lines of seeing the real blood and the real ugly and the real dirty. And so many of us lived in this fantasy world. And unfortunately, so many of us who have come out of the cult are still carrying around that fantasy bubble, thinking, oh, you know, they're just this misled or, or they're just a bunch of liars. But we don't realize, thought of us as a group, how truly evil and not just evil the epitome of evil because remember it's always the ones who are smiling the sweetest and licking the most honey and dripping the most honey who are the most evil definitely and one of the reasons why they don't let us celebrate birthdays i've realized is that a lot of people are manipulated they they have similar birthdays three people that were married to my father's family had the exact same birthday, you know, and it, and it's a certain, like a special birthday. And it's, they, they, there's a watchtower printed on that day that is very much full of deception more than any of the other ones. And, and, really? you know, my mother included. Yeah. And, uh, and so, like the the York the Knights Templar, they're the ones who cut off John the Baptist's head. They apparently they had his head in their possession for a long, long time until it yeah, was confiscated. That. Yeah. And you know, I, and I, the. I'm sorry. Please continue. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, like the Knights Templar were burned at the torture stake. That's where the whole Jesus torture stake thing came from, you know, on Friday the 13th, October um, the 13th, 1307. 1307 plus 607 is 1914. So it's all based on the Knights Templar and pyramidology. It has nothing to do with the Bible, you know, and, and all these, you know, different things. It It all has to do with masonry. And if people, you know, just did a little research, they would see all the beliefs are based on denouncing Christ. Oh, absolutely. And, uh, totally. totally. You know, I met an old, old um, JW lady about maybe 40 years ago who told me that when she was young, all of the Jehovah's Witnesses all celebrated each other's birthdays. And she said, in fact, we used to use the empty pages in the back of our Bible to, you know, at the Kingdom Hall there. Oh, let me, what's your birthday? Let me write it down. So they Mm -hmm. said that the reason why they, this is what they told the rank and file, she told me. She said the reason why they stopped birthdays is because they were calling it creature worship. It was idolatry. Mm -hmm. And she said, but I think what it really is, is they were everybody was spending too much time having fun celebrating each other's birthdays instead of going out and preaching, you know, working for the Watchtower, in other words. Yep. So now you've really given some clarity on that. And I, I just applaud you, Veronica. And, and I think uh, Rick brought it out, too. And I know this is true as well, that there are others who have had similar stories. But um, you are only the second one that I personally heard tell this story of this particular type of situation that nobody will talk about. Wow. I just, I thank you. And I, and I hope you're safe. And I wanted to ask you, did you have any brothers or sisters? Somehow I picture you growing up an only child. Yep. <laughs> Definitely. I was an only child. Very, very um, isolated so that I couldn't get help from anyone. Even though I had other family, I was isolated from them. I don't know, it, we Rick talked about it before, but um, about the Smurf story? Yeah. That Yeah, that originated from me, unfortunately. Um, that was a gift. Fred Franz gave it to my aunt to, to send to me. And uh, my mom 
got uh, instructions that you know Smurfs are evil and 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 I don't know what the reason was whether it was supposed to just create um, anarchy and, and and fear or whatever, but they wanted me to make something happen to it to manipulate it so that they would you know freak everybody out and it would walk down the the aisle of the kingdom hall and um people were all freaked out about this about the smurf and then of course the story went around and then um he wanted me to do it with the cabbage patches as well so wait, 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 please back up are you saying first of all that the the crazy smurf stories began with you one yeah and second of all, are you saying that Freddie Franz asked you or wanted you to make your Smurf do something like walk down the Kingdom Hall and you were actually able to make the Smurf do something? Is that yeah. Well, I was in such a trance. Okay. I don't know if it actually happened because I would be in this kind of delirium and my mom was like, oh my goodness, she made it da 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 So she would manipulate certain circumstances and I'm like, really? I did, and then she spread it to all the people that she knew. And well, you know, it must have been true because, it, you know, the I mean, everybody, there is not an XJW that I haven't talked to that hasn't heard of it from someone. Mm-hmm. And then they made me uh, do a ritual and burn it where I don't know if it, they wanted it to release it or it was just a certain that's what they wanted to do. You know, a lot of things they made us do or me do didn't make sense. You know, just like they say, whether it makes sense or not, just go do it, you know, because the channel wants you to do it. So, you know, I did it. And then there were six cabbage patches to choose from. Of course, six is a special number. And I chose one. And uh, they wanted me to do the exact same thing, to have it possessed. And I'm like, this is the first good doll I've ever gotten. And I'm like, I'll be damned if you're going to make me do this because this is ridiculous. I wanted it. And so finally, that was the one time my mom stood up for me. And they actually, I don't know if the washer went out for print. I've been trying to find it. But they put a, a, a replica of my exact doll on the cover of one of the magazines. It was the back of the head oh, you're of it. I don't know if it, you know, but they, they put it and they said, fine. Cause my mom's like, everybody's looking at her. Cause they were waiting for it to walk down the aisle. You know, it's like, Oh great. She's got another toy. It, you know, something weird is going to happen. And so everybody was freaked out about, about it. And so my mom's like, you need to make this right. And she was, you know, calling and writing. So and then they, they said, they sent her like a copy of it and they said, here, this is what we're going to put on the cover. Are you happy now? Wow. And so, you know, so that they wouldn't make an issue. But I've been trying to find the cover. It's got to be sometime around 84 to 86 about, hmm. or 83 to, I don't know. But well, that's a time have frame access. at least to look in. Yeah. Wow. Um, I'm just wondering, I was, I'm wondering if your mom got some kind of compensation. It seems like she really not only allowed terrific abuse emotionally and, and physically and mentally, but it seemed like part of her wanted to kind of brush it off like it was no big deal. Yeah, they like we were sent to um, the International Convention in London. Um, and, you know, we were treated like kings and queens. I actually got to sign the Queen of England's guest book, you know, so we had certain perks, you know, and, of course, that, you know, was in 78. And... Um, so kind of after 75, a couple of years before they even, you know, had that offhanded apology. And, um, you know, so, of course, everybody was in an uproar during that time. And, uh, you know, you know, I don't remember a lot. I remember that it, there, it, a lot of my memories then are just blank. Um, things have slowed now that I'm, I'm, dealing with it and thinking about it all of a sudden I'm, I'll be walking you know just in my house and all of a sudden a memory will just take me back and it's like I'm there again and it just becomes completely clear my mind just 
I remember it all of a sudden. I mean, it's, I can smell it, taste it, feel it, and it just comes right back to me. So that I haven't remembered a lot about that other than Fran screaming. There was a lot of screaming of during the rituals of you don't believe Jesus is king, you don't believe Jesus is king, um, you know, just completely satanic chanting the opposite of what the Bible says. Like you're not supposed to believe Jesus is king? Yeah. And like, they even say that Satan's the ruler of the world. And and they tell every if 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 JW's realized if if we say so, you know, where is hell? They'll say, Oh, it's the common grave. And then you say, Well, where are you going after you die? Oh, well, the common grave. Oh, so you're going to hell. Well, yeah, but until a certain time in the future, you know, but basically it's like they're going to hell, the majority of them. So it's like if they just think about what they say, and that's what I've been trying to get people, I, I just want people to, every Jehovah's Witness to, start, to really think about what they're being taught, the origins of all the doctrine, you know, the the memorial is a Masonic black mass. You know, we're denying Christ as those things are being passed. I always you thought know. it was the most satanic ritual, a laughing slap in the face to what Christ did. I'm so thanking you right now for saying yeah. thank you. I mean, it's on a full moon, you know, and everybody. Oh, and there are, I think it's in the Faith in Action video, but there are pictures of Russell baptizing people. I'm from a five-generation Jehovah's Witness family, so... You know, I've had stories be told to me. I even met my great-great-grandmother. So everybody kind of married really young, so people were alive even during my time. Um, but there's a picture of Russell, and everyone's dressed in black during this baptism. And it's a completely satanic baptism. You know, if you look up satanic ba- baptisms, everybody dresses in black, black robes, and And they'll just flash up these pictures, you know, and it makes us feel normal or it makes it makes it look like it's normal. Oh, it's a baptism. But no, it's a satanic baptism. They're doing it right in front of us. Yeah. Like you said, in plain sight. My God, anything that comes into your head. I mean, you're really a wealth of information. I just am so (laughs) thankful to you that you just keep talking, you know, like like portals and like. You know the the worrying about the children and the the you know oh my God spirit directed organization oh my God it gives it a whole new meaning yeah it's you know we're the spirit directed channel of communication yeah the channel of communication yeah people only knew where that came from you know what they do mm-hmm. they all sit at a round table. And from when I knew what I, you know, that there's a pentagram underneath the table. And then they sit and, you know, do their thing. Excuse me? Could I ask a question? Sure. Um, You've been out for quite a while, right? Yeah, a Um, couple of years. Are you in fear of your life? Yes. Yeah, that's why I don't want to tell people who I am. So you're in hiding then? I try to be. I want to live a normal life for for my, you know, child. But, yeah, every day. Yeah, I I can understand that. I can understand that. You've seen a lot, heard a lot. And, you know, it's very difficult. And I am sorry about your your experiences. I'm one of the people in the suite. Um, okay. We're very concerned about you. We care about you. you. And If you don't uh, hear from me, please tell people it's the Watchtower. Just like Michael absolutely. Jackson, just like Prince. They absolutely. were murdered, and I don't want to be one of them. Right, right. Well, you take care of yourself. Thank you, sweetie. Okay. I appreciate it. Yeah, bye-bye, honey. Bye. Well, my goodness, uh, Veronica, lots of people want to come on and talk to you. It's amazing. Uh, you getting kind of tired? Can you hang in a little bit longer? Yeah, it feels so good to get this off my chest. I mean, it just feels so good to just let people know, just, you know, 
I just need people to know what's going on. I don't want anybody else to be a victim. Not one more kid, not one more person. I don't want them to die a, a Luciferian death. Not one more. Well, good for you, Veronica, because I'll tell you something. See, that shows you're a genuine person. If, if you came on here, you'd probably on for 40 minutes and, you know, joking to us and whatever. This is no joke. You, you've been no. really really terrorized by this organization, more than the average Jehovah's Witness would ever even think. The average Jehovah's Witness has a hard time even wrapping the head around all of this. But I always knew that there was an order, like you say, uh, an order of witnesses that go beyond the rank and file witness that we know in the Kingdom Hall. And, uh, boy, you know, it's really amazing that you were involved with this, and now you can talk about it. And I'm sure that people are hearing some of this for the very first time. There's a, there's a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses that are leaving the organization right now. And they listen in here. This is where active doubting and former Jehovah's Witnesses come to talk. So we have a lot of people listening in. They, they won't talk. And these are active witnesses, and they're going, wow, I'm sure. This is just totally amazing. And then, and then as you speak, many of us begin to connect dots. We can kind of see some of the strange things. Now, I mean, what connected here, I'm going to say, because I'm at the control panel, I can see what you know, excites people, what people talk about. Uh, it, it seems when you spoke about the memorial there uh, 10, 15 minutes ago, that, that seemed to hit a, a soft spot with many. Uh, I, I see that uh, what, it, what it did is that a lot of people can connect with that. They, they go to the memorial service. They, they, they know it's a full moon. You know, whether this is all coincidental or not, but we know Satan loves a full moon as well. And then at the same time, we have a, an organization that uh, passes the wine and bread right by. That's exactly what Satanists do. And the Watchtower does the same thing. They, they don't partake of it. So a lot of people connected with that thought. So, uh, you know, there's certain little points here that you speak about that people go, whoa. And when you're talking about the situation with your mother and that sacrificial death, and you were talking about the, the more bloody the better, I know that sounds gross, and, and I'm certainly sad for you that your mother had to die like that. But, uh, boy, I'll tell you, that is exactly how Satan, I'm sure, would want people to have to leave in a, in a moment of high-level distress and, you know, disorder and bloodiness. That, that's, that's, the way the, that's the way Satan works. So people connect with that as well. Yeah. What? Yeah, there's a picture of, of a big memorial. I think it was the 2014 memorial where they had it at a big auditorium. And you can see the full moon. the 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 thing was open. the The roof was open, and you can see the full moon shining in on the 2014. You know. Well, you know, you, uh, you, 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 you know, it's interesting as you spoke tonight, and people are listening. We we all can reminisce. Most of the people listening in are former Jehovah's Witnesses. But, you know, when we all look back, I've been on the organization now for about 12 years, but when I look back, I, I can see some of these things as being very occult. Uh, when I was in, I couldn't. You couldn't see the forest through the trees, so to speak. But do, why, why do we always walk around in such a nerved up condition? And, and why, why do we never really feel love? Or why do we never really feel even godliness? That, that's something that I never really felt being a Jehovah's Witness. I never felt this real... Uh, closeness to Jehovah, you know, you had to kind of, okay. you had to always be, you know, working on that. You know, when you're a real Christian, you're close to God in a, in a sense that uh, the Watchtower has no clue about, but you're always working to draw closer to Jehovah. You never really were a spiritually minded person, even though they tried to make you think you were. You were deep in a cult that was satanic and was involved in the occult and you had no idea. But now that I'm out, I can see it as clear as could be. And also, you, you mentioned things like, you know, the witnesses don't see this, but if they would just examine the history, if, if, you, if they would just examine the history of the Watchtower, they would see how deeply rooted they are into the occult. Well, let's see, we got the lines are still open. If you wanted to say hello to Veronica, she's going to stay on with us for a while longer. I'm sure you have many questions. 
So go ahead. Say hello to Veronica. She's here. She's ready. Good evening, <clears throat> Veronica. This is uh, Dick Boogie again. I hope I'm not hogging all your time, but I just want to let you know that um, I know you've been through a lot. I mean, I know you've been through so, so much, and you're probably a little paranoid or even scared of what the Watchtower can do because, you know, they're a very rich organization. And But Satan controls it, and our Heavenly Father would never let them kill you the same way they, they wouldn't let our Heavenly Father would let Satan uh, <clears throat> kill Job when, when he was going through his trials. Um, you're just a very brave and intelligent woman. Just so glad you're sh sharing your evening with us. Thank you so much. Thank you. Makes me feel better. Oh, yeah, just one other thought on that, if, if I could. Um, talking about stuff like this is going to make you feel better, and it's going to help a lot of people out there. Uh, I know I, I went through... Um, a lot of stuff in Vietnam years ago, and I go to vet groups and I talk about it, and I always feel better. And I got to tell you, talking about the watchtower on the six screens makes me feel absolutely fabulous, and it just reinforces the fact that Satan controls this organization, and as long as he does, and anybody associated with it. It's going to have a very difficult life. Uh, thank you again for coming on. No problem. It's my pleasure. You guys are helping me as much as I can help you. I guarantee it. Yeah, it's quite oh. cathartic. I'm sorry, Rick. It's just quite oh. cathartic to talk about it. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for those words, Dick. Sure thank you for the words for... Uh, for Ron and Veronica, that, that, that helps. She, she's a brave woman. She's a darn brave woman. And she, she knew that, you know, she's going to come on with something very controversial. Uh, there's no reason for us to say, hey, this woman's crazy. No. You, you have to walk a mile in a person's shoes. And I, I just wouldn't put anything past the Watchtower organization, friends. I really, really wouldn't. And if you're a former Jehovah's Witness, you shouldn't either. This organization is evil, destructive, and very damaging to people. And we have a woman on here tonight that has been really hurt. She's been really hurt, but she's on tonight telling her story. In fact, she's saying some things tonight that nobody's ever even heard, even your husband. Right, Veronica? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I've been too humiliated, you know, and I didn't want people to think I was evil. You know, when you talk about um, devil worship and things, you know, people are going to think, oh, are you devil worshiper, you know, and that you're tainted in some way. And there's a huge price you pay for telling people about, or even sexual abuse, you know, your spouse may think, oh, well, you, you know, you've had, you know, it's tainted and gross, you know, I mean, there's a huge penalty to pay for being brutally honest. Well, you know, something brutally honest is the way to go, and you are brutally honest. And you, 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 because this is something, this is what I often think of too. Uh, if a person was going to come on here and make a story up like you did here tonight, I mean, they wouldn't do that because they know they would be deliberately ridiculed. So, oh, yeah. you know, you didn't do that. You, you came on and you say, look, I'm going to put my story out there and I want people to hear it. And it will be in the archives too, where people from, for years from now will be able to get in and listen to this stuff and say, wow, I, I, I never knew that existed. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to wake up a lot of people. A lot of people are going to shake their head and say, geez, you know, something I never really thought of it like that. But, boy, the more I think about all of this, uh, it's certainly not far-fetched. But we got to Veronica here for a few more minutes. Hi, Veronica. Like, uh, go ahead, yeah. Mm -hmm. Did anyone from your hall ever try to help you or stay close to you and give you any type of support in any of this? You're going to make me cry. <laughs> um, uh, there, you know, most of my um, bruises and stuff were, you know, under my, you know, clothing. My mom would dress me up in really high clothes, you know, really high necked clothing and long sleeve shirts, or long sleeve dresses and long, long skirts. And um, I remember one time, I got a an ink mark on my on my arm 
and I tried, I put spit on it, you know, to try and, you know, get it off of my arm, and I realized that it, it started to look like a bruise, and I was like, it just came to my, my thought that maybe if somebody saw that, that somebody would say, are you okay, you know, because I was rail thin, and, you know, I had sunken eyes, and I had all these crazy, you know, ticks and things that, that, you know, thank goodness I don't have anymore, but um, one sister, she pulled out my arm, and she goes, what happened to you? And I looked at her, and I said, mom, I said, mama beats me, and, and she looked at me in horror, and um, I turn around, and there's my mom right behind me, and, uh, and then I saw, and I knew I was going to, you know, pay, you know, have a hell to pay for that. And I said, no, no, I'm sorry. I'm just kidding. And, uh, I tried a lot, you know, to tell my teachers about what was happening, but because of, you know, the terror that, you know, Jehovah's Witnesses in school, you know, the school brochure, I just caused more trouble to my teachers. And so they, they felt animosity towards me, not, not pity because it was such a trouble, you know. Mm-hmm. And uh so yeah, I tried to get help, but um her husband was one of the ones that was in on everything. And so I don't know if she was completely in on what was going on, but um yeah, there most of the people I was my family's very incestuous. And uh, so most of the people in our in our tiny hall of like 22 were were in on the abuse. So there wasn't anybody to get help from. Did did you ever in order to get out? How did you feel spiritually? Did you pray to Jehovah? Did you? How did you feel about that? How did that affect your belief in Jehovah Himself in the Bible? So I never. I just thought that God was uh, Lucifer. And mm-hmm. so I knew he wasn't going to help. And, you know, in the watchtowers, they say that angels don't help you. You know, it's like they don't help people for things like that. So I never thought, to, I just knew that, that you know, fear Jehovah, you know, God of armies, you know, he doesn't help. He hurts people. He wants to kill people in Armageddon. You know, he he's not going to save people, you know, unless you act right. And if you're a good person, which means obey, you know, they always say, you know, obey parents, you know, obey your parents, obey, obey, obey. So unless you obey, you know, you're going to die in Armageddon. And that's what they they drill into our heads is to obey, you know, Mm -hmm. as children. That's the first scripture is to obey your parents, honor thy father and thy mother. And if you don't, you know, you're going to die. You know, and in in the in the Bible story book, you see little kids being killed, you know, and and right. falling from skyscrapers, and, and it's like I knew from a very young age, you know, with the leukemia thing, that um, I could bleed to death at any moment. I knew my parents would kill me, you know, or let me die if it, if mm-hmm. a car accident happened. So the fear of knowing. And seeing how those animals died, to be like, that will be me. I'll mm-hmm. be laying there next time that, you know, I forget what the question was, but. No, no, you, you, know. no, you, no, you, no, you answered it. You did. And this next okay. question, this next question won't mean anything to anybody, but you, if you, it's just yes or no. Do you know who Bryce Taylor is? No. Oh, uh, uh, MK Ultra victim. She's got oh, some book, the books woman. Out. Yes, I yes. do. Okay. Yes, I okay. do. Yeah. Sorry about I'm, that. I was thinking of no, Bryce no, no. Harper. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Bryce Taylor, yes, yeah. I do. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Like I said, people need to research MK Ultra, Otherwise, it's very hard for them to understand what you're saying. I completely understand what you're saying. And they follow the pattern. What you've been this evening and what you've gone through follows the pattern to a T of their being involved with them yeah and i really understand 
Thank you. Uh, could I ask you another question? I've heard this before. It was never clarified. Something you just re- said, Jehovah's name is Satan. I've briefly heard that before, but I never researched that. Or Jehovah means Lucifer. Yeah. Okay. It, okay. It, like if you, if you even see it, you know, J-E-H-O-V-A-H, you know, L-U-C, you know, it's vowel consonant, vowel consonant. It even looks the same. It's got the same number of letters. Um, it's, that's just the Masonic, that's what mm-hmm. Masons believe Jehovah is. It's just a code word, you know, and it's mm-hmm. got to be repeated over. Like during, say, um, you know, back in the 80s when they would say, oh, if, if, if you're having any demon problems, just say Jehovah three times. Mm-hmm. Well, that's, in, that's like saying Bloody Mary three times in the mirror. You know, that's invoking him more. And so mm-hmm. they would encourage it more. So, so then, does is there an actual name then for Jehovah, or for I'm sorry, for God, for God rather? Would it no, be Yahweh? Um, I, or? No, that that's still the same thing. Um, okay. I call you know I was in speaking with a lot of, of just generically to some Jews, they've never said the Tetragrammaton. It's just the Tetragrammaton just means four letters, um, mm-hmm. and it was just never said out of respect and fear. So I've Mm -hmm. never been told what God's name is. God never came into it because God was Lucifer. That's the only Mm -hmm. one they ever followed. So when the society claims uh, it's also Yahweh. No, yeah, that's that's just, that's just a lie. That's Mm -hmm. just made up. Mm -hmm. It's just for a good backstory. Uh Uh-huh. Okay. To try and prove it. Yes. No problem. Anything else? Uh, no, but, uh, like I say, what you've explained is, um, uh, everything that I've ever studied or researched about MK Ultra. Wow. The mirrors, the breaking of the mirrors, hidden in plain sight, all the symbolism, all the rituals, and people have to understand too what you went through. Pedophilia absolutely positively parallels a satanic worship. Yep. Yeah, and it happens way too often, way too often, every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, all of this nonsense in the congregations that other people are going through, oh, we need two witnesses, uh, it's just a facade to carry out their satanic worship. Yeah, and we need to, uh, everybody needs to realize that there are elders in the congregations that are in on it and so when you get a brick wall you know of of an elder that you know they sit there and they're like well, we just need to know if do you believe the faith you know they're the faith on just the they're usually masons you know mm-hmm. look at the rings on their fingers do they have a mm-hmm. certain big stoned ring on their right hand do they you know and how is their reaction? Because a normal person would react one one way would be horrifying. Right. And so don't waste your time on those certain hard-nosed elders, you know, because they're in on it. And, and you know, they're strategically in place. Don't, don't uh, go to a circuit overseer because they're in on it. The one who would drug me, he became a circuit overseer. So never trust them. You have to just try and help the, the the lower downs, and and leave all the uppers, you know, because mm-hmm. usually they're going to be in on it. Did your parents at any point believe in God, or did they start out not no, believing? They, or what was their? They were. There's just they would repeat Jehovah over and over and over again, and it was just an angry cruel cruel god no no condition no unconditional love whatsoever um just full of shunning shunning is loving my dad screams at me shunning is loving it's like Mm -hmm. what are you talking about you know and so you know he believes you know you force because we're adult children you know they Mm -hmm. we're treated like adults when we're little you know, you made that decision as a child to be baptized. That's your decision. But mm-hmm. then when you become an adult, it's like, no, you need to conform to my rules. Even though you're an adult, I'm not going to speak to you unless you go to the meetings. You know, mm-hmm. so then we're treated like a child. 
Right. And, you know, well, so... They, the society mimics that uh, pattern of MK Ultra, where a child or even in the congregation, an individual or the congregation as a whole, one minute you have that long, warm, loving kindness, and then the next minute you're treated very coldly. And it goes back and forth to this bipolar type situation, which is part of mind control. Yeah. Yeah, you start to pet that dog. And then he bites you. And it's like, mm-hmm. oh, you know, I thought you were nice. I've mm-hmm. had elders come up and ask, oh, how are you doing? And then it's like, fine. And then they'll say a snide comment right after. Right. And it's right. like, goodness, you know, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed. It's like they can't help it or they're doing it on purpose. I know, truly I, believe I'm not they're, sure. <clears throat> I truly believe they're doing it on purpose. And I think when they have their elder school and their ministerial training schools and they take a select few that you say are, you know, that you've mentioned are chosen and that mm-hmm. type of, um, you know, like with a handler, like an MKL uh-huh. for handler or something like that, there is that extreme uh, caring and then they're very strong abuse and it goes back and forth and they very, to a more, much more subtle degree, practice that technique constantly on the congregations, on the circuits, on the, in the organization. Yeah. A lot of them, they don't have kids. Mm-hmm. And and I think that has to do with, like, they just don't have that nurturing type of, you know, DNA that they just can just be biting and, and cool. Mm-hmm. Right. So, thanks yeah, thank for all you. the kind words and everything. I appreciate it. No, I appreciate it. Uh, actually, some of the things that you have said tonight uh, has confirmed um, all of my research over the past few years. I've done a lot of intense research on uh, Operation Paperclip that you mentioned earlier, MK Ultra, mm-hmm. and all of yeah. that. So what you have said definitely confirms what my speculations were going on in the organization. Um, something you had mentioned earlier, too, that you talked about, they meet once a year for their child sacrifices. Is that something that oh. they do? Oh. They, the have to, they don't necessarily meet once once a year. They, they have to um, make sure that they have a sacrifice once a year. So it can happen at any point as long as it happens within a year like they're required mm-hmm. once a year do they have a specific location that they go to or where no, this would be held up not that i know of usually it's just on the temporary you know operating room table or or in a home where you know wherever it, you know the opportunity strikes mm-hmm. and you know the committee is just you know acting for, you know, in representing the governing body. Mm-hmm. And out of them. all, out of all that we, we know, out of all, all these pedophilia cases and everything, what is the blocking factor for the police not being called or intervening in a major way into this nonsense? A lot of police officers I've noticed are Masons mm-hmm. and uh, under penalty of death, you can't, go against another mason even Mm -hmm. during war like when you have your hands up that Mm -hmm. is a sign you know of of a fellow mason and you're not supposed to kill them even if they're on the opposite side even in a court of law they stand a certain way with Mm -hmm. their feet to let the judge know and so it's just an internal thing that you can't you can't win against you just can't Mm -hmm. Um, right. And I know the on the 10th of this month, I think uh, hearings start in, the, in Australia for the pedophilia mm-hmm. with the Royal Commission. And then on the 20th, the actual uh, court proceedings start. Yeah, I hope that something good happens with that. I'm worried about it. I'm really, really worried about it. Mm-hmm. I think it'll have more... It'll just oh the best thing that'll happen is that it's opening a lot of people's eyes. Yes. I don't know if anything good will happen because 
you know, there'll be some loophole that they'll pull or they'll change it for a little bit and then they'll just change it right back. Or mm-hmm. it'll be an, an unspoken rule because there's all kinds of unspoken rules that's like, well, wink, wink, mm-hmm. you know, because it's, it's all under, you right. know, the elders. Right. Yeah. I, do you, uh, have you joined any other organization or religion at this point or have you just walked no. away from everything? Yeah, mm-hmm. I walked away from everything because I can, I can yeah. see the, the Masonic ties and everything now. Yes. And, and I just kind of, there's, there's no organization out there mm-hmm. that, you know, can offer anything pure. Right. Sure. No, I, yeah, no, I understand. That's pretty much what I've seen myself. It's, there's yeah. nothing out there. Yeah. It's basically what the tarot card of destruction, the, what, the tower card pretty yes. much says that somebody will, you know, it, it brings you to know that, the lies that that you've been told and and when it hits you it it can either break you or it can make you you know be a better person but it's going to be painful it's going to be awful and hopefully you'll live through it Mm -hmm. do you believe in the tarot cards um i believe that they manipulate things to make it painful, to make it seem real, you know, because a- anybody can make those things, you who's, know. Who's they? Who's they? They any, manipulate any, the, card, the cards or the tarot reader? The tarot reader. Like, you can, I, I could see how when, when a certain thing would, would come about, and I would see it one way, but then, you know, Franz would, would interpret it a completely different way because he wanted it to be that way. And, you know, you just, like how it says in the Bible, you know, earthquakes and, and food shortages are the sign of the times. Well, you know, that's a natural occurrence. Or you can see things and, and read into it deeper than, than, you know, it was just a bad crop that year. Of course, that's what naturally happens. So a lot of people look deeper into things that really don't have that big of a significance, but they they have such deep faith that they'll make it true. You know, they'll just put that square, that round peg in a square hole. I was talking about you. I was talking about you though. Do you you believe in in that the tarot cards give give true prophecy or Um, meaning? You you in particular. um, I'm in such denial right now. I don't even know if what's up or down right now. My my head is spinning. I've I've gone through so so much that if I if I put my faith in in it, it's so terrifying because of what I've seen that if if I take it as it's all true, I'll just be in my closet forever, just being hidden because it, it's too terrifying to even think about, honestly. Okay, and. Well, are, are you saying that you saw Fred Franz like he re- he used to read the tarot cards, and, mm-hmm. and you were there when he was doing it? Yes. Yeah. Okay. He would. Okay. Yeah. The you know the automatic writing he would you know. Usually, um, the one brother that was there, he would do it the majority of the time. It was only special occasions. It wasn't all the time that he would you know that Franz would be there. It would, you know, maybe um, three times a year, but then there'd be other people there, and that would that would do the, you know, on a regular basis. Now, Satan is Lucifer's son. Now, how do you know this? Just from what they told me, from um, the the men at the Watchtower, Franz and and um, Henschel, and that's the way they explained it to me. Okay. Now, um, anyway, I just wanted to get, I want right. Okay. Yeah. No, I, yeah, I understand that, 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 that old religion, that, that stuff. But what I'm, I kind of want to, I want to get in on this, this, uh, idea that, that, um, so now, now it, actually what you're saying then is that the governing body believed that, uh, that, Jehovah is actually Lucifer, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Okay. 
Well, my goodness, there you go, uh, Veronica. Plenty of people out there wanting to ask you questions and very concerned. People listening in from pretty much all over the place. I, I know you've helped a lot of people tonight. There's no question in my mind that uh, you have helped a lot of people. A lot of people are sorting things out. They're going to think about it. They're going to, you know, give it some thought, and they're going to say, wow, what that young lady was talking about is now connecting. You must be getting tired. Yeah. I did want to clarify one thing, that what yeah. I was just telling that that gentleman, that was the views that I was taught by the by Fred Brand, how I was explained it, that it, the Bible is just a masonry plot. So, and I can see how it was because I can see how they, so I don't want him to think like I just kind of pulled that out of thin air, that it was just my personal opinion. That's what they told me. Well, very good. No, that's good. So that's good clarification. But uh, Veronica, you're a fine woman. You, uh, you, you, you uh, you're quite the trooper, really. You get a lot of courage to come on and share your thoughts with us tonight on Watchtower and the Occult Connection. Now, I'm going to put this into the archives by Tuesday or Wednesday next week. It'll be up there. I will send you a link, okay? I'll send you a link in the email so you'll be able to listen to it, okay? I have a quick, okay. quick question for her. Oh, go ahead, Larry. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now you were saying about the sacrifice. I didn't. I I heard maybe the last uh, thirty minutes, but you're saying that the governing body does a sacrifice every year. Each of the governing bodies. So there's there's seven right now. So there's seven sacrifices that go on each year, or just one. Uh, seven. Per, huh? Each seven. Each one has to have okay. its own. And, and and what is is the sacrifice actually somebody taking a life or is it? I think it's you mentioned through the blood, the through the blood issue. They that's just a, an ex, excuse the way that they can get people to easily give their life so that they don't get caught. So yeah. how how now? Okay, I, I understand. There's a lot of people that die. Uh, a lot of Jehovah's Witnesses die every year from blood. Um, blood issue, but how does the governing body take credit individually for for that for for their sacrifice? Um, because it's their rules, I guess. Basically, I mean, it's they're 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 the guardians of the doctrine, you know, G O D, you know, the so, like, the. so it's not like they initiate a specific person to die. So basically, if there's if there's at least seven people die from a lack of blood, then they're all covered. Yeah, I don't. I'm not exactly sure if. I mean, they could very well possibly take lives. I mean, that's not. I wouldn't say that they wouldn't. I just don't know personally yeah. that they've. But but they have manipulated like my mother and my grandmother to make vows. So there are people who do make vows for it and they willingly give themselves up and they know what they're doing. Right. right. You know, so, so there are, and those may be the ones they take credit for, you know, but I do know that the other ones are maybe just icing on the cake or, or ones that um, help with the rituals because the more bloodletting, the better. So if they want something to happen, you know, you know whatever it is that that they want it it just helps it gives them power you know the more blood that's spilled it gives them and it and it and it it helps with with us being so fearful of them you know it helps with the trauma based mind control that you know it feeds almost into our persecution complex as well that it's like oh you know look we're so right people are dying and willing to die and so then everybody kind of gets hyped up on you know we need to buy our armageddon bags and we need to do this because look you know all these bad things are happening to us it's just uh does that make sense yeah thank you mm-hmm. well thank you larry and uh, wow you've been on for just about three hours now uh oh, goodness. <laughs> Veronica, you're doing you're doing a great job. But listen, why don't you relax, kick back, and uh, just uh, 
let, let, let yourself know that we all appreciate you coming on here tonight and doing what you did. That was really great. You, you, we're going to put this into the archives. There's going to be a great listen in there. A lot of people are going to be helped by your program here tonight. Thank you, Veronica. Any thank last you. word you'd like to have before we cut you loose? Um, just thanks for the support. And I hope I didn't offend anybody by anything I said. You know, I was just trying to tell, you know, my story. You know, from the, no nobody's been, or anything. Nobody's been offended at all. You've enlightened us all. You you really came on tonight and you enlightened us all and we appreciate it. I'll be in touch with you this week. Thank you, Veronica. Okay. Thank you well, so much, Rick. Well, there you go. I mean, she is very legitimate. She hasn't recanted. She's straightforward. She hasn't changed anything. Uh, I'll tell you what. I'm going to have to get in there and listen to this call when it gets up there, and I'm just going to dissect it like I did with Raven. Uh, I'm going to say that there's a there's an occult order in the Jehovah's Witness, whether you want to believe it or not. I, I'm going to believe there's an order that exists that uh, most of the rank-and-file witnesses, including myself, never knew existed when I was a witness. You want to hear exactly what Raven Giuliani wants to talk to us about her experiences in the Watchtower with this SRA. Now, bring us up to speed, Raven. Wh where do you live? I'm in central Virginia now. And you contacted us concerning this, and you say that you were somehow, some way, ritually abused by the Watchtower. Is that correct? Yes, it is. Uh, why don't you do this? I'm going to just, this is a no time zone, okay? There's no commercials. There's nothing to worry about. Nothing's going to get in the way here. I've already told people that did not want to listen to this, they can, they can exit. It appears as though a lot didn't. They're still on with us. They're calling in from all over. They want to hear your story. It's been all over the net. So what we'll do, Raven, is I'm going to just let you talk. There'll be no interruptions here for a while. Bring us back to when this all started, okay? Um, well, I'm, uh, I was a third-generation Jehovah's Witness. Grandmother was the original one in my family that was one of Jehovah's Witnesses, and she was baptized back in 1940 when my father was only four years old. He was not raised as a witness because his father was Catholic and he refused to have it. So any contact that he had with the witnesses as a child was done in a secretive way. They they ran a, a little uh, farm stand in southern New Jersey and they would get vegetables and eggs and such from witnesses that would line the baskets of fruit and vegetables with watchtowers, and that's how my grandmother got her spiritual food for the next 20 years. My father joined the Air Force in the 50s, and while he was stationed out in Southern California at March Field, uh, he was contacted out in service by a little boy, and he recognized the Watchtower magazines as being the ones that were lining the baskets of his childhood. So he accepted them, and he accepted a Bible study right away. He and my mother were both baptized within a year, and he left the Air Force. And I was born in 1962. Um, my father had some strange involvements, and I don't exactly know how he got involved with with what he did at the time, because I was just a, a child, I was an infant, but for me, it pretty much started off right away. One of the oldest stories that my parents tell is about how my mother woke up one evening when I was a baby in the crib. Uh, because she heard a, a sound. She heard what sounded like someone hit the lampshade on their dresser. And she woke up and saw a man standing in their doorway, sort of lounging against the door frame. She woke my father up because she thought there was an intruder in the house. He also saw the man. They 
saw that the man was dressed rather like a cowboy. Then they saw the man turn around. They saw the light flash from the hallway where my bedroom door had opened and closed because I had a nightlight. And apparently they thought this intruder in the house had gone in their baby's bedroom. So they jumped out of bed, ran in the bedroom, turned the light on. There was nothing there. My father claims that when he turned the light off, he was instantly aware of a presence and that this cowboy was standing over my crib looking at me when I was a baby. Instantly knew that this was a demon and that it had some direct association with me. The next thing that I can remember, because I don't remember that, um, I was approximately three years old, and I remember that my parents had taught me how to read and write at a very early age. By the time I was three, I was already reading and writing. And I remember being dressed in little blue robes and led out into the wilds, the pine barrens of southern New Jersey in the woods with a bunch of men. And there was a lot of insect, uh, incense, sorry, incense smoke. Um, and I would be seated in a little chair in what looked like uh, a pit that might have been six or eight feet deep. And I was handed a notebook and a pen, and I was told to write. And I would write. And I would just write until I filled the notebook. And that was when I was about three years old. Um, as I got older, I remembered more specific details. Um, I began to become aware of what I was actually doing. And uh, it didn't just happen in pits out in the woods of southern New Jersey, although that happens right. quite frequently. Well, Ray, we'll stop right there for a second. Now, uh, you were a Jehovah's Witness growing up. Your, your family was a Jehovah's Witness? Yes. And uh, your father was very strong, your mother was strong, or kind of weak? Um, my mother was not what anybody would consider strong, but she wasn't strong in anything. She was She was not a very strong personality. She was a very passive person. Just That was just her natural personality. My father uh, professed to be of the anointed. He was a company servant before the elder arrangement. He became an elder when the elder arrangement came in right away. Uh, he, he, he was definitely strong. He was definitely what would be con considered strong. Um, my grandmother started going back to the meetings publicly and going out in service again when my father came into the organization. So she was a very key figure in my childhood during the 60s also. Now, you have to, now you do understand that this is a very controversial issue. You do know that. Yes. And I, I want to make clear, the function that I performed – during these rituals and ceremonies that I'm going to talk about did not involve, for me, sexual abuse. And they, it also never involved me forgetting anything. I didn't suddenly remember these memories. I've always known these memories. They're just so, part so of my what, childhood. It wasn't a repressed, you didn't go to a psychiatrist and they said, well, uh, Raven, you have repressed memory syndrome. No. That, did, that didn't come up. In other words, what you're saying is you remember this from young womanhood, young girl, and it's you, you've carried this. And that, that that's why I wanted you on the program tonight, because I've talked with uh, uh, another person that uh, had a similar experience, and uh, she forgot all about it, but in, in her later years in life, she you know got some, some help medically through a psychiatrist, and they brought this all up, but that, that wasn't the case with you. No, it, it wasn't. And I, I really can't say, you know, if that happens or doesn't happen. I can only take the person's 
word for it as as the person's telling the story. Everybody's got their own experiences. But in my case, the only thing that I've forgotten is just normal stuff that, you know, I might be reminded of of what color the feather pen happened to be. You know, I, I may not remember it right off when I first start to tell the story, but as I'm remembering it, then I might, you know, recall the color of the pen. But I, I've never actually forgotten any of this. And part of the reason I think that I didn't separate myself off from it and forget is because at the time, I didn't think it was abnormal. It was my life. It was my childhood. So there wasn't anything in my experiences that would would cause me to forget it. There were frightening times, of course, but I, I didn't. I didn't think that any of these frightening times were out of the ordinary. Well, see, here's what happens, Rave, and I certainly wanted you to come on because not everyone discussing this subject would even come on here, and I just at times might not even want them on, but I wanted you on here tonight because it was something that I, I could at least connect with, with your tone of voice, with the way that you talked. You come across as very credible that uh, it doesn't seem too extreme. Now, I, I know that uh, when you get into, you know, baby sacrificing and all types of crazy sexual abuse and necrophilia and all of this, that it can kind of uh, create a, uh, a sensationalized story, but you, you were not sexually abused. There was no violence. You didn't see any baby sacrificed, right? No, I, I didn't experience any of that. Now, I can't, I cannot honestly say that that stuff may not have happened, but I wasn't involved in it. My my place in all of this was an oracle. I was the one who had a demon of my own, could call the demon, and there would be questions by the men asked, and the demon would give me answers, and I would write it down. I, I know now, as an adult, that what I did was called automatic writing. Um, I, I would fill notebooks and notebooks and notebooks of this, sometimes in situations where I, I had a little uh, desk to lean on or, or, you know, like a lap tray or whatever that I was writing on. I would write right off the page. I would write with my right hand and my left hand. Um, so... That was that was my job in all of this. If there were sacrifices, if there was sexual stuff, which from my own research now on on certain types of satanic ritual, I I know that that would have been normal if if it was. Um, I didn't see it. I didn't come into it at that point. I came right, well, into it later. Well, that uh, see what what it is is so many people because when they hear the word S R A they 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 jump to big conclusions. It's 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 very conspiratorial and and I can understand why because a lot of the stuff really hasn't been totally substantiated. But your your story is different. That that's why I was willing to have you come on here and talk with us about this. Uh, so, so, what, what you're claiming is that uh, Watchtower officials would meet, and they would have you there with them. And they would uh, bring you in some type of an, a room or out in the woods, as you say. And yes. they would, the, the, you, you were actually some type of a, a conduit for the demons, is that correct? Yes, uh, what, what it would be called today would be a channeler. Uh, but, you know, at the time, I, I didn't, they didn't use those words. I didn't know what those words were. But that's so what, what I was this, doing. I was channeling. So when you were young, you were, say, three, four years old, it started. Yes. And, and, and how many times a week did this take place, uh, Raven? I would just guess and say that it was at, le it was at least once a week. Um, the, the, in, the more informal gatherings, uh, the ones out in the woods behind my house or the ones after an elders meeting in the back room at the Kingdom Hall, uh, those instances happened once a week, once every two weeks, but about once a month I was taken to Brooklyn Bethel and that's where the more formal ceremonies took place. 
Um, now, well, walk us through that. Let's let's just try to so so the listening audience can digest this. And obviously, it's very difficult. You do understand that, right? Yes, I, I realize that. And one of the reasons why I haven't talked about it is because it is so shocking to people, and that most people just would automatically dismiss it, not believe it, think I was crazy. That's one of the reasons why I haven't talked about it for for all these years. But one of the reasons why I'm talking about it now is because I just recently, in the last six months or so, started talking about this online in different forums and and chat groups. And I've had other people come forward and say, well, did you remember this? Because I remember this. Did this happen to you? Because this happened to me. And I began to realize I wasn't the only one. And if I wasn't the only one then, then maybe I'm not the only one still. And that put some responsibility on me because there, there was a lot of there was a lot of damage done. I, I was definitely spiritually abused as a child. I, I was I was not given the choice to do this. It was automatically assumed that I was going to do this. Um, I was I was treated wonderfully. I was treated like a princess, but at the same time, I was also expendable. And I just don't want that still happening. I don't I don't want that happening to other children. Well, I, see what what's happened here is I uh, the reason why I've even brought this subject up is last time on the conference call two weeks ago, we had a woman from London, England, and she brought some of this up. She was reading from a book that she heard of this, and she didn't have a personal experience with it, but you do. We had some witnesses that have contacted us, and they wanted to know more about this. And I know it's very, very difficult. I've got some emails. I've got some people that have actually telephoned me, and uh, they were concerned about this subject coming up because what it does is it, it creates controversy. But I, I believe we have to go, you know, the Watchtower organization, for all those listening online here tonight, the Watchtower organization is very esoteric. They're very secretive. We, we know that they're involved in all types of pedophilia and child molestation. I mean, just yesterday in the news over in the U.K., a man was accused of molesting two younger women over there. I mean, this goes on day in, day out in the Watchtower, so it, it's not unusual. But what uh, our special guest here tonight, Raven, is saying, she wasn't sexually abused. She's simply saying that she was used by the Watchtower as a conduit. She, she was used as some type of a, as a spirit medium. Could you use that term, Raven? Yes, I would, I would consider it a channeler. I, I was a channeler. I did automatic writing. Um, I was almost considered a prophetess, except what I was writing for them wasn't coming from me. It was coming through the demons. Now, obviously, again, I say it's hard for people to believe it, but we've heard stories similar to this. Now, I'm going to ask you something. We're going to open the lines up here later as well, but you were brought into these secret arrangements, wherever they were. You say some were held right at Bethel. Now, you say they were at Bethel. Where were they at Bethel? There are tunnels under the buildings in Brooklyn. The larger tunnels um, are, are used by some certain Bethelites. I don't know what their standard is for who gets a key, but, but there are tunnels that were used just for transportation, uh, larger tunnels. But in these tunnels, there are locked doors. And behind the locked doors, there are rooms and smaller tunnels. And it was it's through a series of these smaller tunnels. And I, I can see these tunnels to this day. Um, I really sometimes wonder about them selling the buildings in Brooklyn, what they're going to do with these tunnels. Um, I, I remember distinctly what these tunnels look like. The smaller tunnels were probably four or five feet wide, maybe wide enough for two men to walk abreast. And the tiles, they were, it, they were tiled, completely tiled, uh, floor to ceiling. The, the tiles on the floor were the little one-inch square mosaic-like tiles. The tiles on the, on the walls and across the ceiling were the larger 
four inch square like you would find in a in a bathroom. To me, it gave me the impression that for some reason these were waterproof tunnels. Um, I'm I'm not sure about it, but it's possible there may have even been drains in the floor. I don't I don't know, but it just it gave me that impression because of all the tile. The lighting in the smaller t t uh, tunnels were not fluorescent tubes; they were bulbs. They had sort of a yellowish cast to them, so everything to me, to my childish eyes at the time, looked sort of sepia, sort of a brownish beige was the coloring in there. Uh, there were doors. Uh, the doors were similar to the kind of doors you might see in a school where they had the bar that you pressed on to get into. And it, behind these doors were rooms. And it was in these rooms where we would go and have the more formal ceremonies. I would be taken into the room. There would be a, a closet, a small, smaller room off, off the, the main room. And I would be taken to the closet where there were blue robes for me to wear. I, I remember distinctly my robes were blue. Um, there were anywhere from, I'd say, 5 to 12 men. Um, there was an altar set up at the front. It was, it, to me, it looked like a kitchen counter because it, it had like either a granite or a marble slab on the top, and it was just a big square thing, big rectangle thing. There were chairs. Um, I want to say most of the time there were probably 12 on each side. It was set up so that there was maybe three or four rows of three on each side with a center aisle dividing the two the two sections. Set up like like a, a little book study, except that it had this this counter, this altar at the at the top of it. And I would go in and I would change into my robes. Um, there were never that I remember any women there to help me. I don't remember seeing any other children at the time. I, I would come into the room before things got started, but I was not brought out until things had already been going on because when I came out, candles were lit, it was dark, it was smoky from, from the incense, and there was uh, usually a chair set up on the other side of the altar uh, with the back to the altar so that I was facing away from or facing in the same direction as the audience, but I couldn't see them. I was facing away from, from looking at, at who was out there. Um, there would be 8, 10, 12 men also in dark robes um, in a half circle around the front of the altar, and there would be someone with a sensor um, smoking up the, the area, a lot of smoke. I can remember the way the smoke smelled. It was an odd smell. I've, I've since been in Catholic churches, and it's not the same incense. It's a totally different different smell to it. It was it was almost a smell like burning plastic. Um, I would sit in the chair. I would feel the trance coming on with all the all the smoke and all the incense. And then it would it would seem as if Demon was standing behind me where the altar was, and he would put his hand on my shoulder, and I would I would feel it go through my arm, and somebody would hand me a notebook. The notebooks were just the regular composition black and white modeled notebooks that you use for school, but the pen was usually a feathered pen, and I remember it because I used to think they were really pretty and I wanted to take one home, but I never got to take one home. Um, they were dark, maybe black, maybe red, a burgundy color, could have been purple, I don't know, but it was a dark color that the pens were. Uh, the candles were also dark. Um, I would start writing. I would write and write and write, and when my when my right hand got tired, the demon would put his hand on my other shoulder, and I would switch hands and start writing with my left hand. Um, I, I would write fast. 
I would write so fast that sometimes I would just go right off the page. I would write things that I didn't know what I was writing. I I didn't know the words that I was writing, but they were words. And the notebooks were collected, and they were kept in Franz's office. And most of my childhood, when I got a little older to where I could read the words and I and I understood what I was doing, most of what I was working on was Daniel, was the book of Daniel. And it was specifically, most of my childhood was was on Daniel chapters 11 and 12. Um, and the other, other people that were involved with this, um, Brother Swingle was, was very much involved with this, and, and I, I, I remember him fondly. He was, he was a sweet man. Um, he would make sure when I came to visit that he'd, he'd ask me if I had finished my piano lessons for the day. Uh, he always smelled of ink. I always, I always thought of ink when, when I was around him. Um, he, he was the one I remember handing the notebooks to after, after everything was done. The ceremony was. Um, Brother Franz was just creepy. He was just, he was an odd one. He, he was. He was scary. He was kind of like the the guy you imagine opening the door in the haunted house movies. Um, I remember when I was very young. I remember Brother Nor. Uh, for some reason, I thought he was the president of the United States. Uh, president at the time was Lyndon Johnson, and I guess they must have looked alike. But I, I just I knew him as the president, and somehow my childish mind just associated him with the president of the United States. So uh, that just made me think that it was all the more important. But he scared me. I was always afraid he was going to hit me. He was mean. Um, some of the other ones that, that were there, um, Henschel was there. He's another one I thought was a president. Um, I guess he, he kind of resembled Eisenhower to me or something. I, I don't know. But uh, most of them, I I didn't associate them directly in my brain with being watchtower governing body. They were just the men that were there. And it was Fred Franz, it was Milton Henschel, it was Nathan Knorr, it was Lyman Swingle, uh, Dan Sidlick was there. And occasionally I saw uh, Sister Sidlick um, later on when I was older. I remember her. Uh, and I remember whatever part she had in this when i saw her she was wearing red she had on a, a red dress she had on a purple robe over it she had a long strand of beads that went past her waist and i i remember her red hair I, in fact i remember thinking that she was wearing the costume from the jezebel drama because that's what she looked like to me um I remember Grant Souter. I remember Carl Klein, um, Ted Jarex, Maxwell Friend. He wasn't governing body, but but he was he was there at Bethel. Um, some of the ones that were more local down in southern New Jersey, where where I grew up, the ones that were there for the the weekly things and the elders meetings, was uh, Bill Hannon. He was my father's best friend. My father was George Pangburn. My uncle Larry Pangburn, um, Asa Parker. He was he was an elder there at the time that that this was going on. He was involved. Tom Peters. Uh, there was a, a guy named Leo Volpe, and recently I googled his name and and found out that he actually became disfellowshipped and started his own religion. He thought he was the resurrected Jeremiah. He was involved. Um, uh there were there were others um besides Bill Hannon he had family that were with Russell in in, in uh, Pittsburgh in Brooklyn uh Mary Hannon George Hannon that was his aunt and uncle they they weren't married i believe they were brother and sister um if i can remember the stories correctly George Hannon developed schizophrenia and he was still 
at Bethel. He, he, they, they kept him there until he died. Mary Hannon is buried in the cemetery at the farm. I've seen her grave. Um, I've also been in rituals at the cemetery at the farm. Um, in fact, that is where we went after the memorial and had another memorial. And it was during those times with the with the, the bread and, and the wine that I was actually given bread and wine and partook with the rest of them. Um, yes. Yeah, what happened? Is I had a, I don't know if the, I don't know what happened here. Sometimes I think sabotage is involved, but I'm back on. But I, I was okay. hearing it. I just couldn't get through. I'm the moderator, but I'm right here right now. Okay. Now, okay. You're doing a fine job. I know it's very difficult, but you are giving details. That's that's why I wanted you to come on here. You're naming names and you're giving details. Now you mentioned that Daniel book. You, you said that you had a part in writing that. I have never seen the Daniel book. I left Jehovah's Witnesses in 1997, and it hadn't been published yet. So I'm not sure what it, what is in it. I well, don't, what I don't you, know well, well, what chapters did you what did you have a, a play in? Um, I I specifically ha- had years of involvement with Daniel chapter 11 and 12. Well, and you say you never saw that. No, I have never seen it. Well, after my conversation with you, I went in there and I checked that out. And I have to tell you that they were talking about contact with angelic beings. Well, I know that that there was a book from the early years of the Watchtower Society called Angels and Women, and we had a copy of that book. That that book was my bedtime stories. Um, it was it was a purplish bluish book, and and. Are you saying- you say your bedtime stories. I mean, did, did your father read that to you? Yes. Yes. Well, what do you remember about that book? Because that is a known book. I mean, in fact, it, it, from what I understand, it, it was even published by the Watchtower. But I'm not totally sure on that. But they did endorse it. There's some, some have said it was published by it, but I know they at least endorsed it. But uh, w- what do you remember about that book, Angels and Women? It, it was the story um, told by a fallen angel about his experiences as a fallen angel and how he wanted to get back uh, into God's organization. No. And and supposedly the book was channeled to um, someone. I'm not sure, but I think the book was channeled to another, to a woman. Um, but the, supposedly the book was channeled. He, he, it was his story. It was, it was an angel's story. Yeah. Now these angels, uh, you know, it, it's, it's Rutherford was also involved in this type of foolishness, and and also Wooded, the uh, the editor of the Golden Age, and uh, he even mentioned Wooded, the editor of the Golden Age, that uh, he actually came under some type of a de- demon possession as well. In fact, he even mentioned that Rutherford did the same thing, but. We see that uh, with the Watchtower promoting this angels and women, uh, they were getting the information from other sources other than from God himself. And when you were being channeled, so to speak, did you feel any presence? Did you did you feel that what you were being told was not from God or from some unknown source? How, how did that all work? I didn't have the impression that it wasn't from God because I wasn't expecting it to be from God. I knew I knew where it was coming from. It was coming from a demon. But I wasn't afraid of this demon because in my experience there were scary demons and then there were demons that were not scary. And this particular demon was my demon. I, I knew his name. I used his name. I called him. He came when I called. And he protected me. Uh, a lot of times he protected me just in my daily life, in my normal daily life, he, he was he was almost like what you would perceive of a guardian angel. Um, I have found out now, um, since I have left Jehovah's Witnesses and I've I've gone to the Catholic Church, I found out now that what that is called is it's called demon obsession rather than possession. I, I wasn't possessed. He didn't he didn't 
possess my body. He, he, I had the sensation that he had his hand on my shoulder, that he was he was laying his hand over top of my hand as I was writing. He it, he wasn't in my body. Um, but demon obsession is when the demon is obsessed with with a human, and that's what happened. And and he was a part of my life. I knew what he looked like. I knew what he sounded like. And I didn't, at the, at the time when I was very young, I didn't know that this wasn't normal. Um, a lot of a lot of little children have what they consider to be imaginary friends. There are a lot of uh, anecdotal stories told about children seeing angels. So this this wasn't something that was uh, creating a dissonance in my in my cognitive abilities at that age it it was just something that i thought was was a normal thing um i just and he wasn't bad he had never treated me badly but nonetheless so was this the same angel that was kind of teaching you and telling the so-called uh, hierarchy of the watchtower or certain things was that the same yes. angel or yes the what? yes uh-huh now there there were instances in my in my daily life when I was confronted with other demons and they were scary but in those instances it it was my demon who came to my aid and I actually developed a, a sympathetic relationship with this entity Well Raven I have to tell you this is really a a, a fascinating story and I know many online tonight, they're probably saying, what? They've never heard of this before. But I just want to remind people that you are listening right now to the six screens of the Watchtower conference call. And our guest is Raven Giuliani. And she claims that she, as a Jehovah's Witness when she was younger, actually was involved with demonism. Uh, she claims that uh, the Watchtower was actually using her as a young person as a conduit, somehow, some way, a spirit medium that was able to uh, give them information from the demons above. Now, I know that sounds bizarre to people. Raven is on our call tonight because I've talked with her in the in the past here, and she seems to uh, have the details. She seems to be naming names and she seems to know a lot of things as far as pockets of occult are concerned involving the Watchtower. And Raven, where, where are some of these pockets of, of cult, of the occult? Well, I spent every summer, at least two or three weeks every summer of my life from the time I was two years old, um, right up until my teen years in Biloxi, Mississippi. Biloxi is an area. Um, Miami is an area. Uh, Southern California, specifically San Diego, and a lot of the um, what's called the Inland Empire, the desert, Southern California desert areas between San Diego and, and Los Angeles, um, Southern New Jersey, Pittsburgh, Memphis. Um, I've also had some contacts in Atlanta. And I suspect that there there may be um, some hot spots in Wisconsin because my father has been there. I have never personally been there, but that was one of the places that he moved to on his on his own lived now, for a few years. Let me. I'm just gonna. I'm just gonna see if we can go back. I don't want to bring up bad memories at all here, but do you seeming at least to be willing to talk about this, and I know it had to. It's very difficult. You want to you want to break away from this. Uh, you you are are you broken away from this till this day, uh, Raven? How do you feel about it today? Um. Yeah, I, I am today. I am right now. But when I first left Jehovah's Witnesses, I actually did go to the occult because that was what was familiar to me, and. What had, what had happened was I had had a very bad last year with Jehovah's Witnesses. I never thought I would be one of those weak ones that would give in to the emotional stresses of being a Jehovah's Witness. I, I just never thought that would happen. But the last year that I was a Jehovah's Witness, I had a, just a lot of things come just pounding down on my head. 
and I was in a very vulnerable place. Um, I had just completed 15 years of regular pioneering, and I basically was just reevaluating my life and realizing that there was nowhere else to go with Jehovah's Witnesses, and I wasn't getting any kind of encouragement. I was being, I was in a very vulnerable emotional state. I had seen two suicides and a murder that year. So there there was a lot of stuff going on in my life, and I decided that in order to make myself feel better, I would go back to the original love, to the love I had at first. And in order to do that, in, in, in my mind, I needed to go back to the original literature, the old stuff. So I got out my Paradise Lost to Paradise Regained, and I started reading it, and I was absolutely shocked. I was astonished. There was stuff in there that I don't even remember believing, but obviously I did at one point, and I surely didn't remember it being changed, which obviously it had been. Uh, I, I mean, I, I actually found stuff in that book about 1914 being the time of the end and all of the tribulation already starting, but we were waiting for this second half called the accomplished end to happen and I'm like what is this and when did they change it and how did they change it without anybody knowing about this and so I was I was just getting bombarded from all sides from emotional sides from doctrinal and intellectual I, I got out the kingdom in a linear I looked up some scriptures I was reading something in Revelation chapter 7 and I came across the scripture that talked about the great crowd being before the throne. And a couple of verses down, it said the angels were before the throne. And I'm looking at the Greek word, and it's the exact same word. So either the great crowd's in heaven with the angels, or the angels are on the earth with the great crowd. Because we were told they were in two different places, but this is the exact same word. And I thought, what, do they think we're dumb? So I went to the Internet. And that was basically all she wrote. Um, that That's what actually took me out. It wasn't the occult stuff that took me out. In fact, I had been away from the occult stuff. It, it basically stopped when, when I was 15 because we moved. We moved away. And I was no longer being used in that capacity. So here I am at 34 trying to get the feeling I had back then when that stuff was going on back because that's what I associated with authentic Jehovah's Witness belief. And I couldn't get it back. I couldn't I couldn't get it back. Um if if it's still going on, it was going on without me. And you know, I I have no doubt that it is still going on to some degree. Uh, most of the most of the men that I knew are gone now, but there there are still a few of them still there. Um, Ed Jarrett's is still there. He was definitely involved. Um, well, so. this is well. What what this does, Rave? That that this now you you do know, and I, I mean you're in a very peculiar situation here. You do know that so many people have a hard time believing with what you say. Now, has that happened? I mean, when you speak up about this, how do people react? Well, I haven't spoken up about it because of that, because I, I didn't want to sound, I didn't want to sound crazy, and I knew that one of the one of the things that would validate what I had to say would be the people that I knew and the names that I knew and, and the, the descriptions and that sort of thing. And I was really afraid of it because I have been I have been threatened. I, I have been threatened. I think most of the threats have come from my own family. But when I when I left Jehovah's Witnesses I I lost everything. I, I lost my family. I haven't I haven't spoken to my gra I never spoke to my grandmother again. She died four years ago and I wasn't even told when her funeral was. Um I I haven't spoken to my father in years and the last time that I was in contact with him, uh, a watchtower showed up in my mailbox with blood smeared on it. So, uh, you know, he's he's not exactly what I would consider a, a safe bet right now. And I've also been concerned. My mother and my sister have not been involved with Jehovah's Witnesses for 
at least the last 20 years themselves, I've also been concerned about their safety. So I haven't spoken up about it. Um, when I when I have just in the last six months or so talked about some of these aspects on on some of the forums that I've been on, I have gotten a few pretty bitter, nasty comments about it not being possible and that sort of thing. But if you don't want to believe it, then don't believe it. Um, it happened. Uh, the important thing is to get away from the cult, to get away from Jehovah's Witnesses in the first place. Whatever it takes to get you away from it, that's good. Good girl. Uh, <laughs> well, Ray, let me, let me, let me, here's the thing now. Let's try to walk the people through this because, I mean, it's going to be a very difficult thing for you. And I, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your story. It's going to be really hard. But if you're a Jehovah's Witness out there listening, or a former Jehovah's Witness or anyone that's been touched by the tentacles of the Watchtower, you just put yourself in this position. Uh, imagine if, if you were involved in some type of a ritualistic practice, let, let's say with the Watchtower, where they were using you, they brought you into a room, and they put you in a little cape, and they placed you in such a position that these demons would work through you and speak to them. That This is a very awkward predicament to be in and if, if you were there i mean Ray, raven claimed she's been there and you know it's hard because it's so over the top it's so it's so hard to really picture all of this but i, I believe that as we continue to move forward and we learn more about the watchtower and all of the lies and all the deception and all the esotericness that they have been involved in you know, I, I, some of this stuff, it, it, as you're suggesting tonight to, to us, uh, Raven, and you, you're touching base with details. You, you, you're talking about the color of the tiles in these tunnels. You, you, you're telling us what type of light was there. You, you, you're telling us what color. The, these are the things that one should look for as details. And I have to tell you that uh, it's amazing that you... I mean, I don't think you could have made this story up. And why, why would you have made it up? I, I, what, what reason would you have? So, I mean, people listening tonight are going to say, well, why would a woman like this make this story up? Even though it's hard for us all to believe, uh, we, we know how secretive the Watchtower is. Some of the stuff does exist. Let's get real. And even if you're a Christian online, I think that you have to realize that uh, Satan the devil really uh, is controlling the Watchtower. Uh, it's no question about that. I mean, you can't have a diabolical organization, a cult, a counterfeit Christian organization working and ruling without him. And uh, this, this is just totally amazing when you come forth and say this. Now, I mean, you've thought carefully about this. Is this the first time you really go in public with it for the most part on the conference call, huh? Yeah, basically the only the only other people in my life that I've ever gone into this much detail with, I haven't even gone into this much detail with my husband, but I, I have talked to a couple of Catholic priests. Um, in fact, before I came on yesterday, I called uh, a priest to talk to him about the advisability of actually going public with this, and his response to me was that perhaps 30 years ago, if someone else had had the courage to go public with hidden information, the Catholic Church would not be involved in the pedophilia scandals that they're involved with today. So I got nothing but support from from the church and from my priests. I've also not ever been disbelieved by the Catholic Church. They know the power of demons. They deal with it. It's it's a reality to them. So that that's a, that's another another thing that has helped me um as I, I have I have been spiritually damaged. Faith faith is a big issue for me. To, to trust in, in in another organization, in another group, um and, and to feel safe with it. It's, it's it's a big issue. One thing I want to mention, um I've I've seen this online. Uh Russell there's a there's a quote from, from Russell saying that the truth is the truth no matter who it comes from. And this this was this was in the context of even if the demons tell you it's it's the truth. So 
this has always been the situation with Jehovah's Witnesses. This is not something new. This is not something that just started in the 60s and 70s. Um, you know, you, you hear about SRA, you hear about satanic ritual abuse, and it's something that just came up all of a sudden in the 1980s. Um, this, this has been going on since the beginning. Well, you know what's interesting here is I've been doing some research on this uh, before you came on, and because we have so many Jehovah's Witnesses online tonight, in fact, even the Jehovah's Witnesses were the ones that said they wanted to uh, talk about this. The active witnesses on our conference call, they, they were the ones that suggested, let's go back and revisit satanic ritual abuse. So what I did is I went through the watchtower, and with help of my wife, we tried to come up with, uh, is there anywhere in the Watchtower publications that they actually do refer to and uh, talk about Satanism? And indeed they did. In fact, I can remember I was, I was a witness at the time, and we got to roll the clocks back all the way to October 22nd, 1989. And that would have been in the Awake magazine. And I can remember being out in service in a car group. I hope David's listening because he kind of defined that term. <laughs> but uh, in a car group that uh, saw this publication. In fact, I can remember going out door-to-door -door placing it. It was in the Awake, and, and, the, and it was an eerie picture. On the front cover of the Awake was a picture of a young man with a black hood on with a big dagger in his hand, and the title of the cover of the magazine of the Awake was Satanism, a Growing Menace. Now, the Watchtower has brought this out, that they're not oblivious to speaking about it. It's right there in 89, and it's a deadly growing menace, according to the Watchtower. There's a box on page 3. The box says, hard to believe but true. I'm going to read you the box. I'm going to show you how the Watchtower really identifies with Satanism. And, and they have to identify with it because we're saying right now that they participate in it. So let me read you the box, and then you can draw your own conclusions, but it says, hard to believe but true, a publication of the missing persons unit of the Pennsylvania State Police reports, investigators may find it difficult to believe the strange and bizarre tales of criminal acts being committed by persons wearing priestly robes and adorned with symbols of the devil. Yet according to the bulletin, hardly a day passes without reports of violent acts conducted by Satanists. Across the country, law enforcement organizations are receiving reports of homicide, mayhem, assault, suicide, child abuse, and animal mutilations that are linked with the satanic cult. Now, they had a whole article here in the Awake all about satanic ritual abuse. In fact, it went on for pages and pages and pages. It looks like at least 10, 12 pages here. I think the whole Awake was devoted to that. But what the Watchtower has always done, and it's somewhat sneaky, they know they're involved in some type of abuse themselves, but yet they have to spill the beans on everybody else. So they're admitting if you're a Jehovah's Witness on here tonight and you're listening to Raven, it's imperative, it's important that you realize that your religion teaches about Satanism. But the thing they're not telling you is perhaps they're involved in it themselves. Now, Raven is an excellent example, and even though many on here will not believe what she's saying, some will, some won't, she's, she's naming names, she's giving details. She has a very awkward position that she finds herself in. We're going to be opening up the lines, we're going to be asking Raven some questions. But before we do that, there's just a few more things I'd like to discuss with you. Raven, you're right there, right? Yes, yes. I, I wanted to say when you were when you were talking about how they uh, tattle on everyone else for something that they're doing. That's called hiding in plain sight. Is that what it's called? I was looking, I was trying to find that term, uh, Raven. I, I'm, I'm going to jot that down if you don't mind. What's it called? Hiding in plain sight. Hiding in plain sight. In other words, 
someone uh, is, is mentioning it's, someone else is doing it, but they're doing the same thing. It's a diversion. It's like tattling on, on someone. So you've heard that term before. That that's yes, that's, definitely. Thank you. I, I appreciate that because I'll tell you, I, I've caught them doing that so many times, and I uh, I really do thank you for telling me what that term is because they do that all the time. My my oh. father my father explained it to me this way when I was a child. He said, "You have a right hand and you have a left hand." He said, "You do not let your right hand know what your left hand is doing." On the right hand, we worship Jehovah during the day. On the left hand, we worship Lucifer at night. He said it was the greater luminary and the lesser luminary. No. He had all the scriptures for it. Now, you sound like a pretty sharp woman. I have to say that. Uh, I, I don't see where there's any way. I mean, you didn't sit up late at night and come up with this story, did you? <laughs> no. <laughs> In fact, there have been... <laughs> Thousands of times in my life when I wish this story wasn't real. How do you deal with it? I mean, when when you go to bed at night, uh, how, how, as you look back on the years, I mean, does this demon still make himself manifest or what? He can. He he He's still a threat. I, I would consider it to be a threat probably for the rest of my life. Um, but... You know, I I pray. Um, like I said, I'm involved with a group. Perhaps for some, when they leave Jehovah's Witnesses, it's important that they do not get involved with a group again. For me, it was important to get involved with a group because I need the group protection. And it was also very logical for me that I would go to an old group and a big group, and that's why I started looking into Catholicism. What was surprising to me when I did was, even though I had never been inside a Catholic church before, I knew everything that went on in that ritual. I knew everything that went on because I had already seen it done backwards. I had already seen it. I'd already seen the negative of it. That that's what happened when when I was there with Jehovah's Witnesses. For all their hatred that they spew about the Catholic Church, I've come to realize a lot of it's just jealousy. You know, I've often I've often thought that too. In other words, what you're saying is these uh, satanic ritual abuse. Now, it wasn't sexual, it wasn't violent, but you're saying not it for also, me, not for not, me. It wasn't. Me, it could have been for it, someone else. It could have been for someone else, but in other words, these same things were taking place in the Catholic Church. Is that what you're saying? Well, I'm, what I'm saying is that the way the rituals were set up, they, it was set up like a mass. It was it was set up like what would be considered sacred to some, and 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 it was desecrated with Jehovah's Witnesses. It was at least the, the ceremonies that I was privileged to. They they used incense they used candles they they used they used the same tools that have been considered tools for reaching god for centuries and yet they were using it in the most diabolical ways they were they were using it to reach demons instead of instead of angels they were talking to demons now now these rooms in fact what fascinates me because we brought this up before in fact 2 weeks ago a woman from london england brought up the idea of the tunnels and what have you. But you say there was some secret rooms under the headquarters of the watchtower in these tunnels. Now, how big was the room? Well, let, let's walk us through this. Let's take a walk in. We're, we're, we're entering the tunnel. We're walking through the watchtower below, and we enter a room. How big was the room? Um, I would say the room was was about... Uh, maybe 12 by 18. It was a little longer than it was wide. It, it, wasn't, a, it wasn't a large. It was like somebody's living room. All right. Now, there were seats there, kind of like a little book study, right? Yeah, basically. It, there was a, Usually, there would be a center aisle, and there would be maybe three or four rows of three seats across. I, I don't always remember it being full. I don't remember seeing the people because when I walked in, it was before the ritual started, and then I was put in the little closet where there was usually uh, there was there was water if I needed to to wash because I had I had to be clean. I had to take my hair down if I had it pulled back in barrettes or ponytail. My hair had to be down. 
um, I put the little robes on. I, I, I undressed down to my underwear, and I put the little robes on. Um, and most of it I was attending to myself. I, I don't remember there being anybody there helping me do it. But then I was brought back out, and when I was brought back out, it was already dark. The candles were lit. It was already smoky, um, and there was a little chair set up behind the altar for me, like I said. And I, I can remember a few times there was a little desk, like a little school desk, for me to lean on when I when when it was going to be an especially long session, when there was going to be more than one notebook. Um, I, I would have a desk. Now, there were men in the room, a lot of men, right? Most mostly men. Yes. Yeah. I, I can't. I, I can only remember the only woman that I actually remember involved in any of this. Like I said, was um, Brother Sidlick's wife, and that was when I was a little bit older. When I was really young, I don't remember there being any women there at all. Now, was she dressed in a, kind of a strange way, or what? She was dressed like she was in costume. She was dressed like. I I always thought it, it looked like uh, it looked like what Jezebel's wearing in the Live Forever book just before she get or in the Bible story book just before she gets pushed out the window, or or maybe Babylon the Great. Okay, it was a red dress with a with a purple cloak and a long necklace. Did she say anything? Uh I can remember her being nice to me. I don't remember her saying anything during the ceremony, no. Now, do you remember Dan Sidlick? Yes, definitely. Well, he was a governing body member. So, see, this is what, this is why I have you on the call tonight. Uh, well, I remember you... Dan Sidlick from, not just from at Bethel. Dan Sidlick actually came down to my house. He was actually involved in some of the stuff that was that happened out in the woods. Now... Would this be the woods behind your house? Yes. I lived down in southern New Jersey, south of Vineland and Millville. I went to the Woodbine Congregation. It was considered shore points. And Brother Sidlick came quite often, actually. And when, when he came, he would, he would sometimes stay with us, but he would usually stay with the Hannans. Now I, I I knew Brother Sidlick. In fact, I've met him on a, on one occasion. Uh, so you're 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 more or less suggesting here on the call tonight that and and it's good you can mention names because it gives credibility because a lot of people if they were making this up certainly wouldn't do it. But what you're suggesting is Dan Sidlick, governing body member, was involved in these ritualistic practices. Yes. Yeah, you have no hesitation doing that, and that's. And also, you, you mentioned Brother Henschel. He was the president of the Watchtower for a while, and he was there as well. Yes. Now, what was difference? Be, what was the difference between these woods rituals versus the ritual at the Watchtower Society in the tunnels? Any, any difference at all? Oh, yeah. They, they were actually quite different. So I don't remember there being any altar in the woods. There were. Pits. They weren't really, really deep, but they were they were deep to a little girl. I had to be I had to be lowered down. I had to be put down in them. I couldn't get down there myself. So I'm going to guess and say they were about six to eight feet deep. Um, I could see the top when I was down there. I could see the top. I usually had to sit on the ground. Sometimes they had something for me to sit on, but usually I was sitting right on the ground. And the thing that I remember most about them because during the daytime when they weren't being used in that way the kids that i grew up with called them the snake pits because there was always dead snakes in them now ever since i was very young my father made sure that i well i don't want to say that i was comfortable because who can be comfortable with that but that i was not especially terrified of dead things. He would he would take me out to the highway and we would collect the dead cats off the road that that got hit by cars because it was very frequent when that happened. Um 
I, I can remember carrying the the shovel that was bigger than me and and heavy and going out there and and him making me scoop the dead animals out of the road. So he he always had a thing with making sure that I was able to handle death and blood and and whatever and and there were dead snakes in these pits. Now, in order for the snake to get dead, they had to be killed. So I don't know what went on before I was put down in the pit, but I would assume that somebody had to kill the snakes. And what they did with the snake blood or whatever, I don't know. I, I wasn't a part of that. But they were down there with me, and there would be more incense and smoke, Um and I would do my writing down there when I needed to do my writing. Now, these notebooks that you had, who who would have these today? Do you still have them? No, I, I didn't keep any of them. They they I handed them over to Brother Swingle almost every time. I mean, I can't say for sure every time because it happened hundreds of times. Um, but usually, it was it was Brother Swingle that I remember getting them. And I was told that they went into Brother Franz's office. I've never seen them in his office. But, uh, you know, at the time I had this picture in my head as a child of what it looked like in a in a doctor's office or a lawyer's office with all the books behind him. And I, I could just imagine, you know, these notebooks on the shelf. I, I'm pretty sure he didn't actually keep them that way because they would have been too visible. <laughs> But I was told that he had them. Well, I have to tell you, really, uh, Raven, it's, it's amazing. I mean, I, I don't, I don't possibly see where a young woman like yourself could sit down and conjure all of this up. There, there's, there's something here that, you know, I, I don't know what reason you would do that. But it seems so, you know, it seems strange. And, and many of the callers or listeners coming in tonight, they're going to say, "What? I've never heard of this." But you know something, I have to tell you. I was a witness for close to 50 years, my wife and I both, and there's a lot of strange things that take place behind the curtains of the watchtower, and I'm so glad that people are willing to come out. You don't have to totally believe everything, but we have a young woman on here tonight that claims, her name is Raven Giuliani, she claims that she was involved from a young woman from three or four years old up to about 14 or 15 she was involved in ritualistic practices at the watchtower. She claims that uh, a demon, they would bring her into a into an event, whether it be in a room under the watchtower headquarters in New York or out in the woods somewhere behind her home. She claims that the watchtower would actually rely on her to help her uh, to help them, I should say, to uh, come to grips with what to, to teach. And then these teachings would show up in books. Is that correct, Raven? Yes. And what would happen at the on the local level was I would also my, – my father pretty much divided my family. It was always me and him versus mom and my sister. Uh, mom and my sister. My sister was born uh, – physically ill. She was born with spinal meningitis, and because of that, she had some uh, disabilities. So it was always mom and the baby, and I was with dad. And a lot of times, mom and the baby would go home after the Thursday night meeting because dad had a an elders meeting, and, and they didn't want to stay most of the night with him. And I would stay with dad, but I would fall asleep on the floor of the stage or out in the auditorium somewhere waiting for him, he he would wake me up afterwards, and he, uh, most of the time Bill Hannon, sometimes Asa Parker, sometimes Tom Peters, sometimes some of the other brothers there, would have other meetings after the elders meeting after everybody else went home it would be in this in the the library in the second school where they had their elders meeting and a lot of times it would be what i remember is i remember prayers um i don't know if the prayers were in latin but i i i know 
at least one time, I, I know it was a prayer that was said backwards. The words were said backwards. And whatever they had been meeting on or if there was a question or something came up, a lot of times they would ask me to ask the demon about it. So it, it wasn't just what I was writing for the Watchtower. Some of it was actual local stuff. One one situation that I remember when I was about eight or nine years old was they had been meeting with a man uh, discussing whether or not he was to be disfellowshipped for smoking. And when I went into the room after they said the, the, the prayers and I was sat down in the chair and I was handed the notebook and I was handed the pen, I told them to go out in the parking lot because that's what the demon told me to tell them. I told them to go out in the parking lot. And two, two or three of them went out in the parking lot, and what they found in the parking lot was that same man who had just been in there and told them that he was he was repentful and that he had stopped smoking, sitting in his car smoking a cigarette. So the man was disfellowshipped. Well, no doubt, uh, Raven, you uh, you walk the walk and you talk the talk, and you've got uh, you've got so much here to share with us. I I, I can't believe a lot of things. Uh, I, I'm, I'm coming to grips with you. Uh, you no doubt have been touched deeply by the tentacles of the Watchtower, and many many of our listeners are saying, "What? They've never heard this." But if you if you were a lawyer, well, let let's just go with this, and let's say that uh, the jury is listening. The cases have been presented by both parties here. How 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 are you? Give us some statements to convince us, and 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 really, I I I really appreciate what you're saying here tonight. And you 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 didn't make this all up. Why would you? But but give us as the jury some reasons to really believe that what you're saying is credible. Go ahead. Um. I want yeah. you to con I want you to convince the audience tonight that what you're saying. Is is credible uh, because it's so you know it, they don't hear of this stuff all of the time, and it, it, it just it, it just comes across as whoa this is a little difficult to deal with. But well, this this is what I'm this is what I'm what I would be thinking if if if, it, if I were still in the situation of being a Jehovah's Witness and I didn't know about this stuff myself. Look at what has been proven and has been found out in the recent years. The issue of pedophilia. What is pedophilia? If it's not demonic, I don't know what is. That That is demonic, okay? To, to sexually abuse a child is about as demonic as you can get. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm going to play the part of the jury here, okay? And I'm going to let you know what's going through the jury's head as you're saying that. I, I do agree with that. Pedophilia is very demonic. It, it's, it's a practice that is totally debased. So I'm going to play the, the, the advocate. I'm going to be the jury, and what you're saying, I'm going to kind of register through my mind. I, I agree with you on that point. Go ahead. The other, the other situation that, that I can think of right off the top of my head is the Watchtower's involvement with the United Nations. This is the wild beast, okay? This is the number 666, okay, according to their own, their own words, their own doctrine. And yet, they were intimately involved with it. It's another instance of demonism. This, this is, I mean, how how much more entrenched in Satan's world can you get than pedophilia and involvement with the wild beast? I have to agree with that entirely, Raven. I have counted over 4,600 references in Watchtower publications that were certainly telling us how bad the United Nation was, how, how, how devious, how diabolical, how satanic they were, but yet at the same time, the Watchtower organization was so willing to become an NGO member. That is disgusting. It's, 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 it's demonic. I agree with you. The other thing that I can also think of is since I've become an adult, I've tried to identify what this practice is that they did. 
I've come up with a few labels. There's Luciferianism. There's Enochian magic. Um, uh, you can you can look up you can Google the words. Okay, you can you can find out what it is. You can find rituals online. It pretty much describes some of the things that I remember. So when you look at the very beginnings of this organization, um, I've I've been to Russell's grave. Okay, I've seen the pyramid, and not only is there a there a pyramid about 15 feet off his off his grave. It's also on the property of the largest Masonic temple in the United States. And and you're telling me that this man wasn't involved in that? Look at some of the old books. My grandmother had the complete set of insight in the scriptures and 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 studies in the scriptures. Um I've read the stuff about the pyramids and and the whole reason why they even picked Brooklyn Bethel to set up the headquarters is because it corresponded to some of the measurements in the great great pyramid in Egypt from where he was in, in Pittsburgh they 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 took the the measurements of the great pyramid and converted it into miles and they came up with Brooklyn New York I mean this is crazy stuff this this is this is just insane stuff that that the very beginnings of this organization was based on, and you know so at what point did they change? They didn't change. They just went underground. Well, they didn't change at all. And I have to tell you, really, Raven, you're a very articulate young woman, and you're making a good case. And I think that it can be very convincing to so many people. Some people they just might. Dismiss it. But I mean, we do know, if you get on the six screens of the watchtower.com, we do know that we have a screen on there on the occult. And we know that they have been involved in occult activity. How about Johannes Grieber? How about using his Bible, which was written under the direction of demonism, to support some of their uh, translations uh, concerning John 1 1 specifically? So when you, you, you get in there and you take a look at it all, you look at the whole picture, you say, my goodness, is the Watchtower involved in occultism? The, the, the yes. answer to that is yes. yes. Just the, the word Watchtower. Yes. Just the word Watchtower. What are the Watchtowers? The Watchtower are the Grigori. They're the fallen angels. You know, where, where, did, where did the word Watchtower come from? One obscure reference in a, in a scripture somewhere and, and the whole organization is based on it? Just, just the word watchtower means fallen angel. Isn't that something, huh? Do you still have that book, Fallen Angels? No, I don't. When I when I left when I, I left mean, California, I left basically everything I had. So but. you're living in Virginia now. Yeah. Now your husband was he a witness? Never. Thank uh -huh. goodness. <laughs> uh, how how does he feel about all this? Is, does he does he believe you? Yeah, he does. He he supports me entirely. Um in fact, he recently changed his his career about 4 years ago and he went into security and he works for Homeland Security. He he basically did that after I made a phone call to the FBI about the bloody watchtower in my mailbox. Um he 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 completely supports me. Now the FBI. I mean, your husband works at Homeland Security. You've been. Have you ever asked about FBI investigation? Yeah. When I reported the Watchtower, they asked me some questions, and when I basically told them, you know, not not in the detail that I've gone into tonight, but I, I told them the I answered the questions they had for me. They said that because I was not claiming any sexual abuse, that there wasn't anything they could do about it, but they wanted me to know that the Watchtower is being watched and has been watched by the FBI for quite a few years. Well, you know, I've heard that before. What, what would you think the FBI was watching the Watchtower on? Uh, you don't. You, you, there's probably no answer to that. But. Well, I, I would. I would assume it's because they're a cult. It's because they're a mind high control group. They are. A, they are a cult. My when I was listening to David Reed tonight, 
I was thinking, my, I, I have a, an ABC of, of what makes a cult, and, and I know that there are a lot of explanations out there that go into a lot more detail, but for me it's basically three points. Isolation, insulation, and demonism. And the demonism in, that I'm talking about is, is the demonizing of us versus them, which David Reed mentioned tonight when he was, when he was speaking. If they isolate you, which they do, if they insulate you, which they do, and if they demonize everybody else who's not them, that's my definition of a cult. And that's where I think the real danger with Jehovah's Witnesses is. I have to be I have to be completely honest with you here. I do not feel that I was any more abused by the Satanism aspect than I was by the daytime worshiping Jehovah aspect. Because it was the daytime stuff, it was the it was the stuff that everybody sees in the kingdom hall that has hurt me the most spiritually. That's what's made me not trust any other religion. That's what's made it hard for me to develop a faith. That's the reason why I didn't know who Jesus was, just like David Reed mentioned. And that's the biggest thing that's hurt me. Well, I have to really say this, Raven, that uh, you're a real trooper, and no doubt uh, you do know the, the dangers of the Watchtower, and you are aware of spiritual warfare, because that's exactly what takes place. Uh, there's, there's forces of dark, there's forces of evil. Now, I want to mention to people listening tonight, if they like what's being said here as far as uh, Satan at work, he's certainly trying to destroy so many people. Uh, tomorrow afternoon at 2 o'clock, if you'd like to join us, we have another conference call. The same numbers apply. We have our Upper Room Ministry Church. We have a house church. We'll be talking about spiritual warfare tomorrow. And we certainly encourage anybody that's online here tonight, if they'd like to come in and hear what former Jehovah's Witnesses talk about regarding Christ and true Christianity, you're certainly welcome to come in. And the same numbers apply, just dial the same numbers you did as far as getting into the conference call tonight. We'd love to have you join us, and you can listen to the sermon, which starts at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon, Eastern Standard Time. And at the end of the sermon, you can ask some questions on this, but obviously it kind of ties in with what we're talking about tonight. We know the forces of evil are at work, and where the Watchtower is a... Uh, a, a non-Christian organization, a cult, if you would, as even David Reed said earlier, they are false Christians, they're counterfeit Christians. Uh, someone is working with them, and we identify that one as Satan, the devil, and I know our guest here tonight does as well, uh, Raven Giuliani. Now, Raven, if there's anything that uh, keeps you awake at night concerning the witnesses, what would it be? The idea that they might still be doing this, that there might still be some three-year-old out there being possibly drugged, tranced, working with demons, giving them the information that they need to write their literature. So that still does, obviously it becomes a uh, a mode of operandi for you. you. You realize they may still be keeping up. You think they're still going through with some of these satanic rituals, these... Uh, rituals where they bring young people in and use them as some type of a conduit for untruth? I don't see any reason why they would stop. I, I don't see that, that the organization has, has made any changes. Now, you say that you had some friends that have had similar experiences, at least these people you talk to yes. online. Uh, uh, I've uh, had, uh, yes, yes. I've had quite a few tell me that they know about the tunnels. And they know about the locked rooms. I've had I've had quite a few tell me that. That was probably some of the first information that I ever got out of out of people. Now, did they uh, bring this? Did they bring this up, Raven? And in fact, it's so important because I, I know how the listeners are thinking tonight. And I'll, let me tell you this: our listeners, first of all, are very intelligent. Uh, all of these people, they, they 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 read so much. They they they're in tune with so much. So they. You know, sometimes they become skeptical, but uh, the people that you've been in contact with online, did they bring this up before you did, or did you bring it up first? 
usually what happens is I will tell a piece of my story, but I will purposely leave out the details. And I will get half a dozen emails saying either can you give me more details or I remember this or I know about this, did this happen with you? Um, but I, I've been very careful what I've put out there. It's, it's only been in the last couple of weeks that, I, that I've actually put out some, some details. What, what do you think is motivating you within the last couple of weeks, Raven? Why, why this, this, this fervor, so to speak, to, to, to get this information out? What, what's happening? The new light's coming from somewhere. Jehovah's Witnesses in the last few years have been coming up with all these these doctrinal changes. It, it's coming from somewhere. Um, it, there seems to be an increase in the activity lately. I've been in I've been living in this particular house for almost six years, and the first four years I'd never had a Jehovah's Witness at my door. In the last two years, I've probably had half a dozen. So there's there's some sort of increase in activity going on. Um, I will lurk on a lot of the uh, forums and and not come not talk not even register on some just reading the stuff, and and I'm finding out about all of these these new thoughts that they're they're getting they're getting them from somewhere and I know where they got them when I was a kid, they got them from me. I don't want to sound well audi, but you know something. You know, is, 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 there's something that gave me kind of the willies tonight, if you don't mind. When you know, you said that when you were brought in there as a young girl, and you were actually giving them information on the Daniel book. And I have to tell you, you, you didn't share this with me. There's no reason why I'd have to embellish this at all. But you did not share this with me. I just asked you uh, when I talked to you this week prior to the call, what chapters of the Daniel book you gave them information on. You said 11 and 12, was it? Yes. And what what amazed me is, I mean, I went back, I, I have the, we have the most extensive library here of Watchtower literature in all of New England. In fact, that's where our conference call originates from, right here in the library. We have all the books all around us. And that Daniel book that you uh, said concerning chapter 11 and 12, uh, even though you did not know what's in it, you haven't seen it, right? I've never seen it. Well, what is so amazing to me is what you were saying concerning, you know, this demon working through you and what have you, these, this angelic direction, as the watchtower would call it, that's exactly what they were saying. Some, they were saying in chapter, I believe it was 11, that it was a special box in there that they were saying that angelic direction comes from sometimes bad angels. Isn't that something? Hmm. You never saw that. Oh, well, that's another example of hiding in plain sight, isn't it? My goodness, I'll tell you, that, that gives me the willies when I even think about that because, you know, there's no reason that anyone online here tonight, after listening to Raven's story, can say this is all entirely made up. I mean, I don't know why a person would make this up. It, it just, see, see, what would be the reason? I mean, you're not making a lot of money on this, are you, Raven? <laughs> I mean, no. you, have, you have a lot of checks coming to you in the mail? No, no, definitely no. not. I in mean, fact, my, my, my father's still in New Jersey. You know, it's, it, there, it's, it's, it's still a threat. There's still a threat there. So it's, I'm not getting anything from this except you, that I feel, I feel almost obligated for some reason at this point in time to discuss it. I keep thinking about 15 years of pioneering, and please, dear God, if there was anybody I studied with that became a Jehovah's Witness because of it, just, you know, let them find out the truth. Let them leave. Let them get out. I, I don't I don't want that stain on my soul. Now, is, you don't have to give us your real name, but is Raven Giuliani your real name? Giuliani's my married name. My my name growing up was Pangburn. So, 
So you you don't have to share the real name with us, but it, it's just interesting what you, you you you're willing to come on and discuss with us. And I'm sure there's many people on this line tonight that has has a lot of questions to ask to you. Uh, do you mind taking some questions? I, I will be happy to answer what I can. Now, obviously, I want you to know some people are, are going to be, you know, they're going to discredit what you said, and I don't want you to be, you know, kind of inhibited by what they're saying, just kind of because you know it's controversial, right? Yes, yes, I understand. And uh, what what I extract from this, I mean, you know, I've talked to so many people. I've, I've, I've tried to put together a, a very important website for people to get into and listen to, and a lot of people are. There are controversial issues, but when the subject of SRA comes up, it, it, it really just, you know, people seem to develop two camps right away. I believe it or I don't. It, it, sometimes people don't stop to even think about this. Some areas to at least consider. So... I hope our listeners are at least willing to consider uh, what's been said here tonight, and we're going to open up the lines. We're going to be able to ask Raven some questions on uh, on her satanic ritual abuse. But let's not take the word satanic uh, in its worst form here. Let's not look at the torture, the sexual abuse, the sacrificing of babies, Let's calm it down a little bit. What Raven is saying is that she was abused ritually pretty much on a weekly basis growing up uh, as some type of a conduit or spirit medium. Let's go with that, where she was used by the watchtower as some type of a channel of communication that the demons were witnessing or speaking through her and feeding the information to the powers to be at the Watchtower. As bizarre as that sounds, well, let's see if we can not put some of this understanding in proper context. So we're going to open up the lines. Uh, if you have a question for Raven, hit star one, and let's ask Raven a question. Go ahead, please. Star one, ask Raven a question. Go ahead. Star one for Raven. I have a oh, question. Go ahead. Um, Raven, in any of these ceremonies, and you described some and that there were some prayers, uh, were there any other ceremonies such as joining hands uh, together in a circle or uh, saying any chants? I don't recall that happening when I was brought out. Um it's possible it happened before I was there, before I was actually involved in the ceremony. My part was very specific. I had one job to do, and basically I was prepared ahead of time to be there for that for that job. Now, when I was in the library with some of the local elders, um, they were not sitting when they did this prayer. They were they were standing. They weren't in any robes. They were in their their regular meeting clothes, their regular suits and ties. Um, I don't I don't recall them specifically holding hands. Uh, nobody held my hand. I I was not touched. I I was I was set apart from them. Um, I, I was treated very well actually, but no, no one ever held my hand that I remember. And when I was in the secret rooms, I was sitting with my back toward them. So I didn't see what they were doing. Hey, thank you. Okay, we've got Raven Giuliani, and she uh, is a Jehovah's Witness. And she has been telling us tonight that she has been involved with the satanic ritualism in the Watchtower. And if someone has a question for Raven, hit star one and ask Raven a question right now. Go ahead, please. Hello, Raven. My name is Barb Sinclair. I have a question for you. Yes, okay. Hi. Hi. Um, I'd like to say that it was a very interesting um, testimony that I heard. Um, I'm on Pell Talk, and with me I have about eight or nine people listening. 
Um, I did a quick Google search on your name, and I came up with a website where somebody with the same name has admitted to being a, re a relation to Lucky Luciano, the Sicilian mobster, and that uh, same person with your name had um, the mother, her mother was a daughter of Lucky Luciano. You verify yeah, that's, that's, that's a possibility. We, my mother didn't know who her father was until she was well into her 70s, and then we, we found out through some uh, paperwork after after her cousin died, and we I was actually trying to find out some more information about Luciano's t uh, family. His family name was not Luciano. That was, that was a name that he assumed, but his family name was uh, Lucania, and I believe you probably found some of the genealogy websites that I've been listing on trying to come up with the uh, the genealogy of the Lucania family on, on my mother's side. But, yeah, that's true. Can you tell me, are you a first-generation uh, former Jehovah Witness? Um, uh, no, my, my grandmother was the first one in the family, so I would be third generation. Third generation. And was your mother born in uh, the United States? Yes. She was born in um, Millville, New Jersey. And was your grandmother born in the United States? Uh, her mother? Yes, yeah. her mother. Her mother was also born in the United States. She so wasn't raised she wasn't raised by her mother though. She was raised by her mother's aunt. So she was raised by her great aunt. Okay, so you're three generations Jehovah Witnesses right from the United States here. Yeah, and the generation from Jehovah's Witnesses, though, is on my father's side, not my mother's side. On your father's side. Uh-huh. Okay, thank you. You answered my question. All right. Very good, Raven. I'll tell you, we got a lot of people coming in here tonight. They're still coming in. And like I say, they're coming in from all over the world. They They want to hear what's going on on the conference call, and we certainly welcome them all in. Previously, you missed David Reed. He was on earlier. Right now we have our special guest, Raven Giuliani. Now, Raven was a Jehovah's Witness, and she claims that she was involved in ritual abuse, in fact, uh, satanic ritual abuse, if you would, in the Watchtower organization. And uh, she's shared her story with us tonight. We have questions being asked to her. Now, if there's any questions for Raven... Now is the time to hit star one and ask Raven a question. Go ahead, please. Hello? Go ahead. Go ahead. Hi, Raven. Hi. Um, I, I have a couple of questions, actually. Are there any current uh, governing body members that participated in the ritual abuse? Uh, as far as I know of the, of the current governing body, um, the only one that that is left is is Ted Jarex, and and there is another uh, governing body member whose name is familiar to me, but I can't honestly say that I know him specifically, and that would be Pierce. Now Pierce Pierce was a name that that I knew from my childhood that was involved with this, but I don't know if he was involved with it. Okay, and then so what age what age did you start going to the to Bethel? Uh oh gosh, what age? It was at least as young as three. I I remember that that I associate the, the ritual starting when I was about three years old. So they was, immediately took you to I mean, was there any you said they thought that there was a cowboy or a demon in your house and yes. they just somehow knew you were chosen then? Yes. And so your father was a Satanist and a Jehovah's Witness? Yes. I, I would I would consider him from what I know now, I would consider him a Luciferian because he did use the word Lucifer. He did he he referred to Satan as Lucifer. And so um let me see. How did you know that you were supposed to write? Uh, I, I don't know how my parents knew, but they did. They did teach me to read and write at a very, very young age. 
how I knew I was supposed to write was they just handed me a notebook and a pen. And it, it was almost, I guess, what you could consider an out-of-body experience. It was, nice. it was as if my, my arm was writing without me doing it. And yeah, I, I, I understand what the yeah. uh, automatic writing is. And so your uh, that was another question. I wasn't too sure if your mother was aware of what was happening. I don't know how much aware she was. Um, like I said, my, my sister had been born sick, and my mother was pretty much absent as, as far as, as as my childhood. She just wasn't really involved with me a whole lot and even to this day even though she hasn't been one of Jehovah's Witnesses for 20 years I've probably only seen her 10 times in the last 20 years myself I I see her once a year usually I go to visit her at holiday time for a couple of days we're we're not real close we never have been now I'm trying to understand how the um Luciferianism and the going to meetings worked out in your daily life. Did you do your home Bible studies, you know, the once a week everybody gets together and does the Bible study? You know, did you study your watchtowers and then in the meantime your father was teaching you, I don't know, Satan things, I don't know. <laughs> how, how did that work out? Ah. <laughs> uh. I remember a lot of times being told, this is what it says, but this is the way it is. And the reason that we know more than anybody else at the Kingdom Hall is because we're special, because we're smarter, because, you know, we've we've got an edge somehow. And that that's how it was always presented to me. It, it was always, I, I was always made to feel special. And as far as Home Bible studies, that was always a struggle with us, but I guess that wasn't really that much different with anybody. From from the stories that I hear, most, most people had a problem getting their home Bible studies organized. And and because I could read and write, I was pretty much left on my own to study the, the book study and the magazines. It, it was a big deal for me to be able to answer the longest questions when I was a kid. It was a, It was a competition, so... I always made sure that I was studied. I can remember I can remember my mother copying the answers out of my book. So you um <clears throat> you in your mind what you were doing with the automatic writing and you you thought that you were doing that for Jehovah or the President of the United States or Yeah, I, I thought what I was doing was good. I, I thought, you know, it, it was it was something special, and yeah, I was I was doing it for the president, and and then later on, when I realized, you know, who who the people were involved, I was doing it for the watchtower. And so you had, at what age did you realize what exactly say, you were doing? I, I would say probably eight or nine. Eight or nine, you started understanding what you were writing and what it kind of meant to the Watchtower. Yeah, and and at 12, I got baptized. And once I got baptized, it slowed down. It was not not every week anymore. There there was definitely a breach after I got baptized with, with my father. Our relationship changed. But we, I didn't leave the area until I was about 15 and a half. So for, for about three and a half years there, I was still doing it, but I just wasn't doing it as often. And was there any other rituals you practiced besides the writing? I mean, were there not that I recall. Or... Not, not that I recall. I, I, wasn't, I wasn't involved in anything else that, that I can remember. So nothing was explained when they first took you to, uh, who took you? My to, father. Uh, Bethel. My father. Just your father. Well, it would, we would be in a group. There would be my father and, and a couple of other elders. They'd, they'd always, and, while, while they were there, they would pick up literature. Pick up literature, go downstairs, get in the secret room, and worship the devil. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah. 
Okay, and let me see. Now, what happened after the meetings? You know, after uh, you were writing, you handed the book. And... I usually fell asleep. I was, I was, it was late. I was usually exhausted. Um, I, I, a lot of times, I just. I don't even remember the trip home. I just remember waking up the next morning in my bed and have to go to school. Okay. Um, I think that would be it. So nothing was really explained. You just basically knew your position in life and happy to do it. That's why I consider it abuse. I may not have been sexually abused, I may not have been physically abused, but the fact that I had no choice in it, and and the fact that I really feel now that they would have just used me up. They would have used me until I died. Hello. When you, when you, okay. Can I ask a question to Raven? Yes. You mentioned uh, Angels and Women, the book, and your dad read that to you when you were a child. Uh, do you have any recollection of what that book was about? I remember it being about a specific demon. I remember it it was it was a fallen angel. Uh, I remember uh, stories about life before the flood. Um, and I remember that this demon wanted to come back. One wanted to basically the way it was presented to me wanted to be reinstated, had been disfellowshipped and wanted to be reinstated. Um, I know the de- I know the demon had a name, but I don't remember it. I don't remember it. I, I remember the, the book sat on on the bed stand on the on the stand next to the bed for most of my life. Yes. So your dad regularly read it to you from when you were a small child. When I when I was very young, yeah. Did you read it? Um, I don't remember it. I don't. I know I don't remember picking it up and reading it on my own. And um, was, after I was fifteen, I didn't have it. My father had it. Did you Did you recall the name of the uh, heroine in the book? It, okay, it it seems to me it seems to me that I think the demon's name started with a K. I'm not sure. I don't I don't really remember I don't really remember that. I remember the the cover of the book more than anything. Um I remember it it, it seemed to look old fashioned and I had a few other older books that had the same had the same style to it and, and I know it was it was a it was like a dark purple, like a purplish blue color. And it had well, eight letters that were rubbed off by the time I had it. That's right, that's the book. Uh the 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 name of the girl in the book, her name was Aloma. And the fallen angel was Hesperus. Does it sound familiar? Yeah. The the well the name of the of the angel does. I still, the name of the girl, though, still doesn't really ring any bells. Well, Hesperus was the fallen angel that actually dictated, and it was a novel, and dictated the novel to a woman by the name of uh, Smith. And uh, the book was penned in 1878, and the original name of the book was Theola. And the woman who put the book together uh, was J.G. Smith. And this was quite a popular book, but it was recognized as being a novel. And uh, the, uh, the the fallen angel wanted to return to God's organization. And, and he was really, you could call him a demon, I guess. And... Uh, it, the events of the book took place between the creation account and the great deluge. So that's that's your basic uh, information about that book. Now, in 1924, a Bible student by the name of Edward Brennison revised it, and it was advertised twice in uh, the uh, Golden Age. 
and uh, Brennison printed it, not the Watchtower. It was printed by A.B. Abac Company. It was a, re a re revision of Ciola. And so it was renamed Angels and Women. I find that a fascinating book to read to a small child. Uh, it, it's a fantasy book. Uh, I have never read the book, but I have certainly heard a lot about it. And uh, I wondered, when you read that book, was it, were you, uh, I mean, how did it affect you as a small child? Or you heard the book, it read to you as a bedtime story? I I think that I think the reason that my father did it was to develop some sort of sympathetic relationship with my own demon. I think. I guess, I think same. Yeah, I, I think that he he did it to 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 make me sympathetic toward toward the demon and not be afraid. Yeah, uh, your father apparently knew what he was doing. Now you you used to be Pangburn, right? Yes. Yeah. We knew the Hannans, actually, and I remember George Hannon, and uh, I had no knowledge that he had schizophrenia, but I'm not disbelieving you, but he was successful when we were there, and he was quite elderly, and we knew Mary Hannon, too, and uh, he, he worked in, uh, when because he was way up there in age, he couldn't do too much, so he would be uh, in the tunnel. And uh, there was a room off the tunnel, and the door was open. And it was a room the size of what you say, like your living room. When did you realize that, that as a Jehovah's Witness, that this was really a no-no? You know, that because yeah. on the you know we did as witnesses, we we did not uh, to in develop, involve ourselves with spiritistic practices at all, and yet you were. So how did you put that together? As a pioneer, well, even. As, as a witness, it never occurred to me that it was a no-no, because the way it was always presented to me was Jehovah had the daytime and Lucifer had the night, and, and the ones that didn't know that and didn't understand that didn't know it and didn't understand it because they weren't special. And so it, it never occurred to me that there was anything wrong with that. I thought that was... Part of my being a Jehovah's Witness, it was it was it was all part of the whole. The daytime and the nighttime went together. They might have conflicted between themselves, but they but they belonged to one whole day together. And when I started having problems, is when I left my parents' house. I was 23 when I when I actually got out of my parents' house and started living on my own. And from 23 to 34, that 11-year period in there, I was basically pioneering out of desperation. I was trying to stay with the organization that I knew growing up because I thought it was the right one in that form. And after I left my parents' house and I was away from my father and I realized that the majority of Jehovah's Witnesses did not believe the way that I was raised, did not know anything, I kept telling myself it's because I'm living on the West Coast. I lived next to Bethel. I, I was in Brooklyn. You know, most of these, most of the elders I was dealing with, I was older than most of the elders I was dealing with. I had been pioneering longer than most of the elders had, had even been going out in service that I was dealing with. And I was dealing with people on the West Coast who had never even been to Brooklyn. So it was very easy for me to dismiss it by thinking, well, you know, I'm still special. I still know more than they do. And, and so that was my struggle. I, I really did struggle with staying in the organization for that 11-year period that I was in without my parents being in. Well, I'm sure. I'm sure I can understand your your feelings there. You mentioned that you had seizures when you were two and a half years old. Could that be the medication that they were giving you? Like I think Dilantin is that one of the medications? Dilaudid was one of the things. Um, 
I think that that was a very, very good possibility that, that that's what happened because I never had seizures again and there was never any medical explanation for the seizures that I did have. Okay. The people that you mentioned at Bethel, Joe and I know, knew every one of them. Of course, the majority of them are now deceased. But we did know them and we knew uh, most, well, no, I'd say three quarters of them socially. Was Brother Barr there? I do not remember Brother Barr being there. I, I know of him, but I don't I don't remember him being there, no. Okay. But you do remember, uh, what about uh, Lloyd Berry? No, I don't I don't remember him either. And I and I remember him from his I remember his voice. He had a very distinctive voice, but I don't remember him being involved in the rituals. Okay. Uh, what uh what do you remember about Grant Suter? I remember him being tall, or at least he was tall to me when I was a little girl. <laughs> yeah, well, could you was three years old when you were taken there. That would have been about 1965, right? Yes. What I remember is I remember small, uh, at least, I don't know if it was the same place I went to every time or not, but I remember it being a smaller tunnel off a larger tunnel. The, the larger tunnels were were almost big enough to drive through. This this was a smaller tunnel, maybe big enough for two people to walk down and without touching the sides. And I remember the the floor tiles were the little teeny one inch square like bathroom tiles. And I remember it being like beiges and 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 browns. And and the light was sort of yellowish light. And to me, it gave me the impression that it was waterproof it just uh, because it was all tiles it was it was tiles everywhere and and it just it made me think of of a of a bathroom or or of uh, uh the top, the tunnels you go through in the cars when you go under the under the water um, and and it was it was off of the main tunnel it was it was a smaller tunnel off of the main tunnel I don't know when this memory might have been. I don't I don't know if if this memory is specifically when I was 3 years old or if it might have been later on when I was when I was 6 or 7 or 8. I I don't I don't know. It's just the memory that I have of the tunnels. I remember the doors, the door that went to the smaller room what it was like it was like a door you would see in a school. It was a door that had the bar across it that you pushed on the bar to get in, but they were locked. They were locked, and they and they they. I, I'm not sure if I remember a small window in the door or not. I, I can't say if there was a window in the door or not. But if there was, it was not a large window. It was a small window. Yeah, basically, when I after I was 12. Yeah, it was a big it was a big issue when I started my period and I I wasn't used as much after I got baptized. I I was the only 12 I was 12 years old one week when I got baptized. And after I got baptized, there was much more emphasis on the daytime activities as far as Jehovah's Witnesses were concerned. That that for me is is from the moment I got baptized. That's when it started. Well, when are you going to pioneer? When are you going to do this? When are you going to do that? And and I the things that I remember it was it almost was a was a polar shift in in what my activities were and my relationship with my father deteriorated greatly and quickly after I got baptized. Um, and he was almost in competition with me after I got baptized. The, the year that I got baptized was the year that he started partaking publicly. He had partaken before and claimed to be of the anointed, but he never actually did it openly in the kingdom hall because, for one thing, he wasn't even born until 1936, and at the time it was believed that 1935 the sealing had already taken place and there wasn't any more of the anointed. So, you know, it, 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 I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt. Finish your sentence, please. Um, so after I was after 12 years old, from 1974 on, there was a there was a huge shift in 
in the activities that I was involved with. Um, I still did the automatic writing, but it, it wasn't as often. And I, I don't remember making as many trips up up to to Bethel anymore. Um, mm-hmm. you, the last few years, I don't remember. I don't remember Brother Nor's last few years at all. Um, he had been he had been out of the picture for quite a few years by by that time. I I don't think that I think he died. Did he die in seventy seven somewhere around there? I thought I was much younger when he died because from from a younger age he wasn't he wasn't involved anymore. It was primarily Fred Franz who was involved. Um, the dad, last few years. Did your dad actually uh, introduce you to these men by name or call? Were you were you calling them by name? Did you yes. say brother yes. Franz, brother? Uh, yes, I, 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 call, I called them. I called them brother. I called them brother Franz, brother. Brother Swingle, um, Brother Nor. I, like I said, I was I was afraid of I was afraid of Nor. He was kind of mean, and I I always thought that if if I was going to get smacked for some reason, he was the one that was going to smack me. So I was kind of afraid of him anyway. He was certainly stern. He, he had that kind of demeanor. He was he was stern. Did uh, uh, your dad did he know these people for many years? Yes, he did. Right. So my, my father's best friend at the time uh, of of my childhood, throughout my whole childhood, his his best friend was Bill Hannon. So I I believe that, that was probably the beginning of his connection with with Brooklyn. Was your father uh, very manipulative? Extremely. My father was very manipulative, and he was extremely charismatic. He had. People either adored him to the point where it it actually got dangerous, and th- and 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 other elders counseled him against certain actions and and social activities, or people absolutely hated him. There was, there was no middle ground with my father. If, did you say he is deceased? No, he's still alive. Still like and seventy, seventy two, seventy three. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I ha I've we've been estranged for since I've been married because I got married in the Catholic Church and he decided that, that he didn't want to have anything to do with me anymore. So it it's been since two thousand two that I haven't had any any words with him or any exchange or communication at all. But from what I understand, uh he is trying to be an active witness again. I say, did you ever confront your dad with your uh, memories of of what happened to you as a child? Oh, many times, many times. I I've got, in fact, there's there's a letter that I wrote him that's actually online, um, on the uh, Jehovah's Witness uh, memorial site for victims of of uh, the blood issue. Um, I I put I put the letter on there. For other people to read that I, that I wrote him, confronting him, telling him that you know the way I was raised isn't what I found out Jehovah's Witnesses to be, and and that he's been deluding himself all these years, and et cetera, et cetera. I've, I've never received an answer from him. But did you ever talk to him personally about what you call? Yeah, I went. Yeah, I I went back to New Jersey in 1999. And, and I spent about six months there, and I, and I did confront him personally, and he just he just basically told me that it was what it was, and he did what he did, and he has no regrets, and that's just the end of it. You have a handicap. Um, I am currently disabled at at the moment, yes, because I I have a um I have a mobility issue. Um, I can't get around quite as much as I used to, and and I have asthma. I thought you did. Uh, did you try not? Did you try to contact me uh, many years ago? I think I think I might have. I talked to Bill Bowen a few years back, and I and I think that he suggested I I try to get a hold of you, and and I think that was when I was living in Tennessee. That's right. In fact, you were at a motel. In Manchester, Tennessee, right off of Interstate 24. Oh, I just moved there. Okay, yeah. And then uh, I understood that you were 
Did you, were you in a wheelchair? Yeah, I have a wheelchair. I use it part time. I don't use it all the time, but I I do have to use it like when I when I go to a mall or some place that I I don't know you know how far the walking is going to get. I see. Did, didn't you leave the area uh, because uh, something happened that you felt your your life was in danger? I moved to Tennessee away from New Jersey to get away from my father. Now, I had gone back to New Jersey in 99 because I basically I needed to make sure that my mother and my sister were okay and I wanted to confront my father and I and I did and I was there for about 6 months and I left I left New Jersey to go to Tennessee. Actually, I left New Jersey to go to New Hampshire, and then my husband's job got transferred to Tennessee. So I had only I had only been in New Hampshire, excuse me, for a few months, and then we got transferred to Tennessee again. But yeah, I was I was definitely worried. I I was getting threats, and that's that's around the same time that I got that watchtower in the mailbox with the blood smeared on it, and I'd also yeah. made phone calls to the FBI. And that was in Tennessee, wasn't it? Yes. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes. Uh, uh, I I remember that. And um, uh, where did you go from Tennessee? Because you were only here a few weeks, weren't you? I was that when I if I was still in the motel, then yeah, I had only been there for a few weeks. We had a house that we moved into, but I, I can't remember what the reason was. It wasn't it wasn't ready, or the electricity hadn't gotten turned on in, in time, or something. We had been in the, we had been in the motel for just a couple of weeks, and then we moved into a house in uh, Manchester, and we lived in that Manchester Tullahoma area for uh, about a year, and then he got project coordinator position with Comcast, and we ended up moving on the other side of, of the mountain, on the other side of Chattanooga, closer to Knoxville, and I lived there for a year. And he he worked there until he finished that project, and then we ended up up here in Virginia. I see. That was around 2001, 2002, right? Yeah, uh-huh. Yep. Right. And I, and 2002, is, I was in Madisonville, which is on the other side of Chattanooga, close to Knoxville, and that was the year that I came into the Catholic Church there in in Madisonville. Uh, did you contact any witnesses at all? You were out in '97, so you didn't know any of the witnesses, right? No, I, I haven't. I haven't had anything to do with with any Jehovah's Witnesses that I know of, unless it was somebody online. Uh, I, I haven't had anything to do with Jehovah's Witnesses since I left. Okay, how did you how did you think the the bloody chicken came to the motel or the house or whichever? Uh, I just thought it was my father. Mm. I, I really yeah. did because he had, he he knew the area that we lived in. He had lived in Chattanooga himself. That's in fact that was where he had been disfellowshipped from. It was after oh. I, it was after I had already gotten left the house and I I had stayed in California and they'd moved to Tennessee and when he was in in Chattanooga he ran off with a, a woman he met at work and he got disfellowshipped he was he was disfellowshipped for 8 years and then he got reinstated again but um he, since he knew the area I that's I figured it was from him the the watch yeah. out from him what uh, what congregation in Chattanooga was he disfellowshipped do you know uh, do you remember I want to say White Oak, but I'm not mm-hmm. sure because I never went to that congregation. I only okay. went there to visit one time. Okay. That, there, There's a congregation in Chattanooga that uh, I believe is White Oak. Um, this, is, this is Rick Farron once again. Now, you know, obviously uh, the, reason, the reason why we even had Raven come on tonight is because she she knows a lot of the things that uh, you know she touches bases with things, doesn't she? Mentioned Marina Sidlick, and uh, did uh, did Dan introduce you to Marina? Yes, um, Brother Sidlick used to come down and and visit us in Jersey quite often. Uh, I when I was living there, the congregation that I was associated with was Woodbine, New Jersey. And I can remember him coming down and and giving special talks at, at Steel Pier 
down there at the shore points that they had a an auditorium that had a tin roof on it because I remember him I remember him giving a talk one time and it started to rain and we could hardly hear him because it the had the the building had a tin roof um but he he would he would come down and and visit when I was when I was younger quite frequently and I remember being invited out invited to dinner the houses that he would stay at and 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 different things like that so I I remember um, Marina. Um, but the, Marina was with him then, huh? Um, actually, what I remember is I remember it was about the time that they got together because I do remember it being that he did not have a wife and then he did have a wife. Yeah, but they treated you with kindness. They were more interested in what you were saying or what you were writing. That's not clear to me. Well, you were being used by the by the demon, and they, was he telling you things that, that no one else could hear, and you just were writing them? What were the people doing that were sitting there in the dark with robes on, just listening to you talk, or what? No, I I didn't talk. I just wrote, and and I what? don't remember. I don't remember them doing anything specifically. Just just standing there waiting. Waiting for you to finish, and as soon as when you had your your purple less purple garment on your robe, and they sat you down, that seemed to be the clue to start writing, and um, only you could. Yeah, my my robes were blue. They were blue. blue. It, was, it was a material like like a bright denim, it, not a not a not a indigo denim or a faded denim, but like a like a bright blue denim, and. I I would come out and sit down, and they would incense the area around me so that it was it was very smoky, um, and then I would be handed a notebook and handed a pen. The notebook was very common; it was like what you would have in school. But the pen had a feather; it was a big fluffy feather pen. Hmm. Hmm. That's something. Well, this has been a fascinating, fascinating chance to talk to you. I wish I had talked to you when you were here, only a few miles really from me. It's too bad we didn't cross paths then. Yeah. Well, Barbara, we thank you for calling in and asking Raven a question. We're, 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 we're moving straight forward here. We've got more questions. And thank you, Barbara, for coming on and speaking with us. And you had, a lot you. Of, you, you had a lot of history to all of this, and uh, I'll, I'll tell you, it's, it's quite a call, and that's why we wanted Raven to come on with us tonight. Raven comes across as very credible. The details are there. She uh, she seems to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk. I've talked to others that uh, wanted to come on and were concerned about this, but uh, I, I allowed Raven to come on because uh, she has uh, she has something to tell us that uh, has a lot of detail to it. And uh, I certainly appreciate her wanting to be with us tonight. Now, we have a few more questions for Raven, and then we're going to be closing the call down. So thank you, Barbara. Now, any any questions for Raven? Anyone else like to say something? Hi, Joe. This is Joe. Go ahead, Joe. Okay. <clears throat> when uh, your dad read the book, did he use like the big words or like when I uh I used to tell my kids stories sometimes I go to a big book like the Bible and instead of reading it verbatim I would just kind of tell them the story you know what I'm saying instead mm-hmm. of just reading every single word or do you remember uh you you know that there were stories but do you remember if your dad is reading verbatim I don't really remember if if he was or he wasn't um because when he used to read to me from from the angels and women book he was i i was quite young and it's possible that he could have been doing verbatim or he could have been you know going over some of the some of the larger words but they had i i was very advanced when I started kindergarten, I was I was reading on a fifth grade level, and by the time I was in fifth grade, I was I was at high school level. And I I always had trouble in school because I was always so far ahead of everybody else. 
So it, I don't really know if if he was trying to make it understandable to me or if he was actually reading from the book because I wasn't looking at the book when he was reading from it. Okay, that's that's okay. I knew it could go either way. So. Well, Raven, we certainly, this is Rick Farron once again, the moderator here, the six screens of the Watchtower conference call. And uh, we'll, we'll let one, one or two more questions go, because I know it's getting late here on the, it's about quarter past 12 here now, Eastern Standard Time. You're on Eastern Standard Time too, right, Raven? Yes, uh-huh. You're in Virginia, you must be getting tired, and certainly I appreciate you taking all the questions. You, you've added a lot of buzz here tonight. A lot of people are still online here with us. I can't believe it. They're still coming in. They want to hear what you have to say. But one or two more questions for Raven, then we're going to cut her loose so that she can retire and get in some sleep here tonight. But any more questions for Raven, ask her right now. One more. Go ahead. All right. Now that Barbara took all the good questions. Took all your good questions, Phil. Yeah, I'll tell you, I'm glad you're hanging in here tonight. You must be getting tired. I am. All right, go ahead. All right. The, uh, what do you think of the artwork, the photography, and the um, the paintings of the uh, Watchtower? Well, I'm a little bit biased because I was in a couple of them. Um, in the in the Your Youth book, I was the kind of ugly little girl with the ponytail leaning over in the mirror putting the lipstick on on the chapter that had to do with vanity. And uh Is that the one with the blemish? I don't know, but I I remember I was embarrassed about it. I didn't I didn't really want to tell anybody about it at the time. Um it, it was it was a it was a chapter on makeup or vanity or or something right. and 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 the girl was leaning across the dresser putting lipstick on. She had the ponytail. Um uh and I was also uh one of the the last things that that I that I did when before we moved was I I uh was photographed and they ended up using that as the woman in the foreground or at least starting from I can't say that I actually looked that good as the picture turned out but they but they used that picture of me to start the uh the picture in the foreground on the live forever book of where the uh Demons are the angels are looking down from heaven at the women bathing. The the one in the in the at the very bottom of the page was was taken from a photograph of me. Huh. Now, I, as far as I've heard, the rumors about the subliminal stuff. Yeah. But I don't I don't really know about that personally. I I don't I don't know anything about it. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on. Thank you. Well, Raven, you, you've been a real trooper here tonight, and I have to tell you, it's you're in a tough situation, but you've, you've handled yourself remarkably well, and I, I appreciate that, and our listeners appreciate it as well. And well, if uh, I can gonna... help, if I can help one person, then then I've accomplished something because I just whatever it takes, what whatever it is that that. Uh, appeals to people whatever it is that that you know makes them doubt and question and do some research and find out about this and just get out well i appreciate you saying that a lot of people tonight were kind of turned off they they hear this sra they as i mentioned earlier it's very controversial they 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 tune out right away but they, I, I wish that many could have in fact uh, just a few left not a whole lot but I wish that uh, they could listen in and and hear what you had to say and and digest the information and, and you know rather than prejudicate every time they hear the word SRA satanic ritual abuse people seem to jump to conclusions too quick but it doesn't always have to revolve around that real abusive sexual violent torture type stuff what you're saying is you were used by the watchtower as some type of a spirit medium a conduit that the demons would speak through and uh, I have to tell you that uh, I, we, we all know how satanic the Watchtower is. I mean, if you're a Christian listening out there, you have to realize that the Satan is behind this organization. We're getting that echo again, but we're going to be disconnecting here shortly anyway. But uh, for anyone that's uh, 
for anyone that's interested in coming in tomorrow, we have another conference call coming up at 2 o'clock tomorrow afternoon. The same numbers apply, 712-432-8710. And uh, that's our Upper World Ministries KISS Christian Conference Call. So if you uh, if you'd like to come and join us tomorrow, that's 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'd love to have you come in. Tomorrow's sermon is dealing with spiritual warfare, and I think you'll find it very interesting. And then you can ask some questions afterwards, like we did here tonight. So we appreciate all the listeners. We we know that it's getting late, but we try to unreal a lot of the things that have been happening in the world of the Watchtower. A lot of things have been happening. We know they're in the defensive mode. We know that the watchtower is dead. It hasn't fallen over yet. And uh, we always appreciate uh, our listeners adding to all of the information we need to to decipher what's going on in the world of the watchtower. Now, one more thing, Raven, if you're still with us. How, yes. how, can, peop- how can people contact you? Uh, my email is available. It's... Uh... Lady Loves Night, and that's because I have a sun sensitivity. Nothing else. Just Hello, everyone. This is ex Bethelai here. I've talked to people on the phone about the uh, uh, allegations in Brooklyn of a girl being used to channel. To write things down by channeling uh, and I've told people you know my view of it and what my experiences are now I don't confirm or deny any of the stories uh, in Brooklyn because I was not in Brooklyn I was at Walk Hill. I was at the farm. They're talking about things going on in Brooklyn in the tunnels where some girl or young girls were taken to a room in those tunnels and used to channel spirits and write down uh, messages. So. I don't say it did or didn't happen because I wasn't there at Brooklyn. Uh, What I do tell people is, well, the tunnels exist because when I went to Brooklyn to help out with the construction, uh, I went all the way down to go to the commissary and the commissary's in those tunnels. You look and there's tunnels as far as you can see under those buildings in Brooklyn, connecting all kinds of different things. So yeah. There's tunnels <laughs> under Brooklyn with rooms, so that much is true. But the reason why I personally believe it, and while some people might think it's far-fetched or what have you, I personally believe uh, my experience of it. And my experience of it was at the Bethel family uh, watchtower study in the auditorium at Walk Hill, completely separate from whatever happened at Brooklyn, at Walk Hill. I'm sitting down uh, somewhat in the back portion, the back row, uh, and I'm listening into the watchtower study and while I'm listening to the watchtower study I look around and a little ways beside me is some kid uh, he's he's probably I don't know early 20s and he's got a notepad and a pencil and he's just going to town in that going to town in that notepad and I'm thinking, oh man, this dude must be super spiritual. So I'm kind of looking over to see what he's doing on that notepad. And he's like drawing. 
in the notepad. Like you look over and there's shapes and uh, symbols of some sort and a whole lot of just jotting next to those symbols and shapes and whatnot. And there's other people around him, like his buddies are around him, just talking, chatting, not really paying attention to the uh, meeting, looking over at what he's doing, then going back, like it's no big deal. So I figure it's just a bunch of kids goofing off during the Bethel family watchtower study, not paying attention. But I was kind of interested in what that kid was drawing because I'm like, he's, he's pretty good at drawing. He's drawing this stuff super fast and he's writing and jotting things down super fast right next to it. So after the uh, Bethel family, uh, you know, watchtower study, I have my watchtower and whatnot. By the way, he didn't even have a watchtower. Uh, he had a, a notepad, like a uh, just a regular notepad, a, a full size notepad. But I didn't see him sitting over there with a the watchtower. Some of his friends had one, but I didn't see him sitting there with a the watchtower. And I talked to some people over there and I went over and talked to him. I'm like, you know, hey, how you doing? And uh, introduce myself. And I'm like, you, uh, <laughs> are you an artiste over here? And he said, don't worry about that, bro. And uh, I'm like, you must have been bored doing the uh, watchtower. I know I did my watchtower ahead of time also, but I was telling him that sometimes I get uh, additional information that I missed, which is why I, you know, focus in on the watchtower, Bethel Family Watchtower study, even though I did it beforehand. So here I am, you know, all spiritual talking to this guy like he's just some kid and I'm trying to explain to him why it's important for you to pay attention during the watchtower study and he's standing there looking at me like I'm stupid and he almost sounds offended you know like he can tell I'm kind of talking down to him like I'm all spiritual and he's he's just over there drawn so he's like bro this is uh, milk for me uh, you know this is this is nothing and I'm like oh really you know what I mean because I'm trying to I can't remember right offhand what the watchtower study was about but I thought it was pretty good information at the time and he's all talking about how I, I'm not ready for, you know, the level of understanding he has and all this other stuff. And me, keep in mind, this is the dude that freaking is in the library after my assignment is over. After I've done work with work and if I don't have a meeting, I go to the library and I'm in there studying and after I'm done with my study, I'm doing personal, personal study. And sometimes I don't leave that library until after like the sun goes down. So, of course, I'm taking this as a challenge. I'm like, oh, yeah, we can get into some personal study. What are some of the personal study? Uh projects that you that you have he was like I don't even think you're ready for this but I'll tell you where to start so he writes down a scripture and he's like read this try to understand it pray meditate before and of course in my mind I'm like interrupting him in my mind like dude I know to pray and meditate before I do personal study so he writes down the scripture and uh, later on I go to the uh, library walk over here away from all these trucks and whatnot 
I go to the library to do my uh, regular studies and whatnot. You know, I'm not thinking much of it because I'm like, you know, I'll get into this scripture and dissect this bad boy and then go back to him and we'll have us a discussion. So this is the scripture he gave me. Let me read it to you guys. And this will all make sense as to what it has to do with why I think that there is some truth to what was going on in uh, Brooklyn. Genesis chapter 28, verses 10 through 17. It says, and if I get some of these words wrong, it's, it's just because <laughs> I have, <laughs> just because. It says, again, Genesis chapter 28, 10 through 17, New International Version says, Jacob left uh, Beersheba and set out for Haran. When he reached a certain place, he stopped for the night because the sun had set. Taking one of the stones there, he put it under his head and lay down to sleep. He had a dream in which he saw a stairway resting on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. There above it stood the Lord. And he said, I am the Lord, the God of your father, Abraham, and the God of Isaac. I will give you and your descendants the land on which you are lying. Your descendants will be like the dust of the earth and you will spread out to the west and to the east, to the north and to the south. All peoples on earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. I am with you and will watch over you wherever you go. And I will bring you back to this land. I will not leave you until I have done what I have promised. When Jacob awoke from his sleep, he thought, surely the Lord is in this place. And I was not aware of it. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place? There is none other. This is none other than the house of God. This is the gate of heaven. So I read the scripture and was really intrigued by it. And I, you know, didn't have too many in-depth thoughts about that particular scripture. So after I did my research, I kind of meditated a little bit on the, on the verses, but I did find it really interesting that you have a, a scripture referring to, or a, ver, a, a, a group of scriptures referring to uh, essentially Bethel. So later at lunch, I go and I sit with uh, the guy that gave me the scriptures and uh, he said, so what do you think? And uh, I said, I thought it was interesting. I did my uh, study for my meetings and afterwards got into the scripture. And, you know, I found that scripture pretty interesting. What were your thoughts on it? He said, let's talk after uh, lunch. As a matter of fact, I'll have you over my uh, brother's house. And this kid, his whole freaking family is at Bethel. So fast forward. I meet up with him over his brother's house. His brother's sitting there at the counter. His wife is there also. And uh, the guy is sitting down on the couch. I'm sitting on the couch and we're talking and it's pretty laid back. Uh, they got the TV on, whatnot. And uh, the guy's, his brother's wife brings me 
uh, something to drink, cuts me a, a brownie. So I'm sitting down there chilling with them, not expecting, thinking anything. I'm in my mind thinking, oh man, this is cool. I found a buddy here that's as in the personal study and talking about the Bible as I am. So then he turns down the TV and it's like, man, when I first heard about this, uh, I was like curled up in the fetal position. I was so shocked and, the, and he's laughing and joking around. He's literally in the fetal position on the couch, like sucking his thumb, talking about this is the inf how the information affected him. And I'm like, dude, shoot, like come with it. Like I'm ready. He goes in on the scripture saying that Jacob in that scripture discovers uh, his ability to channel. He this is and this is their explanation of it. I'm not saying this is my explanation of it. This is their explanation of it. He says Jacob in that scripture. I want to get down there, but I don't want to fall going down this really steep hill. I'm going to go this way. He says, Jacob discovers the ability to channel spirits. He literally sees, uh, you know, things and, and, and he describes it as a ladder where spirits are coming and going from heaven between heaven and earth like a literal gateway he opens a literal gateway while he's asleep while he is dreaming and talks to God and God reassures him that it was him and the the promises and and everything so while he channeled God through a dream and then later down wrote down what he saw in that dream he didn't realize is this what what you know, they were telling me. And while he's going in on this, the guy's brother is sitting chilling, uh, eating at the counter. His sister is kind of, I mean, his, uh, his wife, the guy's wife is kind of looking at me as we're talking. And uh, I'm just sitting there listening to the guy talk. And he's, he, he says that Bethel or the house of God or the gateway to uh, the heavens in that instance, he said he misunderstood. It wasn't the place, but the house of God was his body and that he was the medium. He was channeling spirits in that dream he didn't just see god he saw other spirits and what those spirits were busy doing was traveling to and fro from earth and then he starts talking to me and you know that guy at the hall that just goes off seemingly off his rocker when he's talking about for example the new system you got people that when you talk about the new system, they just take it and run with it and they are off on Pluto somewhere uh, talking about how they're going to have a house in a sequoia tree all the way on top of the tree and they're going to get down by a slide that winds down the tree and they're going to get in by an elevator. They go just crazy stuff, man. So he goes on and starts talking more and I'm thinking, oh, God, it's one of them. You know what I mean? It's another one of them. <laughs> uh, and 
you know, to summarize, I'll summarize some of the stuff that he's telling me. And basically, he says that the ability to channel was the original way to acquire truth. It's what Jacob did. When Jacob did it, he said God consoled him, comforted him, that it was okay for him to do it. And that we as Bethelites really are gateways. We're gateways to the spirit realm. We're mediums. We can, we can channel. And I'm like, this dude is off his rocker. And uh, I'm like, you know, okay. I think I remember saying it exactly like that. Okay. And he said that the Bible, and, he, and then he's showing me that the occult was the original method used to acquire knowledge from the spirit realm. It wasn't just the Bible. And he said that I can take you to the Bible to show you instances where people channeled uh, dead spirits. He told me about the uh, instance in the uh, Old Testament where someone channeled a prophet and the prophet actually did it work and it is prophet actually uh, spoke to the person he told me about the high places or showed me the scriptures talking about the high places and uh, astrology and things of that sort and then he went on went into the history of the organization and said that from the infancy of uh, watchtower the methods used were considered a cult. And he said the only thing that that means is hidden. So all that is is not evil. People think it's evil is what he said. It's not evil. All it is is hidden from some people who are not prepared or uh, who aren't ready for it. And, and a lot of this was chopped up with scripture in it also because he gave me the scripture about not tossing your pearls before swine and he equated that scripture to revealing certain knowledge to the general populace he said that this occult knowledge hidden knowledge in reality is the reason why it's hidden is because it's valuable like you would bury treasure so other people wouldn't get a hold of it he said it's valuable and not for the general populace. And I'm just literally by this time I got my mouth wide open. And he said, and this is this is some of this stuff I knew about the pyramid because of talking to this guy. And he said that uh he's like looking at me like, bro, this is easy to prove. And he's showing me the uh, pyramid that Russell used. And he said Russell wasn't just using the Bible. He was channeling and doing what those spirits told him to do, which was to use the pyramids to uh, acquire knowledge. He said, dude, it's, 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 we got pictures of the, the burial stone. We've got pictures of the cross and the crown. We've used the cross and the crown in our infancy. Uh, and some of the information was Masonic uh, or what people call Masonic, but it's just occult knowledge. It doesn't belong to any one group of people, is what he said. And then I'm like, I'm thinking to myself, like, I'm looking at him, I'm like, what do people tell you when they find out about what you what you're reading into i'm looking at all of them like aren't you worried about what people are going to think you know about you reading into things that 
you know, aren't in the publications. And uh, the guy's brother sitting at the counter, he kind of laughed a little bit. And his wife looks at me and said, they know not to mess with us. And the way she said it was like, I mean, she was like, they know not to mess with us. Like nobody messes with us. Like they do what they want. Like they are separate. They do what they want. And if you guys want to get into any of this anymore, I'll have to just do another video, man, because uh, essentially she said that there's multiple groups that split up. She said there's uh, the Bible students and she said the Bible students only use the seven or uh, the six studies in the scriptures. There's seven, but according to them, they only use six. She said the Bible students only use six studies in the scriptures. They split with uh, Watchtower. Watchtower uh, doesn't use any of Russell's writings. But they also, she said, doesn't get in, they don't get into the occult at all. So she said they, they only use milk. She said the Bible students do use some of the occult that Russell did, but they don't continue it. They don't get into it anymore. She said the third group, which is us, we gain knowledge of the truth through the same methods used in the Bible, same methods used by uh, Charles Taze Russell, and to most people, they call it the occult. And he explained what he was doing. Uh, and I know this is a lot to absorb, but he explained to me what he was doing. And this sounded super weird, but he was channeling. He was literally channeling during the Watchtower study. He was writing down things that he was told to write, he said. And I said, well, why are you, what are you, what were you drawing? Why are you drawing symbols? He said that, uh, <laughs> bear with me. He said that angels, in order for you to contact them, uh, by name you can't pronounce some of their names and then he showed me the freaking scripture man he went to the Bible again he showed me the scripture where somebody asked an angel what his name is and the angels like why are you asking about my name when it's a wonderful one he's telling them that according to him that he can't pronounce the name the name is when he says wonderful it's just beyond him it's amazing it's beyond him it's beyond his understanding the name of the angel alone he said you're dealing with spirit creatures where their name alone is so powerful you don't even know what you're dealing with it's too wonderful so he said that and this is when i'm getting ready to leave and he said that angels when he channels angels he said that there's multiple heavens and there's myriads of just countless spirit creatures and he said that they are intensely interested in humans they can't uh experience what we experience he said to prove how interested they are in us humans look at the bible accounts of the spirits that materialize bodies for themselves to experience sex they are extremely interested in humans and experiencing what we experience and watching us and studying us and uh he said that they tell him how to contact them and he he draws a symbol some kind of a symbol that represents who that angel is because you cannot pronounce their name so all that stuff he's drawing is symbols and then next to it what the angel tells him to do 
in connection with that symbol in order to contact them. And <laughs> I'm like, y'all messing with me. You know what I mean? I'm thinking y'all messing with me, bro. Y'all messing with me. But the and, and, and but the thing is, is that he really was drawing that stuff. It's not like he was gonna know, like to play a prank on me, he would have drawn it and somehow made sure I knew he was drawing it. I mean, so he gets into a lot of stuff and I left that room uh, shaking. You know what I mean? Like I literally left that room shaking and I had goosebumps. And I remember trying to tell people at home, I talked to people and uh, man, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, figure out how to even start this discussion. But fast forward, fast forward, he has notepads upon notepads of this stuff. And this guy is like, you know, looking at me. And this is how he is with a lot of the people that he hung out with. It's like, bro, I'll let you know what's going on with us as far as like social stuff. And he's like, you got a show. He's like, you got a show. When I let you know when something's going on, you got a show. So I did see him other times with regards to social things and things like that. And we talked from time to time about some of the stuff he was mentioning. And in my mind, I'm thinking I'm trying to save him. And uh, he, he gives me some of his folders. He gives me a bunch of these folders or notepads. I mean, this bad boy is thick because it's like four freaking notepads of stuff that he's, he's written and, and stuff like that. And he's like, when you're ready for meat, You'll no longer be doing watchtowers, but you'll be ready to study these. So I remember sticking these bad boys in a in my uh, backpack, closing that bad boy, and never did open it. And uh, all that stuff was packed up with my stuff when they packed it up, put it in the car. And to this day, I haven't really opened it up and gotten into it, but I did find it in my closet. But 937-789-4029, this is the reason why I think there are families there that are involved with that sort of thing, with occult stuff. There's families that are involved with it. And if it was going on in, in, in Walk Hill, it's possible that it could have been going on in New York. I don't know that it was a governing body, but I think that there's families that are powerful families that nobody bothers. So that's my view on it. X Wall Kill Bethelite signing out. Hello everyone. Marcus here. Watchtower's involvement in spirit channeling is something that I understand people find hard to swallow. As a matter of fact, that's one of the reasons why people are so hesitant to bring the truth to light. Oftentimes, truth is stranger than fiction. Oftentimes, because people believe things that are easy to swallow, easy to believe, I think that society has us almost programmed to only accept things that are made palatable, only accept things that are spoken in a politically correct manner. That when someone brings some raw truth they end up getting attacked oftentimes. I was aware of all this. This is why it took as long as it did before I began doing videos on the topic. However, in the first video, you guys were read scripture. showing Watchtower's view of the, the term Bethel. House of God. What is the house of God? The vessel of God, or you look in scripture and Bethel is mentioned several times. Uh, multiple occasions, Bethel is a place where seemingly supernatural things happen. Jacob's Ladder. 
envisioning a connection to the spirit realm angels coming and going other places in the bible bethel was a place where people went to inquire of god we'll get to this in a second but it was a place where channeling was done that's how they inquired of god now the word channel god's true channel god's only channel is a word that the organization has used repetitively repetitively they're continuously essentially almost giving it away telling you they view themselves as a channel to God or a channel to the spirit realm all we have to do is just look at the facts from the start of the organization from the organization's infancy we all know that the founding father was involved with the occult he's got a pyramid at his gravesite it's not something that is up for debate really it's in some of the publications that he wrote, studies in the scriptures, the Great Pyramid of Giza. You have other places along the history of the organization where presidents mention just channeling, some kind of a, a channel, a divine channel. Then you have all these people come forward and flat out tell you they were used to channel spirits at Bethel put it all together put it all together it's not even uh, really difficult once you have the information one and one leads to two they're constantly telling you they're the channel so the concept that they channel spirits is not that far-fetched when they've said that their entire existence the occult has been a part of that organization from its infancy and i understand that people feel it just vanished the founding father of the jehovah's witnesses was involved with things and it just vanished in thin air even though they continue to talk about channeling continuously after the fact one thing we all know about watchtower is that there is almost an obsession with their image so whether something is true or false whether there are reports of sexual misconduct among the organization uh, whether there's reports online about doctrinal errors watchtower has done one thing continuously throughout it, it, its entire existence and that is cover it up because of wanting a clean image the whole concept of saying anything that will bring negative attention brings reproach on God. All of us are aware of that. That's virtually Watchtower doctrine. You cannot make them look bad. They don't want to look bad. So they've been involved with spirit channeling, flat out telling everybody that they're the one true channel. Why haven't they come forward and made it more plain? Because of how it would look and Watchtower is obsessed 
with its image, is it not? Let's go to a scripture. I don't know where this 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 kid would have gotten all this stuff if it weren't true. The first video I read you a scripture. Where would he have gotten that scripture and that interpretation had he not heard it somewhere else? Why are there reports from Wallkill, reports from Brooklyn that all line up? All these people are just making things up about an organization that calls itself the channel. Exodus chapter 33 verses 7 through 11. Exodus chapter 33 verses 7 through 11. Let's read that. Now Moses used to take a tent and pinch it pitch it outside the camp some distance away calling it the tent of meeting anyone inquiring of the Lord would go to the tent of meeting outside the camp and Moses and whenever Moses went out to the tent all the people rose and stood at the entrance to their tents watching Moses until he entered the tent as Moses went into the tent the pillar of cloud would come down and stay at the entrance while the Lord spoke with Moses whenever the people saw the pillar of cloud standing at the entrance to the tent they all stood and worshiped each at the entrance to the tent the Lord would speak to Moses face to face as one speaks to a friend then Moses would return to the camp pay attention here but his young aide Joshua son of Nun did not leave the tent how were they inquiring of the Lord according to uh, Watchtower's view whether they make this plain to the public or not because of wanting to protect their image according to watchtower's view the the way god spoke face to face was through joshua moses was channeling he used a young boy who was in the tent with him and he would channel spirit messages through that young child you have the exact same stories in these accounts people who were used by watchtower as young children to channel messages and involve themselves with automatic writing Every, these people's accounts are all lining up. The guy that was telling me all this was, was, was young. His brother uh, was older. You know, his family, he's got other relatives there that are older. Why is it that this young kid is the one that's involved with all this stuff? So you have this entire pattern here that matches up. You have scriptural uh, accounts that was given to me about channeling. Why it's okay. Why they feel like I should drop my guard about it. You have people's personal accounts about the event. And you have an organization that flat out calls itself the channel. I mean, what more do we really need? You also have uh, things called uh, by, by other names. You have channeling. You have active force. God's active force. Right? 
I'm not making any of this up, right? God's active force. I understand you have an understanding of, of, of what that is, but they're describing a force that is adamant, that's active. And they flat out call it that, God's active force. You have all kinds of terminology that matches what we see visually from the beginning of the history of the organization with the pyramid. You have the terminology matching the pyramid. Terminology talking about things that sound spiritistic, channeling, active force, God's active force, God's channel. So they have spiritistic terms, then they just attach the word God to it, and now it's acceptable. You have Watchtower, and people have come accustomed to hearing the word God's organization, the one true organization, they just keep repeating things. You add something scriptural to something that's not, and people can no longer tell the difference. Watchtower has been genius in doing that, in squeezing a cult into religion, and no one knew until people started to come forward with their uh, the things that, that happened to them. So it all makes sense in, in, in my mind. Whether or not you believe it's actually uh, channeling that they're doing is one thing, you know, it's up to you to believe that. But the fact that they're doing it and have done it throughout the history of the entire organization, it's not just going to disappear. Of course they're still doing it. I'll leave you with uh, another line of reasoning. Why do you think Watchtower keeps coming up with these dates, these odd dates, trying to pinpoint when the end of this system will arrive? They come up with these dates. These dates end up being incorrect and they somehow come up with another one. They, 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 it, it seems stupid to us, right? But they obviously believe that they have a way to come up with this information. How do you think they're doing it? Taking wild guess? Watchtower, and this is, uh, you know, a view of whether or not they really believe their own doctrine. Uh, Watchtower has very unpopular doctrine that all they have to do is change and say it's new life. They're sticking to doctrine that is virtually destroying the organization. This fellowshipping, shunning, all that is bringing nothing but negative light. They are fully aware that during the memorial, their numbers triple or double. I understand there's number Nazis out there that want everything specific but their numbers go up. But then after that, those numbers go down. They are aware that because of their teaching, their doctrine, they're shooting themselves in the foot member wise. It makes no sense business wise for them to hold on to doctrine, for them to hold on to this 1914 thing. It makes no sense at all. Comment down below if you think you it makes sense for Watchtower to hold on to doctrines that make them look foolish. 1914, uh, the whole generation connected generations or overlapping, I'm sorry, overlapping generations. It sounds stupid. Why would they come up with that if they don't actually believe it? Come up with something stupid to make yourself look like an idiot if you don't believe it. How do you think they come up with overlapping generations. They just made it up. Well, if they were gonna make something up, they would've just made up something that made sense, right? You're gonna make up a lie that makes no sense? So they believe their own stuff, their own doctrines and what have you. And how do you know? Because they hold on 
to doctrines that are stupid. So if they're getting all these things through channeling, and they've been channeling all these years, a lot of everything that we see, a lot of this stuff makes sense. Why is Watchtower the dumbest religion on earth? You can find something wrong with virtually all their doctrines. Well, how are they getting this stuff? They flat out tell you almost that they're channeling. Another thing to keep in mind is that the, according to Watchtower, faithful and discreet slave class is supposed to give uh, the, the, the organization its proper food at the proper time. Because I understand the thought process of, well, how can they believe it and yet be hiding things? Well, you understand how they feel about their reputation. But also, too, look at that doctrine. The governing body, the faithful and discreet slave class, is to give proper food at the proper time. They simply can just not believe that it is the proper time to give this type of information to the rank and file. And by doing that, give it to the rest of the world. They may feel it's proper for the anointed to have this food, but not proper for the other sheep. I mean, it, go, it even goes and fits with their doctrine. Just let all this sink in. Look at some of the scenery, why this all sinks in. So we'll talk more about it. Uh, shoot me a text. I know that there's some people that are more interested in this sort of thing than others. I'll try to uh, find a way to where, you know, we can discuss this. If this is something that you want to discuss, if going into the notebooks and all that stuff is something that you're interested in doing, let me know because I understand that there's some people on that believe that it's demonic and they don't want to go into it. So if you're interested in going into it, shoot me a text. I'll try to make sure that type of information and whatnot is only shared with people who want it, who don't feel it's demonic or who maybe don't even believe in that sort of thing, but want to know what all that stuff says. 937-789-4029. If you're from another country, uh, Mexico or wherever, and you want to try to get in contact with me, I got Skype. You should be able to find me under Marcus Vaughn. Uh, my number, I use my number on my Skype, 937-789-4029. Uh, a nice way of getting in contact without having a big phone bill. And uh, this is X Wallkill Bethelite signing out.